Chapter 35 Teaching the Twins Valkyrie ate a lunch she didn't feel like, then took Alice for a walk. She headed up Main Street, sunglasses on, ignoring the smiles and the looks from the people she passed. Everyone wanted to tickle Alice's chin and waste Valkyrie's time. They'd all heard about the mugging, of course. Big news travels fast in small towns. Carol and Crystal came round the corner, and it was too late to hide. They'd already seen her. We heard about your mum, Crystal said. Is she okay? Valkyrie nodded. She's fine. She was more shaken up than anything else. Who did it? whispered Carol. Was it a sorcerer? Nope, just a regular kind of scumbag. You wouldn't think anything like that would happen here, Crystal said. You hear about fights outside pubs and the chipper and that, but not people being mugged. It makes you realise that nowhere's safe, doesn't it? You should probably take up self-defence, Valkyrie said, turning the pram round and heading for home. Or you could just teach us magic, Carol suggested. Valkyrie shook her head. We've been over this. Are you going to teach Alice magic? Carol asked. Uh, no, I don't think so. You don't think so? So you might? Well, no. I mean, I don't want to. I want it to be normal. But there's still a possibility that you might. I... I suppose. Then we think it's unfair that you won't teach us. Valkyrie sighed. Yeah, I know, but... Teach us for, like, just a few hours this afternoon. If we can't do any tricks by the end, then at least we'll know that we tried. They're not called tricks, Carol. Illusions, sorry. Crystal nudged her sister. That's on stage. When Valkyrie does it, it's called magic. So, will you teach us a few hours? Ordinarily, Valkyrie would have said no. But she needed something to fill in the time that had suddenly expanded all around her. She sighed again. Fine, a few hours... The twins broke into the biggest smiles she'd ever seen them wear. Can Fletcher come? Carol asked. Uh, Fletcher and I broke up. Oh, that's awful. Did he dump you? No, we just broke up. Is he seeing someone else? I wouldn't expect so. Can I have his number? I think he wants to be left alone. Why did he dump you? He didn't. Did he think you were too immature? He never mentioned. How long did it take you to get over it? Um... I'm not sure what... When did it happen? Three hours ago. They stared at her. You're so brave, Carol said. Did you cry? Asked Crystal. If you want to cry in front of us, you can. Thanks, Valkyrie said. But I think I'm fine now. I'll meet you down on the beach in half an hour, okay? Will we need anything? Carol asked. Just your wits. They looked confused. Half an hour later, Alice was back home and Valkyrie was standing with her cousins at the far end of the beach, where the sand gave way to hard pebbles. They were alone there, tucked away in the corner. Carol and Crystal looked at her eagerly. Elemental magic is influence over air, fire, water and earth, Valkyrie said. The first one we're going to look at is air, and with this... The main thing is to keep in mind that everything is connected. It all interlocks. There's a, a kind of fault line between spaces, and once you find the pressure point, you push. I don't get it, said Crystal. You don't have to get it, Carol said. You just have to do it. Uh, actually, you do have to get it, Valkyrie said. Magic is all around us, but the only way we can really use it is if we understand how it works. It's like science. I hate science, said Carol. I prefer drama, Crystal nodded. She snapped her palm again and again, and nothing happened. Isn't there any magic where you don't have to learn so much? That's a magic ring you're wearing, isn't it? Could we use that? Valkyrie smiled. Afraid not. This is necromancy. Do you need to study stuff to use it? Carol asked. Valkyrie hesitated. Not really, so it's easier than pushing air. Just because it's easier doesn't mean it's better. There is a downside to power that comes without effort. 
It sounds perfect for us, though, Crystal said. Can I try? I'd... I'd have to give you my permission to use it. So? Give your permission. Please, Stephanie. Her cousins opened their eyes as wide as they could go. A trick that worked on their parents, Valkyrie knew, but which had the unfortunate side effect of making them look like startled goldfish. She shrugged. Crystal, she said, I give you my permission to use this ring. She pulled the ring from her finger and handed it over. Mouth open in awe, Crystal examined the ring for a few moments before slipping it on. Immediately she frowned. Oh, she said, it's cold. Necromancy is death magic, Valkyrie said. Believe me, when that ring is around death, it gets even colder. That's disgusting. Carol reached out. Let me try. Crystal pulled her hand away. Wait your turn. So, what do I do, Stephanie? Is there a magic spell I have to say or something? Valkyrie scanned the area, making sure there was no one about. No spell. Can you feel anything? Apart from how cold the ring is? You should feel it in your fingertips. Crystal narrowed her eyes and waggled her fingers. I don't know, she said. I think so. I might. See our shadows. Try and grab them. Really? Just try it. Crystal bit her lip, then hunkered down and clutched at the sand their shadows covered. Am I doing it right? Not really, Valkyrie admitted. My turn, said Carol. Just wait a minute, Crystal responded, grabbing at sand, her annoyance increasing. Stephanie, she's had her go, Carol whined. Just give her another few seconds, Valkyrie said. You keep pushing at the air. Pushing at the air is stupid. Carol muttered, but she did it anyway. Valkyrie watched them both, Carol trying to shove the breeze and Crystal trying to pick up her own shadow, and she did her best not to laugh. Girls, said a voice behind them. They turned quickly. Fergus stood there, hands on his hips and looking displeased. Hi, Dad, Carol said. Crystal stood up, hiding the ring behind her back. Hi, Dad. We were just... We were doing Tai Chi, Valkyrie said. It's very relaxing. Carol nodded quickly. We've been very tense lately. Girls, Fergus said. Your mother wants you back at the house. Go on now. The twins glanced at each other. Then Crystal stepped in front of Valkyrie in the most unconvincing attempt at nonchalance ever witnessed. Valkyrie took her ring back, and Crystal turned to her. Thanks for trying to teach us she said. No problem. The twins walked off, leaving Valkyrie and Fergus alone on the sand. His eyes never left her. How's your mother? he asked. She's okay. It was more the shock than, how's your dad? Uh, he's okay. The baby? Alice is fine too. Fergus nodded. And how are you, Stephanie? Are you keeping out of trouble? So far. And what's that that you were showing the girls? Tai Chi, was it? Yep, it's a martial art, but it's very gentle and... I know what Tai Chi is, Stephanie. I've seen people do it in the park. And that wasn't what you were teaching them. Well, I... I might have been doing it wrong. His next words were angry. What gives you the right? She blinked. Uh... I'm sorry? You heard me. What gives you the right? I'm not entirely sure what you mean. He stepped forward quickly, closing the gap between them. His fists were clenched and his face was red. For a moment, Valkyrie even thought he was going to hit her. He snarled. What gives you the right to teach my daughters that filthy magic? She stared. What? They're my daughters, he snapped. They're good girls. I've kept them out of that kind of trouble you get into, and I will be damned if I'm going to let you drag them down with you. She took a step back. Fergus, what the hell are you talking about? Don't play stupid, he roared, then immediately looked around, making sure no one else had heard. When he spoke again, 
His voice was quieter, but no less intense. You're not stupid, Stephanie. You're not a stupid girl. We all know it. We all know how smart you are. My girls aren't like that. My girls need someone to look out for them. That's my job. I'm not getting them into anything, said Valkyrie. This is a sickness. You know that? He said, so angry he was almost laughing. My grandfather had it. This magic thing. He told us all about it when we were kids, me and Gordon and your dad. He tried to pass on what he knew to us. He didn't have much magic. He couldn't do the whole lot. Some people can't, he said. He was hoping that we'd be different, that we'd be proper sorcerers. We loved the idea, but our dad, he hated it. He didn't want us growing up and getting into wars that had nothing to do with us. He wanted us to be normal. He wanted us to be safe. Valkyrie just stared at him, unable to speak. When our grandfather died, our dad asked me to cut it out. Cut out all the nonsense and the games and the stories. He asked me, and he cried as he was asking me. The only time I've ever seen my old man cry. Of course I said yes. I started telling Des that it was all just pretend. After a while he believed me. But Gordon wouldn't play along. He was the eldest, and he refused to do what our dad wanted. Maybe it was because he was the eldest that he felt he needed to rebel, I don't know. They barely spoke after that. So you've known all along, Valkyrie said. Fergus nodded. He seemed suddenly drained, like this had been building inside him for years, and now that it was out, he had nothing to hold him up. I knew that Gordon always wanted to be a sorcerer, but he just didn't have it in him. So he wrote about it instead, and he travelled the world, surrounded himself with all these strange people. I don't know why he did it, to be honest. It must have been hell, to be surrounded by that kind of person that you wanted to be with all your heart, but knew you never could. We had so many arguments about it. I was focusing so much on keeping all of this away from your dad. I was terrified that Gordon would do or say something that would make Des realise that it was all true. And then what did he do? Would he change his life, now that he knew magic was out there? Would he take Melissa with him? Would he take you with him? Would he ruin your lives as well as his own? Fergus shook his head. I saw some of Gordon's friends over the years. I met this beautiful woman. My God, she was beautiful. The first time I saw her, I actually fell in love with her. Can you imagine that? I actually fell in love. I was ready to leave Beryl for her. For this woman who barely even noticed me. That's magic for you, isn't it? Can ruin your life with one little glance. I saw others too. That tall man... The one who was at the reading of Gordon's will. You remember him? Skullduggery Pleasant, Valkyrie said softly. Oh, said Fergus. So you do remember him? Yeah. Magic ruined our family. My grandfather and my father argued about it constantly. Gordon and my father barely spoke because of it. And Gordon and me, when he died, we hadn't spoken in four years. Four whole years I didn't speak to my own brother. I cry about that at night, you know. Some nights I just can't help it. Don't let this ruin your family, Stephanie. Your parents love you. Your dad loves you. Do you know what he'd do if anything bad ever happened to you? Nothing bad is going to happen. Don't insult my intelligence, he said, glaring. I was never as smart as either of my brothers, but I'm not stupid either. If you're involved in that world, your life is in danger. Valkyrie said nothing. I don't want you teaching my daughters anything, he said. I don't want to either. I swear I don't. They saw me do something last year, and they've been at me ever since. I think I can convince them that they don't have any magic, and then hopefully they'll stop trying. Do I have your word on that? Yes, of course. I'm holding you responsible if anything magical, ever happens to them. Okay, she said. He nodded, looked out to sea, and then back to her. I'm sorry I shouted at you. It's fine, really. 
Are you going to be teaching Alice any of this when she's old enough? I don't know. I prefer not to. Then you understand why I don't want my girls taught. Yes. He nodded again, then looked down at his feet. Give our best to your mother, he said. Sure. He turned, started to walk away. Gordon couldn't do magic, she called after him. But what about you? He didn't stop walking, and he didn't answer. He just held up his left hand and clicked his fingers. Even in the bright sunlight, Valkyrie saw the spark between his fingertips. Chapter 36 Confiding in Uncle Gordon The taxi driver peered out through the windscreen. I know this place, he said. This is where that writer lived. What's his name? Edgley? Valkyrie gave a murmur of affirmation from the back seat. I read his books, you know. Some of them. He wasn't the best, was he? I mean, he was okay. He was readable. He was no Stephen King, but he was fine. Didn't like the way he'd kill off his characters, though. That was never nice. Suppose not, Valkyrie muttered. He wrote those books about the army deserter, didn't he? Corporal Fleece, getting into all those mad adventures with the ghosts of dead wizards and whatever. Dead sorcerers, she corrected automatically. Same thing, isn't it? Did you read any of them? In the first book, you meet him. You think he's the brave hero. But he's not. He's a selfish little coward. Didn't like that. It was funny, though, in its own way, but I didn't like it. I like my heroes to be, you know, good guys. Valkyrie sat forward. You can let me out here, she said. I'll walk the rest of the way. She paid the man and got out, then walked up the long driveway. She missed being able to call Fletcher, have him teleport her wherever she needed to go. He could be annoying. He could be very annoying. But he always smiled when he saw her, and it was like he'd been saving up that smile all day until they were together. She liked that feeling, as much as she hated to admit it. She liked being around someone who was genuinely happy to be around her. It wasn't the same feeling she got when she was with Kaylin. There was too much pressure there, too much expectation. He looked at her like she belonged to him, like they belonged together. He was handsome. He was so handsome. And he was smooth and dark and dangerous. But beyond that, there wasn't much to him. Valkyrie really didn't see that lasting. She needed someone fun. Someone who could make her laugh who could take her places she'd never been. If she didn't have anyone like that, then what was the point of being with anyone less? Valkyrie led herself into Gordon's house, deactivating the alarm. She went through, passing the rooms she normally visited, noting how clean everything looked and how fresh everything smelled. She pushed open the double doors into the ballroom, turned on the light. Brand new chandeliers hung from the ceiling, sparkling like diamonds. The floor was polished, with tables and chairs stacked up on one side, ready to be set out. It was quiet right now, her every footstep echoing around the empty space, and she tried imagining what it would look like filled with people. The last time the house had been full was at Gordon's funeral. She climbed the stairs to Gordon's study, where he'd done all his writing when he was alive. In here, Valkyrie flicked the switch and the bookcase opened. She walked through into the hidden room. Gordon Edgeley looked round, smiled, and held up a hand while he finished speaking. It lunged, this thing of claws and fangs and muscle, and with a swipe it opened the belly of the prison guard, spilling his entrails across the rough stone floor. Recording end. The electronic device on the table beeped, and Gordon grinned. The new book is going really well. She nodded appreciatively. It sounds it. I dare say it's better than anything I wrote when I was alive. It has pathos. It has emotion. It has entrails. It has everything you could want in a posthumous bestseller, recently uncovered in a hidden archive. This is going to make you a lot of money, my dear niece. But then, what do you care about money? 
When have you ever cared about money? Valkyrie shrugged. I'm sure it'll come in useful. Probably more for Mum and Dad than for me, though. And little sister, Gordon said. Don't forget the new edition. I was thinking I might write a book for younger readers when I'm finished with this one. Give her something to read when she's a little older. Oh, the possibilities. To think, if it wasn't for you insisting that I reveal my existence to Skullduggery and the others, I'd be spending my days in the Echo Stone, waiting for you to drop by for a visit. The stone lay in its cradle on the desk, the cradle itself standing on a symbol that China Sorrows had carved into the wood. It fooled the stone into thinking there was a living person in the room at all times, meaning Gordon's image could stay active. In this room, he had voice-activated televisions and computers, gadgets of all kinds. He was loving this second chance at life. I like the chandeliers, said Valkyrie. You don't think they're too over the top? I was worried they might be. This is going to be a big night for me. This is the first time I get to meet most of these amazing people, and I don't want anyone to think I'm showing off. They're lovely. I'm glad you think so. There have been cleaning crews in here for the last few days, getting everything ready for Sunday. Do you have your dress picked out? I don't know if I'm going. Gordon frowned. What? But you have to go. This is your house. It's your house, and you don't need me. He looked at her. Tell me what the matter is. I just had an interesting conversation with Fergus. Oh? Why didn't you tell me that he knew about magic? Gordon blinked. Excuse me? I was giving the twins a lesson on the beach. He saw us, sent them away, started on a whole tirade about refusing to let me drag them into magic because magic had torn his family apart. Really? Very really. That... that surprises me. It caught me a little off guard too. He gave me the whole family history on the subject. That must have been nice. It was a bonding moment. To be honest, Gordon said, I thought he'd convinced himself that none of it was real. He did such a good job with your dad. I thought he genuinely believed it himself. Once we got into our twenties, you see, we never argued about actual magic. We argued about the weirdos and the freaks I associated with. We argued about my lifestyle and my attitude. But by then you'd stopped using words like sorcerers, I didn't realize he was still aware of it all. Well, he is, and he still is. He even has some himself. Fergus? Fergus has magic? There's definitely something there, she said. Without proper instruction, he wouldn't be able to do anything more than generate a spark. But even so... Even so, Gordon finished, it shows he has magic. How oh, I would have envied him if I had known while I lived. You don't envy him now? Gordon smiled. I have so many other things to envy him for, my dear, such as living, that magic becomes insignificant. How did you leave it? He told me not to teach the twins anything, and I agreed. That's it? Pretty much. Gordon shook his head. That brother of mine is a riddle wrapped in a mystery, wrapped in a cardigan. Oh, there is something else. He said he regrets not speaking to you for four years. Gordon smiled sadly. Hmm, well. Yes, regrets. I've had a few. That's all very interesting, I have to say. All very interesting indeed. Do you have any other bombshells to drop on me today? You may as well get it over with while I'm still partly in shock. There was a single chair in the room, and Valkyrie slouched into it, crossing her legs. I've got one or two, the least of which is that I've broken up with Fletcher. Oh, dear. Oh, dear me. Well, we knew this would eventually happen. Um, the important thing is to remember the good times, but not dwell on them. Dwelling leads to miserable thoughts and the playing of bad music. It is to be avoided at all costs. Fletcher, there will be another Fletcher, and another one after him, and another. It's not the end of the world, Valkyrie. You know 
what the end of the world looks like. By all accounts, you're the cause of it. He chuckled. She didn't. He stopped chuckling. He didn't dump me, she said. I broke up with him. Oh, said Gordon, much brighter now. Well, that is completely different. Excellent. Bravo. Well, not excellent. I liked the boy. He seemed nice. But obviously, you had a good reason for ending it. It just felt like the time. I was getting bored. The death knell for many a mediocre relationship. I can't tell you how many beautiful women have broken up with me because they were bored. I can't tell you because it never happened. They all adored me. It was your humility, wasn't it? I'm sure that had something to do with it. You're like me, Valkyrie. You're never going to be content until you find that one person, that one single person who fills you with delight every time you hear their name. Did you ever find that person? He hesitated. Yes, I did. And what happened? Does it matter? What matters is you. You can't let this get you down. I wasn't. I'm upset about it, I suppose, but there's other stuff happening too. There always is. Skullduggery kept a secret from me. I see. Do you think that was wrong of him? No, not wrong, but it's a pretty big secret and it's, it's bad. Is he still your friend? Valkyrie sighed. Has he moved against you in any way? Has he hurt you? No. Then is he still your friend? I suppose. This secret. How long has he had it? Hundreds of years. Then it has nothing to do with you. It's quite simple, isn't it? He kept something from you, something about his past, and now you know it. And now you deal with it and move on. She filled her cheeks with air, then blew it out. It sounds really easy when you say it. It doesn't feel easy. Everyone has secrets, Valkyrie. I don't need to tell you that. So long as he hasn't used this secret to intentionally hurt you, however, I don't see the problem. Friends stick by each other. That's what they do. She looked at him. You were a wise and noble man, Uncle Gordon. And good-looking. You forgot good-looking. That's taken for granted. As well it should be. Now then, do you have any other problems I can help you with? There's a vampire who's in love with me. Dump him. Any other problems? Valkyrie laughed. Nothing I can't handle. In that case, be off with you. I have a book to write, characters to kill, and a party to plan. Chapter 37 The Wisdom of Leonard Cohen Ghastly checked his watch as he walked the corridors of the sanctuary, resigning himself to the fact that once again it looked like he'd be spending the night in his office instead of going home. He yawned heavily as he rounded the corner and saw Fletcher Wren sitting outside his door. Fletcher! Ghastly said. The kid looked up. His jeans were tattered. His boots were scuffed, and his T-shirt was a faded advertisement for a band Ghastly had never heard of. It was the eyes, though, that marked him out as truly tired. The eyes and the hair. Usually so meticulously untamed, tonight it hung long and flat and swept back off his forehead. Why, Fletcher said, I know it's late, but and I'm sorry if you're busy. Ghastly was always busy these days. He had closed his shop and embraced the duties of an elder, letting his new responsibilities wash over his old life and consume him completely. I have some free time, he lied. What can I do for you? Fletcher got up slowly, stiffly, like he'd been sitting there for hours. When he didn't say anything, Ghastly spoke again. Where have you been? he asked. Around. Fletcher said. Ghastly nodded. But the floodgates of conversation didn't burst open. This in itself was unusual. For as long as Ghastly had known him, 
Fletcher had never known when to shut up. To see him standing there in the corridor, hands in his pockets, eyes cast to the floor and giving one-word answers, was more than a little unsettling. "'Come inside,' Ghastly said, unlocking the door and walking in. He removed his robe, hung it on a hook on the wall and loosened his tie. He went to the side table and plugged in the kettle. "'Cup of tea?' he asked. Sure. Fletcher, he said, I'm not one of life's great conversationalists, so you're really going to have to help me out here. Start talking about something. Fletcher looked at him. Have you found a cure for Tenneth yet? Start talking about something else. Why? Because I said so. You're mad that you don't know how to help her, Fletcher said. And you're mad that you haven't found her yet, aren't you? Is that what you wanted to talk about? Because I don't see what this conversation will lead to other than annoying me. You asked her out. Fletcher, I have things to do. You asked her out, finally, and she said yes. She kissed you, then went away. And that's the last you saw of her before the remnant got into her. And now she's out there somewhere, no one knows where, but she's out there with Billy Ray Sanguine. Ghastly looked at the kid and said nothing, while he waited for the flash of anger to fade. He saw the hurt in Fletcher's eyes. This is about Valkyrie? he asked. The boy looked at the floor again. We broke up. She broke up with me. I'm sorry. I know it's different. I know Valkyrie hasn't been possessed and she's not gone. Not like Tanith is. But you love Tanith. And then all that happened. You had her, you finally had her, and you lost her. How do you deal with that? I drink a lot of tea, Fletcher. I've been around for a long time. I've been in love too many times to count. I'd like to say it gets easier, but it doesn't. The pain you're feeling now is the pain you're going to feel again and again. The advantage of having lived through this is that I do know I'll come out the other side. The pain lessens. You manage to distract yourself until the distractions become more important than the thing you're distracting yourself from. Do you think she loved you? I don't know. I don't know if I want to know. If she did love me, then I wasted a lot of time thinking about it instead of doing something. I don't think Valkyrie loved me, Fletcher said, and suddenly laughed. I'm sorry, this is so stupid. You probably think I'm just a stupid kid. I don't know anything about love or any of that. You know enough for it to hurt. The smile faded. Yeah, she said she loved me. She made a joke, said something and then said, and that's why I love you, and I latched on to it. Like an idiot, I decided to believe that this was her way of telling me how she felt. But she was making a joke. And I knew she was making a joke, but I wanted to believe it so much. The kettle boiled. Ghastly made two mugs of tea while Fletcher talked on. It's pathetic, Fletcher said. I went from thinking I was a top geezer, the last teleporter in the world, to someone who followed her around like a puppy. All she had to do was call me and I'd be there. The last two years of my life, of my life, have revolved around her. That's two years of me living for someone else. How sad is that? Nothing was more important than her. I offered her everything because I could give her everything. I could take her anywhere. There was nothing I wouldn't do for her and she knew that. She accepted it. I'd become, like, a part of her life. But not in a good way. Not in a healthy, happy, boyfriend kind of way. She knew she had me, faithful old Fletcher. And she knew that all she had to do was click her fingers and she'd get whatever it was she needed. I made her life easier. And whenever she, or Skullduggery, or even Tanith was in danger of taking something too seriously, they turned to the easy target. They turned to me and made a joke. I was okay with it, actually. 
It meant something at the time. It meant I was part of the group. I was one of the gang. And it meant you could spend more time around her, Ghastly said, sitting on the edge of his desk. Which is all you really wanted? Yeah, Fletcher murmured. He looked at the mug of tea in his hand, but didn't drink from it. But all that's gone now. She's with Kaylin. Did you know that? She was seeing him behind my back. Ghastly hid his surprise. That doesn't sound like Valkyrie. Well, there you go. She cheated on me with a bloody vampire. A vampire! Oh, uh, are you smiling? Yes, Ghastly said sadly. I am. I never thought we'd have so much in common, to be honest. The girl you love is in the arms of another, and that other happens to be a murderous monster. And the woman I love is in the arms of a psychopathic hitman. What a pair we make. I can't help it, said Fletcher. Images of Valkyrie and that thing of the two of them together keep coming into my head. I've been living with something like that for the past few months. It makes your insides go cold, doesn't it? It makes you want to kill someone. I want to kill the vampire, Fletcher said softly. The feeling is natural. I don't blame you for that at all. And while I know you're a good kid, you're not a killer. I am going to say this. That's a road you don't want to go down. Fletcher put the mug on the work table, spilling some of his tea. I just need to show Valkyrie that she's wrong, he said. I just need to show her that she's made a mistake. I need to prove myself. You want to make her beg to take you back? No. No, of course not. You want to punish her? Fine, Fletcher snapped. Yes. Is that wrong? She's the one who cheated on me. It's never going to happen, Ghastly said. This is Valkyrie we're talking about. She doesn't beg. If she changes her mind, she'll come at you with the very practical reason why you're getting back together. If you put her in a position where she'd have to beg, she's going to walk away out of sheer principle. So how do I get her to take me back? I don't know. But my first suggestion is to take some time. Fletcher frowned. What? No. The longer I leave it, the more Kalen will sink his fangs into her. Kalen doesn't matter. He never mattered. That's not going to last. Guys like that never do. But you'll do yourself no favors if you run up to her with tears in your eyes. I never mentioned tears, he said defensively. A friend of mine once said that a man never got a woman back by begging on his knees. Give yourself some time. Get over the pain. Man up. Then go back to her. Let us see what she's missing. I'm not saying it's going to work, but I'll be honest. It's your best shot. Fletcher nodded. Thanks, Ghastly. I didn't have anyone else to talk to. I'm pretty sure I don't even have any friends. Valkyrie was my only friend. Then you need to get yourself a life, kid. Yeah, said Fletcher. Yeah, I do. Chapter 38 Back at the Window Again A tapping woke her. Valkyrie groaned, turned over in bed, cracking her eyes open to look over at the window. The morning sunlight framed the curtains, and through a sliver of an opening she saw Skullduggery's gloved hand. Her parents were gone, but she still lay where she was, unsure if she even wanted to talk to him. Then she got up, wrapped the sheet around herself, and walked over. She pulled the curtains apart and undid the latch, then returned to her bed. She was snuggling down again as the window opened and Skullduggery climbed in. Valkyrie turned, so she was facing the wall. I'm in bed, she told him. I'm having a lie-in. I can see that, 
Do you plan on rising any time soon? She shrugged. Oh, he said. So that's it. She waited for him to continue. I was wondering how you were going to punish me for not confiding in you. Punishment, actually, is something I've been thinking about for a long time. What form of punishment is enough for what I did? Imprisonment? Death? Something else? Something scarier? I could only think of so many horrible tortures before they stopped having meaning. But you, you've come up with a punishment I never considered. You're going to sulk me to death. I'm glad you find this amusing. I've had years to see the funny side. What do you expect me to do? It's not the... This isn't about the vile thing. Yes, it's awful. Yes, it's insane. But okay, it happened. It's in the past. Not as in the past as we'd like. Shut up. Of course, you were saying. This is about you and me, and you not telling me the truth. It's about, may I interject? No. I'm going to interject anyway. Simply to point out that you only told me about the darkest thing after you had nigh sealed your true name. You may continue. She turned over and glared at him. That was different. Yes, it was. It was you. I kept it from you because I was scared and confused, and I didn't know how you'd react, she faltered. Shut up. I didn't say anything. You didn't have to. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the things we didn't tell each other cancel each other out. You're thinking, if I keep on being angry with you, I'll eventually realize that I don't have a leg to stand on and start to feel stupid. Well, you're wrong. I do have a leg to stand on, and I never feel stupid. That's good to hear. You should have told me about Vile. And you should have told me about Tarkas. And please remember that when you did eventually get around to telling me, I accepted it with grace and understanding. Valkyrie narrowed her eyes. Because you knew what it was like. That's why you took it so well. I thought you were just being really nice. I'm often nice, but rarely really. I couldn't be angry with you, Valkyrie. I am many things. But I am not a hypocrite. Are you? That isn't fair. Are you? She sighed and sat up, holding the sheet against her. Okay, fine, I forgive you. And now that we're confessing, is there anything else you'd like to tell me? Any other huge, big, massive secrets you've been hiding? Virtually none. Virtually? Practically. And you? Being the psycho who kills the world is the only one worth mentioning. Excellent. Then our consciences are clear. Is that it? Do we go back to being friends now? I certainly hope so, unless you were enjoying sulking. I hate sulking. You're very good at it. Thank you. I didn't think it'd be this easy. Going back to being friends, I mean. It's a pretty big thing that just happened, isn't it? There's a part of you that's... Evil? Yes. Just like there's a part of me that's evil. He tilted his head. You think we're different from everyone else? Aren't we? Every human being who has ever lived has the same potential in them for good and evil. Mortal or sorcerer, it doesn't matter. Power has a way of bringing out the worst in people. Malevolent, serpine, Hitler, Lord Vile, Darkus. We're all the same. You just put me on a list with Hitler. You're going to start sulking again, aren't you? Hitler, for God's sake! Power corrupts, Valkyrie. You're better off learning that now, so you can prepare for later. But Hitler? You may need to focus here. Right. Yes, okay. Turn around... Are you going to throw something at me? What? No, I'm getting out of bed. Oh, he said and turned. She swung her feet to the floor, stood up and adjusted the sheet, then walked out of the room. So what are we dealing with? 
Is Lord Vile your subconscious, or is it your old necromancer power with a mind of its own? Skullduggery followed her onto the landing. I think it's both, to be honest. Was he hiding inside you this whole time? It certainly looks that way. I didn't see him, of course. When you can turn to shadow, it's easy enough to find places to hide, even in a skeleton. It's all very unsettling, to be honest. She went into the bathroom while Skullduggery waited outside. And did you notice that he's terribly unruly? he asked through the door. He completely ignored my commands. Valkyrie dropped the sheet and got into the shower, talking loudly over the water. So, how do we stop him? Do we just send you to a psychiatrist or something? Excuse me? Hey, it's your subconscious that's attacking people. I don't need therapy. She turned her face up to the shower head. Have you ever tried it? Talking about one's feelings defeats the purpose of having those feelings, she heard him say. Once you try to put the human experience into words, it becomes little more than a spectator sport. Everything must have a cause and a name. Every random thought must have a root in something else. This is all missing the point. But if you can confront your inner demons... I did confront my inner demon. I punched him in the face and he exploded. Valkyrie had to laugh. But now he's back. Of course he's back. He's resourceful. He's my inner demon, after all. But he ignored your commands. He, it, whatever, ignored you. He doesn't need you. He's become a... a being. A person. Completely independent, Skullduggery said. An individual. I'd be proud, if I wasn't so disturbed. Does this mean I don't have a subconscious anymore? If my subconscious is up and walking around and calling itself Lord Vile, then what do I have left? Skullduggery, now you need to focus. Yes, of course. Besides, that's more of a conversation to have with Gordon. Conversations I have with you, Valkyrie, revolve around finding solutions and saving the day. That's what I want to hear, she said as she turned off the water. She got out of the shower, grabbed a towel, and wrapped it round herself. So, how do we stop Vile? She opened the bathroom door, and Skullduggery tilted his head at her. Very simple, he said. We don't. Valkyrie frowned. That is very simple. In fact, it's a little too simple. She walked back to her room. The sanctuary is going to say the same thing, he said, following behind. Vile is after melancholia, so we should leave him alone. See how far he gets. He might get lucky. He might kill her. That's what I mean. Valkyrie got back inside a room, turned, and held up a hand to stop Skullduggery from coming in after her. Ah, he said and nodded as she closed the door. Skullduggery, it's Melancholia. I know I hate her, and I know she tried to kill me, and I'm well aware that she plans to kill billions of people, but we can't just let her die. There was a pause before Skullduggery responded. I have to admit, he said, I did not think that sentence was going to end where it ended. I'm just sick of everyone killing everyone else. When I heard that Mum had been hurt, I went to Mort's cell with the intention of killing him. I wanted to actually kill him. I don't like that. I don't like that I wanted that. It was too much killing, I think. Valkyrie scrubbed herself half dry, then had a better idea and straightened up, went back to the door and opened it. Hat in front of your eyes, she said. No peeking. He did as he was told and raised his free hand. She held the towel away from her as the moisture drifted from her body. You should be able to do this yourself by now, Skullduggery said from behind his hat. I can do it, she said, but I always leave my skin too dry. She stepped back inside her room and closed the door again. Then she went to the mirror and tapped the glass. Her reflection blinked and stepped out. Why can't we arrest Melancholia?
Valkyrie asked, taking her black clothes from the wardrobe. Put some shackles on her, send her to prison for a few years, then let her out and tell her to be good. Because she's the deathbringer, said Skullduggery. She's melancholia. She's the annoying girl I used to laugh at. I don't want her dead. The reflection shrugged. Melancholy doesn't share that compunction, it said. Valkyrie frowned at her mirror image. Either you're arguing with yourself, Skullduggery said from the landing, or your reflection makes more sense than you do. Shut up, Valkyrie said to the door, and then looked back at the reflection. And you, nobody asked your opinion, and stop standing there all naked and stuff. You're distracting. The reflection shrugged again, went to the dresser and started picking out clothes. Valkyrie pulled on her underwear and trousers. We can't just let Vile kill her, she said loudly. We have to try and arrest her. We will, Skullduggery answered. But it's a race. Is that what you're saying? If we get to her, we arrest her. If he gets to her, he kills her. If she resists arrest, we might have to kill her too. Don't forget that. So no one is going after Vile? That's correct. She grabbed her boots, started putting them on. And what about when all this is done? If the Deathbringer, for whatever reason, ceases to remain alive, there's a good chance that the thing that is Lord Vile will simply disappear. Whatever aspect of my subconscious that is walking around will come back to me. The armor will return to its inert form and everyone will be happy. Except Melancholia. Except Melancholia, who will be dead. Valkyrie stood up. And me? Hopefully, you won't be. But if Melancholia dies, the reflection said, still picking out clothes, then won't the title of Deathbringer switch over to Valkyrie? Stop contributing to this conversation, Valkyrie said crossly. The reflection gave another shrug. Well, Valkyrie said loudly, will it switch over to me? Skullduggery hesitated. That's a possibility, I grant you. And if it does, then Vile will want to kill me too, won't he? Another hesitation. Perhaps. So we're going to have to figure out a way to stop him, no matter what happens, she said her voice muffled slightly by the T-shirt she was dragging over her head. Not quite, Skullduggery answered. There is the possibility that he will go up against Melancholia and she will destroy him utterly, which will take care of the Lord Vile problem quite nicely, but obviously add to the Melancholia problem. And it might also pose a problem for me if someone manages to kill my subconscious. This is getting very complicated. Not if you pay attention. Do you think he can do it? Valkyrie said, running a brush through her hair. Do you think he has a chance? I don't know. From what we've seen, her power ebbs and flows. If he manages to catch her when she's at her weakest, yes, he will kill her in an instant. But if he gets to her when she's strong... And we have the same problem. Which means we have to arrest her when she's ebbing, not flowing. How do we do that? First, we have to find out where they're hiding her. Valkyrie put the brush down, went to the door and opened it. Can I ask you a question? And I don't mean this in a bad way, but are you insane? Skullduggery looked at her. Would it make any difference if I was? Probably not. Then why put labels on ourselves? That's a job for a psychiatrist. We punch people, Valkyrie. That's who we are. Embrace your inner lunatic. Fun times guaranteed. She smiled. You're a bad influence. I never claimed otherwise. Your reflection is still naked, by the way. Valkyrie shrieked, shoved him back and slammed her bedroom door closed. Chapter 39 Killing Craven Wreath never had a problem with killing people, but he always preferred it when he had right on his side, when they deserved it, and when he was sure he could get away with it. 
Today he planned to kill Craven. And while he was sure that Wright was on his side, and that Craven thoroughly deserved what was coming to him, he wasn't overly confident he could get away with it. Still, he figured, sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do, and then sometimes you've just got to run like hell after it's done. Getting Craven alone was proving to be a problem, however. He had everyone convinced that he had all the answers, so now they flocked around him like he was the high priest. It was a most disheartening sight. Necromancers were feared the world over. Nobody trusted them, nobody liked them, and everyone had a scary necromancer story to tell around the campfire. Necromancers were supposed to be cold and weird, pale-faced and disturbing. It was an image that had been carefully cultivated over generations. And now, here they were, sycophantic and scared, gushing praise and mindless worship over a man who could very well be leading them towards a most inglorious end. I have just spoken with the Deathbringer, Craven announced solemnly. Wreath watched as an expectant hush spread through the crowd. Last night the souls of our dead brothers and sisters spoke to her in a dream. They thanked her for her actions, told her they had never felt more powerful. A woman appeared beside Wreath, her hood up to cover her face. She said nothing, just watched as Craven continued. They explained that they were now a part of her, adding to her strength, adding to her wisdom, and that once the passage happens, they will return to us and guide us towards our destiny. They asked her to tell you all not to worry, not to fear. Cast your doubts aside, they said. Embrace what is to come. He closed his eyes and bowed his head, allowing the murmurs to ripple. I dreamed of no such thing, said the woman beside Wreath, her voice low enough so that only he could hear. He looked at her. The hood was still up, but he could see the point of her chin and the raised scars that crossed it. This is what he wanted all along, Melancholia whispered. He wanted everyone listening to him paying attention to what he has to say. That's why he did it. That's why he did what? Wreath asked. Melancholia moved slightly, and he saw a thin smile. That's why he made me who I am. That's why he had Tenebrae killed. Wreath glanced around, making sure no one could overhear. Craven had Tenebrae killed? As good as, said Melancholia. He brought him to see me. What was I supposed to do? And why are you telling me this? Why do you think, Melancholia murmured, just as the crowd started to quieten down again. Because he plans to kill you next. Brothers and sisters, Craven said, drawing everyone's eyes back to him. We are preparing to bid farewell to the world we know. This existence is a flawed thing. It needs to be improved. It needs us to do it. Because of us, because of you, the Deathbringer will usher in the passage. Tonight! The congregation of easily let idiots gasped. Someone at the back actually started sobbing with joy. Wreath turned to Melancholia, but she was gone. He spied her on the far side of the room, slipping out the door. Nobody noticed her. They were all watching Craven. Tonight, my friends, our destiny is at hand. No longer shall we grovel at the whim of forces beyond our control. Tonight, we seize control. Tonight, we become the masters of existence. There were cheers and chanting, which would probably have been impressive if there had been more than thirty people in the crowd. But as it was, it sounded weak and a little silly. Prepare! Craven roared, as if he was addressing an amphitheatre. The day of reckoning is upon us!
Thirty morons cheered. And Wreath started to look forward to the moment he used the knife. Rousing speech, Wreath said. Craven looked up, startled, as Wreath stepped out of the shadows. Cleric, he said, his hands patting his chest. You shouldn't do that. For a second there, I thought you were Lord Vile. Lord Vile probably wouldn't have cared how rousing the speech was, Wreath pointed out. True, I suppose, Craven said. So, are you excited? About? Why, the passage, of course. Weren't you the one who said the sooner the better? I suppose I was. And she's ready, is she, Melancholia? She fully expects to be. Wreath nodded, searching his peripheral vision for the white cleaver. When he didn't see him, he stepped a bit closer. I expect that dream she had was a comforting one, he said. Indeed it was, Craven nodded. It allayed a lot of her fears. One tends to forget her young age. In many ways she is still a child, and like any child she needs an encouraging word every now and then. She has been comforted. Wreath was close now, close enough to take the knife from his coat and plunge it into Craven's soft belly. He glanced over his shoulder, making sure everyone else was walking the other way. Do you think our brothers and sisters are ready? he asked. I think so, Craven said. Don't you? Wreath smiled at him. I think they're dumb enough to do whatever they're told. How about you, Cleric Craven? Are you ready? I am, Cleric Wreath. This is what we've been living our lives for, is it not? True enough, I suppose. Forgive me, but you don't look like a man whose dreams are about to come true. Wreath looked him right in the eyes, right in those soft, wet eyes that looked like drops of blue ink swimming in milk, and he let himself smile. How about now, Craven? Now do I look like a man whose dreams are about to come true? He took the knife from his pocket, and Craven saw it, stepped back, mouth open to scream. Then there was a blur of white, and Wreath ducked, barely avoiding the scythe that swooped towards his head. He raised his cane, blocking the scythe handle as the cleaver spun, tried to stab with the knife, but a boot came from nowhere, sent him pinwheeling back. Craven had found his voice, and he used it to scream for help. The cleaver darted towards Wreath, and he darted back, cursing himself for his impatience. He brought the shadows in around him and stepped through them to the next room, moving quickly, shadow-walking again to the other side of the walls, emerging into the morning sun. He ran, took off before they could follow him. He'd left a car out there for a quick escape. But even as he jumped in and gunned the engine, he realized he had only one place left to go, and it wasn't going to be pretty. Roarhaven never was. He parked off Roarhaven's main street, if it really could be called that, and waited for the Bentley to show up. The town was small and withered and nasty, and the sanctuary was big and grey and ugly. He was hungry, but he didn't dare step into the squalid café that jutted from the street beside him like an uneven tooth. Apart from all the obvious concerns regarding his personal safety, the place just didn't look sanitary. An hour or so after his stomach first started rumbling, the Bentley swept by and parked outside the sanctuary. Wreath got out, wondered about the likelihood of Skullduggery Pleasant shooting him before he got halfway across the road, and then decided to shadow walk over to them. The shadows curled around him, and when they dissipated, he was standing by the rear wheel as Valkyrie closed the passenger door. Now, before you do anything rash, Wreath started, and she spun and hit him cracked her knuckles painfully along his jaw. He went back a step, one hand to his face, nodding. Okay, that's fair. But before this gets out of control, Skullduggery jumped and slid across the roof of the Bentley, the heel of his shoe slamming into the side of Reet's head. Valkyrie snapped her palm at the air, and his cane flew from his grip. Reet staggered, waving his hands. Please, he gasped. Stop hitting me for five seconds. Valkyrie glanced at Skullduggery, who paused. Wreath spat blood and straightened up. 
Thank you, he said. I've come to discuss. Skullduggery punched him, and Reet's head rocked back, and he dropped. There, Skullduggery said, as his consciousness left him. That's five seconds. When Reith opened his eyes, he was lying on the floor of a room in the sanctuary with his hands shackled behind his back. Skullduggery sat in a chair with his legs crossed, looking down at him. Valkyrie stood beside him. Interesting, Reith said. You haven't killed me. Skullduggery took off his hat, flicked something from the brim, and put it on his knee. There's still time, he said. Wreath grunted slightly as he sat up without the use of his arms. Valkyrie waited till he was sitting straight, then stepped over and put her boot to his shoulder. Very mature, Wreath sighed as she tipped him over again. He lay with his face squashed against the floor. But if this is how you want to conduct this conversation, it's fine. I'm hardly in a position to argue. You're damn right, Valkyrie said. You attacked me! I did. I'm sorry. I didn't want to, but I did it. I hope it didn't hurt you too badly. If I were you, Skullduggery said, I'd be more worried about your own state of discomfort. Oh, I am, Skullduggery, believe me. My overriding concern right now is my own well-being, which is why I'm here. I've come to make a deal. I can tell you where melancholia is. Skullduggery's voice betrayed no hint of surprise. Why would you want to? Because she's going to ruin everything. Her and Craven. They're going to bring the necromancer order to its knees. They need to be stopped. And they're the only ones who can do it. Well, you and the rest of the sanctuary agents, obviously. So you suddenly want to stop the passage? Skullduggery asked. Stop it? Good God, no. The passage is the only thing that will save the world. But Melancholia is not the one to bring it about. She's too unstable. She's too unpredictable. Does she have the potential to kill millions? Yes, probably. But billions? I doubt it. And unless three billion are killed in the same instant, it's not going to work. The only thing she'll accomplish is the pointless death of millions of innocent people. Valkyrie shook her head. You've got some warped ideas of right and wrong, you know that? So you come running to us to clean up the mess you made. Why don't you guys handle it? Because I'm the only one who can see the truth. The others, there aren't many, but there are enough, have been blinded by Craven's words. I tried to take care of it without you, but my little assassination attempt didn't work out too well. Then where is she? Skullduggery asked. Wreath smiled. Not yet. First, you get the council to agree to my terms. There are no terms, Solomon. Tell us where she is. I want my attack on Valkyrie and my involvement in events so far forgiven and forgotten. Skullduggery took his hat from his knee and uncrossed his legs as he sat forward. You were planning the murder of three billion people. Wreath nodded. And I'd like that to be forgotten about, please. What do you think will come of this? We know what the passage is now. Everyone does. You think it's going to go back to normal, with necromancers left alone to scheme and plot? Temples are going to be torn down all over the world. It's over for all of you. Not necessarily. I think it's still possible to blame this whole thing on one man. Skullduggery tilted his head. Craven. His mad ramblings have led to this, Reed said, displaying an impressive air of sadness. He willfully misinterpreted our sacred teachings. He warped what the passage is truly about. Can we be held responsible for the actions of a madman? A fanatic? You really think that act is going to work? Valkyrie asked, frowning. Wreath smiled up at her. Why not? Everything that man has done reinforces what I've just said. He experimented on poor Melancholia, brainwashed the poor girl, 
His insane ambition drove him to murder our kind and gentle high priest Aaron Tenebrae. Tenebrae would never have condoned the actions he's taken. But Vandermeer Craven is unlike anyone I've ever met before. He is magnetic. He makes you want to follow him into destruction and madness. I am ashamed to say that I, too, was under the spell of his fervor, his faith, and his charisma. Valkyrie blinked. Charisma? Yes. Don't you think that's stretching it a little too far? Do you think so? Some people will have met him. Hmm. You have a point. Okay, then maybe not charisma. I'll think of some other lie. It'll be fine. The point is, yes, the temple here in Ireland will be tarnished. It will probably be torn down and necromancy banned. But it will survive in the rest of the world so long as Melancholia isn't allowed to start killing people. Get the council to agree to my terms, and I'll tell you where they are. I'll even take you there. Chapter 40 The End of the Deathbringer Once Erskine Ravel, with great reluctance, granted him amnesty, Wreath took Skullduggery and Valkyrie into the grounds of an abandoned retirement home then nodded across to the main building. In there, he said, I hope you still have your teleporter, because the only way you're going to catch them by surprise is as if you manage to skip all the defences they've built up around them. Valkyrie frowned. They're here? Next to graveyards and hospitals, old folks' homes are great places to absorb a whole lot of death. This one, however, hasn't seen any activity in over twenty years. It's kind of flat, as these things go, but beggars can't be choosers, and Craven is most definitely a beggar right now. How many are in there? Skullduggery asked. Not counting Craven, Melancholia, and the White Cleaver? Thirty-three. But they aren't experienced. They've spent most of their adult lives in one temple or another. They'll put up a fight, but it won't be a good one so I'd consider it a personal favour if you don't kill every last one of them. Skullduggery turned to him. What makes you think we're inclined to do you any favours? I don't know. Naivety? Why don't you want them dead? Valkyrie asked. Wreath shrugged. They're scared and confused, and they're a little dim, to be honest. But they don't all deserve to die. Not if they don't have to. Craven absolutely deserves it. Melancholia? It'd be safer for everyone if she stopped breathing. But the others? They're harmless? Well, Reed said, managing a smile. Maybe not harmless, but certainly misguided. They're my brothers and sisters. Granted, not the type of brothers or sisters that you actually like, but even so, I'd hate to see them die for nothing. We'll keep that in mind, Skullduggery said. How long can we expect them to stay here? Oh, they're not going anywhere, apart from the fact that they have no other backup available to them. This is where Melancholia will try to usher in the passage. Skullduggery's voice turned sharp. Tonight? Yes, indeed. I don't know what Craven is thinking, because Melancholia will be much more powerful tomorrow night. Maybe he anticipates your interference, and he wants to get it all out of the way as soon as possible. Valkyrie ducked back. I saw someone at the window. They're in there all right. Then my work here is done, Reed said. I wish you both the best of luck, and I have faith that you will foil their evil plans and save the day. Skullduggery, it's been a pleasure, as always. Valkyrie, once Melancholia falls, there's going to be an opening in the Deathbringer Department, so if you ever want to continue your training with me, don't... Hold your breath, she said sourly. Reed smiled. The shadows curled around him, and he was gone. Valkyrie looked at Skullduggery. Another raid on a necromancer stronghold? It would appear so, he said. Although this is less a stronghold than a retirement home, but your point is well made. Still, I have a feeling this one is going to go much quicker than the raid on the temple, so long as... So long as we have Fletcher with us. Yes, I am sorry, 
Valkyrie, but we do need his help. Don't apologize, she said. Just don't ask me to call him. I doubt he'd pick up. An hour later, Valkyrie was in a closed-down old factory ten miles from the retirement home. She nodded to two young women she knew, Callista Pendragon and Rosella Ember. They were new to the sanctuary, brought in as part of the effort to refill the ranks. There were a lot of new faces around, now that Valkyrie looked. The turnover rate for sanctuary operatives had been getting pretty high in the past few years. She saw Fletcher talking to Skullduggery. He glanced up, their eyes locked, and her heart lurched. Then he looked away again, and she felt terrible. She stayed well away, letting Skullduggery brief him on what they needed to do. It was to be a two-man incursion, Skullduggery and Fletcher, sneaking into the home in order to check out the layout and the opposition. Once Melancholia was located, Fletcher would teleport them both out, everyone else would link up and they'd all teleport back in, hopefully for a surprise attack. When Skullduggery had told her that it was to be only Fletcher and himself, Valkyrie hadn't argued. Her insides wrenched every time she remembered the look on Fletcher's face, and the last thing she wanted to do was make her ex-boyfriend hurt even more. When they were ready, Skullduggery and Fletcher vanished, and Valkyrie waited with all the others. She didn't like waiting. It annoyed her. Irritation added to the butterflies in her stomach. Ghastly came over, nodded to her, let a few moments slide by before speaking. So, he said, I heard you two broke up. I suppose we did. Ghastly nodded. He had a look on his face like he wanted to ask something, but didn't want to actually utter the words. She frowned. Fletcher talked to you, didn't he? He didn't have anyone else he could go to, Ghastly confessed. He's upset. I know. He cares for you a great deal. And I care for him, she said, surprising herself with how defensive she suddenly sounded. Why does nobody understand that you can still care for someone and not want to see them at the same time? It's not like I suddenly can't stand him or anything. Then why did you break up? I just didn't want that kind of relationship anymore. It's hard to explain. He thinks it's something to do with the vampire. Valkyrie hesitated. How much did he tell you? He said you're with a vampire now. She groaned. Okay, first of all, he shouldn't have said that. Second, it's not even true. Not really. Third, you and me, we're not talking about it. Vampires are dangerous, Valkyrie. They're monsters, pure and simple. I'm surprised Skullduggery is allowing it to continue. She arched an eyebrow. Skullduggery doesn't have a say in it, and neither do you, and neither does Fletcher. It's no one's business but my own. I'm just looking out for you. I know. It's appreciated. Up to a point. Ghastly nodded. Can I ask a question, though? The last one, I promise. Sure. Did you take Fletcher for granted? Valkyrie was quiet for a moment. I suppose I did. I knew he'd always be there for me, so, like, where was the challenge? Ghastly nodded. That's what he figured. Do you think he'll be okay? Of course he will. Just give him time. How much time? I want us to be friends. You can't spend all that time together and then all of a sudden not care if you never see that person again. I miss him already, you know. I don't want to get back with him, but I miss him. All you can do is wait, Valkyrie. I hate waiting. I've noticed. Ten minutes later, Fletcher and Skullduggery were back. Okay, Skullduggery said. Most of the necromancers are in a large, open room, so that's where we'll be teleporting. Very little furniture, very little cover. We'll be dealing with thirty-five necromancers plus Melancholia, who will be in a raised stage directly in front of us when we arrive. You leave Melancholia to us. You stay away from the White Cleaver. Your job is to keep the rest of the necromancers off our backs. Our aim here is to subdue Melancholia and teleport her out. Subdue? 
asked Callista. We're trying to take her alive. The collected sorcerers frowned. Not to be a pain, said Rosella, but wouldn't it be easy to just kill her? Callista nodded. More fun, too. It might come to that, Skullduggery said. But we're not a death squad. We've issued a warrant for her arrest, and so we want to arrest her. It's really that simple. Everyone clear? Then link up. They formed three rows and linked arms, Skullduggery standing between Valkyrie and Fletcher. At Skullduggery's command, the factory became the retirement home. Big windows, lots of sunshine and open space, floors that may have once been used for ballroom dancing. One necromancer saw them, and the others turned, shouting, cursing, throwing shadows. Valkyrie saw Craven with his eyes wide, grabbing the white cleaver and holding him as a shield. Behind Craven, Melancholia stood on the stage in a black cloak, the hood up and covering her scars. Skullduggery's arm encircled Valkyrie's waist, and they lifted into the air while the invading force engaged the necromancers. Three of the necromancers sent shadows up to intercept their flight, like missiles speeding towards a jet fighter. Skullduggery cursed, throwing Valkyrie forward him in a second before the shadows hit him. She used the air to spur her on, over the heads of the others. Melancholia looked up, snarled at her, and then they crashed together and went down. Valkyrie was the first to her feet, and she hauled Melancholia up and threw her against the wall. Melancholia whipped her hand at her, but Valkyrie knocked it away, stepped in and crunched an elbow into her chin. Melancholia staggered, her eyes wide but unfocused. Valkyrie pressed the attack. To hesitate would be to allow her enemy to stir the shadows into a storm and rip her apart, just like she had done on the clifftop in Haggard. Valkyrie hit her again and Melancholia howled in pain. Leave her alone! Valkyrie turned, saw the fighting behind her, saw Skullduggery and the white cleaver go at it, saw Craven staggering towards her with a bloody nose. Leave her alone! He screeched again, hurling sharpened shadows. Valkyrie threw herself down, and the shadows missed her, but continued on. Melancholia wasn't fast enough to dodge them. They cut through her flesh, shearing her from left shoulder to right hip. She gave a small gasp as her body came apart. Valkyrie stared as the two halves of Melancholia collapsed on the stage. She was aware of the sounds of battle, of grunts and yells and cries, and she was aware of Craven's screaming. Melancholia's face was turned towards her. All those small scars on that pale face, the lips that used to sneer at her now parted slightly, the eyes that used to glare at her now blank and staring sightlessly. Craven rushed by, completely forgetting Valkyrie was even there. He fell to his knees, ranting and raving, screeching obscenities, howling like a wounded animal. The sounds of fighting died. The necromancers stood there, horrified looks on their faces. The white cleaver leaped onto the stage, and shadows curled from the amulet around Craven's neck, wrapped them both in darkness with the remains of Melancholia, and then they were gone. Up and down the room, necromancers were suddenly shadow-walking away, only the unconscious and those restrained by Valkyrie's colleagues remaining. Bony hands picked her up, and Skullduggery led her off the stage. No one spoke. Valkyrie sat on the concrete step of the retirement home, watching the sorcerers and the cleavers depart. Skullduggery sat beside her. Are you okay? She exhaled. I don't know. I suppose so. I'm not the one who got chopped in half, and she would have killed me if she'd had the chance, so that stops me from actually, you know, feeling sad about it. But you still didn't want her to die? No, of course not. She wasn't like Vengeance or Serpine. She was... Like you? She scowled at him. She wasn't a bit like me. She was an idiot. And smug. God, she was always so smug and condescending. But still, she was only a few years older. She never even got the chance to realise what an annoying little twerp she was being. Life isn't fair, said Skullduggery. In my experience, death 
isn't so different. What do you think Craven will do now? Panic, presumably. This was his one power play. This was his big moment. I doubt he even had a backup plan. He got away with seventeen necromancers. Maybe they're scattered. Maybe they're together. I don't know. It doesn't matter. We're going to round them all up before they slip out of the country. Valkyrie sighed. Can't we leave that to someone else? What's the point of being part of the sanctuary if we can't assign some of the rubbish jobs to other people? My thoughts exactly. So that's it? We're done? The Deathbringer is dead. The crisis is averted. It would seem like we have triumphed once again. Yay, us, Valkyrie said and stretched. I'm tired. Fletcher's hanging around outside. He could take you home. I'd prefer to drive, actually. Is it because of the scintillating conversation? That must be it. This wasn't the ending we wanted, Skullduggery said. No, it wasn't, replied Valkyrie. It was the ending we got, though. Yes, it was. Chapter 41 Home, Sweet Home Saturday morning came and went, and Valkyrie slept through most of it. When she woke, she just lay there, looking up at the ceiling. She thought about Melancholia, and Wreath, and Moor, and about Fletcher and Caelan. All of it jumbled together this past week, becoming mixed up and messed up one thing after another. She hadn't had time to really dwell on recent events. That might have been a good thing. She crawled out of bed, showered and dressed, went downstairs. Her parents were heading out that afternoon, but when she walked into the living room, her father was leaning over the basket, prodding Alice with his finger. Hello, small person, he said. Desmond, her mum said from the couch, don't poke the baby. Her dad stopped, looked guilty, then leaned closer. You may have won this round, he whispered, but I will have my... And don't threaten the baby either. I wasn't, he said, straightening up immediately. Just leave her alone. You're annoying her. I'm not annoying her. She doesn't even know enough to be annoyed. She's what, a week old? She's three months. She's three months in our years, but how old is she in baby years? Come away from her. Steph, could you pick her up? It's time for her feed. Valkyrie went to the baby while her dad frowned. Why didn't you ask me to pick her up? I was standing right there. Don't you trust me? That's it, isn't it? You don't trust me. I do trust you, her mum said. I just don't trust you a lot. Stephanie has safe hands. You want to see safe hands? Her dad asked. He went to the fruit bowl on the side table, took two apples and proceeded to juggle them. See? Safe as anything. Her mum frowned at him. Are you... Proposing you juggle our newborn child? Of course not, he said. I'd only be able to juggle her if you had twins. Otherwise, it's just throwing. Steph, her mum said, give me the baby and never let your father near her. Deal, Valkyrie said, handing her sister over. Her dad put the apples back in the bowl. Everyone seems to forget that I'm not a complete novice at this. Don't I already have one beautiful daughter and she turned out okay, didn't she? I didn't drop her once. You dropped her when we were at the zoo, Valkyrie's mum said. Valkyrie spun her head to him. You dropped me? Ah, uh, he said. I'd forgotten about that. In my defence, though, you were a very wriggly child. One moment you were there, the next you were, you know on the ground in the penguin enclosure. She blinked. You dropped me in the penguin enclosure? I was leaning over the railing and you just plopped out of my grip. You weren't hurt or anything. And even if you had been, I'm sure the penguins would have taken you in, raised you as one of their own. It would have been a different life for you, but still a good one. I can't believe you dropped me. Neither could the people around us. Some crazy woman stormed up and roared at me for five minutes about how I shouldn't be putting my child in danger. That was me, Valkyrie's mum muttered. Now it makes sense, Valkyrie said, collapsing out of the couch. My fear of zoos, my fear of penguins, 
My fear of being dropped in a zoo with the penguins. It's all Dad's fault. Most things are, he admitted sadly, and wandered over to his wife. But I won't make the same mistakes again, I promise. From this moment on, I will be the best father the world has ever seen. Wifey, may I please hold my child? I'm feeding her. Give me the child and the bottle. I'll feed her. Valkyrie's mum looked at him suspiciously. When you hold a baby, what is the most important thing to remember? Not to drop it, he said proudly. Well, yes, well done, dear, but I was thinking more about how you hold the baby. Ah, he said, of course. The secret to holding a baby is to pick it up by the scruff of the neck. You're thinking of kittens? Pick it up by its ears, then. You're thinking of nothing. Can I please just hold her? I don't think that's wise. A lot of things aren't wise, Melissa. Is crossing the road with your eyes closed wise? No, but I'd do it anyway. His wife nodded. Stephanie, you're in charge of teaching Alice how to cross the road. Gotcha. Her dad held his hands out, and finally her mum sighed. Be careful, she warned. Trust me, he said. She handed the baby over. Valkyrie's dad held Alice out straight, looked at her and smiled. Aren't you so cute? he asked. Aren't you? Aren't you the cutest? He brought her in close, held her against his face and staggered around the room. Help me, he cried. A face hugger has me. Valkyrie and her mother observed him as he lifted her off, chuckling. You know, he said, from Alien, the face hugger. He held the baby against his face again. Help me, Sigourney Weaver, help me! Alice, for her part, seemed bemused by the whole thing. They left half an hour later, when Alice was in her basket and sleeping. Valkyrie dialed Skullduggery's number, and he picked up. Hey, she said softly, it's me. Skullduggery paused. No, it's not. If it were me, then I'd be talking to myself, and I don't do that any more. I certainly don't ring myself. That's one of the first signs of madness, and if it isn't, it should be. She sighed. Are you finished talking nonsense? I haven't talked nonsense all morning. I miss it. Why are you speaking so quietly? Because the baby's sleeping. Can she walk yet? No. I could walk from a very young age, you know. I was a very advanced child. You must be so proud. I am. It's funny, actually. I've never thought about what you'd have been like as a child. What were you like? I was shorter. I bet you never shut up. Actually, I found it very difficult to speak. I had a stutter, you see. You? It's hard to believe, isn't it? It didn't stop me from developing a razor-like wit, though, even if the townspeople did suspect that I was possessed by the devil. Four hundred years ago, no one really understood why people stuttered. They were simpler times. So, why do people stutter? I don't know. They're probably possessed by the devil. You're so annoying. Any word in Craven? Three of his necromancers have been arrested trying to flee the country. That leaves us with fourteen more. Not counting the white cleaver or Craven himself. So he's still at large? Yes, but that won't last long. If it were Wreath we were talking about, he'd vanish and we'd never see him again. But Craven has spent most of his adult life in one temple or another. Only rarely did he venture out into the real world. We'll catch him soon enough. There was a knock on the door. Hey, she said, I have to go. Call me if there's, you know, anything to talk about. He sounded amused. You're bored, aren't you? No, she said, walking into the hall. This is my day off, and I'm enjoying being normal. You're bored. You're the one who's bored. Without me around, you're lost, aren't you? Just admit that you miss me. You are an amusing oddity. She grinned. That'll do for now. She hung up and opened the door. She put her phone in a pocket as she stepped out and looked around. No one. Shrugging, she went back inside, walked into the kitchen. God, she was bored. When Alice was awake, time flitted by, but when she was asleep, Valkyrie had nothing to do. She needed a hobby, something that didn't include hitting people. 
or maybe some friends that she could invite over on a Saturday morning to keep her company while she babysat. She felt a pang when Fletcher flashed into her head and fought it down hard. She refused to feel lonely, not on her day off. Valkyrie walked to the back door, which hadn't been closed properly, shut it, and locked it. There was now a baby in the house, after all. She couldn't take the chance that a wild animal might wander in and make off with Alice, like those dingoes in Australia. She was probably being unfair to both dingoes and Australia, but she couldn't risk it. Locked doors kept the dingoes out, and that's all there was to it, even if she didn't know what a dingo actually was. She took out her phone, searched the internet, found a picture of a baby dingo, and now she really wanted a baby dingo for a pet. Valkyrie sighed, putting the phone away. She really needed a hobby. She walked out of the kitchen, and someone grabbed her, smashed her head against the wall. White light exploded behind her eyes. She wanted to drop to the ground, but there were hands on her, someone speaking, and then the hallway blurred as she was thrown the length of it. She hit the ground, banging her chin and biting her tongue. Blood in her mouth, thunder in her head. She felt fingers in her hair, heard herself cry out as she was wrenched back. More talking, but the words slipped by. Her ears were buzzing. Her head snapped. Someone had hit her. She was on the floor again, on her back this time. Someone sitting on her, straddling her, a hand at her throat. She tried to push her the air, but she couldn't focus. She clicked her fingers, but couldn't find the spark. Her head was splitting. She blinked, the man on top of her becoming less hazy. For a moment she didn't recognize him. All she saw was the snarling mouth with the cut lip and the spittle that flew as he spoke. She saw the eyes, wide and bruised and burning with anger. A name drifted to her. More. You thought I wouldn't come back at you, he sneered. You thought you could do that and get away with it. His hand at her throat was cutting off her air. She realised she already had her hands up, trying to release the pressure. She brought her knees in so they were pressed against him from behind, and then she hooked her left foot to the outside of his right. He didn't notice. They had to let me go, he said. Cops can't have someone beaten up in their own cells, not without a lawsuit. He pulled his right hand back, cracked it against her cheek. Her head swam, but she fought through it. I saw your mother's address on one of their foils. I thought to myself, the moment I get out of here, I'm paying that girl a visit. I'm going to give her some of what she gave me. He leaned down, his face mere inches from hers. I don't know how you did all that crazy stuff, but I can do some crazy stuff on my own. I can beat that pretty face of yours right off you. She waited until he started to lean away. Then she trapped his right hand at her throat and smacked her own right hand up into his chin. She didn't even give him time to feel it. Her hand went to his shoulder, fingers closing around his jacket, and she snapped her body off the ground, bridging him up and over, and now she was on top, smashing her elbow down into his face again and again while he attempted to cover up. He tried to push her off, but she kept bringing the elbow down. He started shouting, cursing at her. Somewhere in the distance, she heard a baby crying. Alice had woken up. Her head felt light, and for a moment she thought she was going to faint. Moore seized his chance, started to push her off. Her head cleared as he turned over, tried to crawl out from under her. She fell onto him, right arm wrapping around his throat, the other searching for a sleeper hold. He gagged, raised up to his hands and knees, but she stayed on his back hooking her feet into his legs. He launched himself sideways. She tucked her head against him, clung on like a limpet. He rolled, gasping and gagging, doing everything he could to throw her off. Her left arm snaked closer to that sleeper hold. They crashed into the hall table. The vase toppled, smashed onto the ground. Flowers and mortar went everywhere. She found the sleeper hold, started to tighten. Then she felt something slice into her left arm. She cried out, but only let go when Moore twisted the shard of broken vase. She fell back, clutching her arm, blood dripping through her fingers. Moore got to his feet, staggered slightly, 
his face bright red, bleeding and sweating, the shard in his hand. She tried to push at the air, but her focus was gone. Her head buzzed too loudly, every movement sending pain ricocheting against the inside of her skull. She backed off to the front door, and he closed in, teeth bloodied and gritted. If she had been wearing her black clothes, a shard of vase wouldn't have worried her too much, but she was wearing jeans and a T-shirt. Her black clothes were upstairs, in her room, with her necromancer ring. More came in, stabbing towards her gut. Valkyrie jerked her hips back as she tried to grab his wrist with both hands. She missed, had no choice but to commit, so she grabbed his arm where she could and launched herself at him, slamming her forehead into his face. She felt the shard slice across her hip. Her momentum took her forward as he stumbled, and she had a good grip of his arm now. She slid in, clasping his arm across her body tightly while her free hand sent palm shot after palm shot towards his face, trying to get his chin. Hit the chin. Shake the brain. That's what Skullduggery said. The vase shard dropped, and Moore lost his footing. Went down, dragging Valkyrie off balance. She tumbled over him, and he grabbed at her. But she kicked him away, got up, ran for the stairs. She took them three at a time, but he was after her, lunged, and caught her ankle. She fell against the stairs painfully. He was gripping her leg with one hand, the other reaching up, hooking into the waistband of her jeans, dragging her down towards him. She twisted, crunching his fingers between her back and the wooden step, and he roared and released. She scrambled up, got to the landing, burst into her room, flung open the wardrobe and grabbed the black clothes, searching the pockets for the ring. More collided with her from behind. He was roaring now, a constant roar of anger and murderous hatred. He threw her back. She fell onto her bed and he was on top of her. She crossed her arms over her head and his knuckles cracked against her elbows. He hissed in pain, grabbed her arms, tried to pull them away from her face. But she resisted, her muscles burning. She waited until he gave an almighty heave, and then she shoved him, adding to his own strength, and he fell backwards off the bed. She tried to spring past him, but he flailed, caught her leg. She hit the ground, and he was on her. The necromancer ring was on the floor of the wardrobe. She didn't need to focus to use it. She reached out, but it was too far. She could see herself in the mirror, see more on top of her. He caught her eye and grinned. She stopped reaching for the ring, and instead her fingers tapped the mirror. Her reflection, bloody and bruised, blinked and stood up. Moore froze. What the hell? The reflection's foot came out of the mirror and lashed into Moore's face. He went backwards. Valkyrie heard him crash into her desk. She turned over, and the reflection pulled her to her feet. This isn't right, Moore gasped, sucking in air through broken teeth. How did you do that? What the hell is that? The reflection left Valkyrie standing there and closed in. For a moment, Moore looked like he might shrink back, but fear mixed with his anger, and he snarled again. He threw a punch, and the reflection lunged. Its arms crossed in front of its face, taking the punch on its forearms. It grabbed Moore's head and started slamming in headbutts. Moore's legs gave out, and he slipped from the reflection's grasp, his face a mess, already unconscious as he hit the floor. The reflection looked back at Valkyrie. We should kill him, it said. Valkyrie frowned. Don't be ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. It's practical. I'll do it if you don't want to. You can call Skullduggery. We'll need to hide the body. Valkyrie fought to get her breath back. We're not killing him, okay? We're not killers. Or I'm not a killer. And that means you're not a killer either. The reflection looked at her. He's the one who broke in and attacked you. If your parents were here, he would have attacked them too. For all we know, he might even hurt Alice. We should kill him. No, all right? We're going to do this like normal people. I'm calling the guards. He'll identify you as the person who attacked him in his cell. And I'll say he's lying. And what will you say when he mentions me? I'll say I hit him so hard he was seeing double. 
Nobody's going to believe a word he says, especially when he starts talking about anything magical. If you call the guards, they'll arrest him, put him on trial, throw him in jail. And what are you going to do when he gets out again? He'll come back. You know he will. And you're not going to be here. No, Valkyrie said. But you are. And you're going to protect my family. The reflection looked down at Moore. If he comes back, it said, I'm going to kill him. Valkyrie kept her eyes on the reflection and didn't say anything. That sounded fair to her. Chapter 42 A New Mission Scapegrace threw open the doors to the pub and nobody came in. The people of Roarhaven wrinkled their noses at his disfigured appearance as they passed. Not one of them said hello. Not one of them stepped inside. He turned, went back into the cool interior, away from the glare of the sun and the glares of the people. Years ago, when he had first run the place, the bar had been split into two. There was a section for the regular people and a section for the special guests, the VIPs. Now there weren't any VIPs, but neither were the regular people. There was just Scapegrace, the owner and bartender, and Thrasher, the idiot who wiped the tables. Stop wiping the tables, Scapegrace said. There's no one here. You keep wiping the damn tables. You do a loop of the room, humming away to yourself, wiping the tables one after another. It's insane. You look like an insane person doing that. Sorry, Thrasher said, his head drooping. Go clean the toilets. But they're disgusting. So are you. Clean them. Thrasher's head dipped even lower, and he trudged away to do his duty. Sometime around mid-afternoon, two men walked in. They wore black, and Scapegrace had never seen them before. They certainly weren't Rohaven natives. One of them held the door open, and two more men walked in. The first was dressed in a black robe, and the second was dressed all in white. Scapegrace's eyes would have widened if they'd been able, but having half his face burned off severely limited his expressions of surprise. He stared at the white cleaver until the man in the black robe cleared his throat. You're a zombie, said the man. Scapegrace nodded. No point in denying it. Do you know what that means? The man continued. It means that you, like the white cleaver here, are a product of necromancer magic. As such, you are bound to necromancer will. I am? asked Scapegrace. It was news to him. And yet he did feel an odd urge to bow. Oh, you are, said the man. And that means you are bound to my will. I am High Priest Vandermeer Craven. I am your master. Thrasher popped his head out of the toilets. Are you my master too? High Priest Craven glanced at him distastefully, then looked back at Scapegrace. This is one you turned. Why is it still with you? I've tried getting rid of him, Scapegrace offered. But he keeps coming back. High Priest Craven sighed. No matter. I have a task for you, zombie. You will obey without question. Scapegrace nodded eagerly. He had only just met his master but already he could tell that the necromancer was a very important man. Thrasher hurried forward. Can I obey too? he begged. All I do here is clean the toilets. I long to serve. The master's lip curled. If you shut up and move away from me, yes, you can obey. Thrasher squealed with delight and ran back beside Scapegrace. I need you to steal something for me, the master said. It looks exactly like this. He showed them a gold disc, the size of his palm. There is undoubtedly one to be found in the offices of the elder mages. All I need is one. 
When you have located said disc, substitute it with this forgery. The master threw the disc to Scapegrace. He snatched it from the air and held it close to his heart. Do not, under any circumstances, arouse suspicion. It is to be a straight swap. Do you understand? Yes, master, Scapegrace said. Yes, master, Thrasher said, and started bowing like a pitiful fool he was. It was an utterly pathetic display. Scapegrace got to his knees, showing everyone what real bowing was. The master looked at them both, and then shifted his eyes to the man who had held the door open. These are the only zombies in town? We're absolutely sure there are no others? The man shook his head sadly. The master looked annoyed. Very well, he said. They'll have to do. Scapegrace was so happy he could have cried, had his tear ducts not long since dried up. Chapter 43 A and D Alice's eyes were wide open, watching the activity in the accident and emergency room with interest as Valkyrie rocked her with her free hand. Her other arm was flat on the table as a cute doctor stitched her up. You're sure you're okay? he asked again. I'm Grant, she said. The leaves she chewed while she waited for the cops to show up were still working to dull the pain. She winced every time the needle went through her skin, but that was more for show than anything else. He'd already stitched the cut on her hip, assuring her, as he did so, that there probably wouldn't be a scar. She shrugged. A scar on her hip was the least of her worries. She heard her mother's voice, looked over as a nurse led her parents into the A&E. There, the doctor said. Finished. I'll have a nurse bandage this up. I swear I wish all my patients were as calm as you. You know that? Thanks. I wish all my doctors were as hot as you. He laughed, then stood aside as Valkyrie's mom barged through, arms out to hug. She stopped abruptly, backed off, looked at the doctor. Is it okay to hug her? she asked. We actually encourage it, he said smiling, and walked off as the hug came on. My baby, her mum said. My poor baby. I'm fine, Valkyrie said, her voice muffled. Her eyes flickered to her dad, who was checking on Alice. He looked grim. She wasn't used to seeing him looking grim. Her mum started crying. Automatically Valkyrie stiffened, blinking back the tears that had sprung up without warning and now threatened to spill over. Mum, she said, laughing as she pulled away. Mum, I'm grand. Look, not a bother on me. Your face, her mother said. Cut some bruises, already fading. Your poor arm, stitched up and healing. Honestly, I'm fine. He beat himself up in his cell, her dad said. He was still looking at Alice. That's why they threw him out. They should have been outside. The moment they let that scumbag walk free, they should have parked a squad car outside the house. Dad, they didn't know he knew where we lived, and they certainly didn't know he'd want some kind of stupid revenge for getting thrown in jail in the first place. You can't blame them. They let him go. This isn't their fault. He looked at her for the first time. He could have... Des, don't, her mum said, her hand covering her mouth. Please, don't say it. Valkyrie made herself smile. Hey, the pair of you snap out of it. Alice slept through the whole thing and I'm fine. A nurse came over. Excuse me, I just have to bandage up your arm. Bandage away, Valkyrie said. The nurse smiled, started working. I heard what happened, she said. They're all talking about it. I thought you might like to know that the man who attacked you is being treated in a secure room, surrounded by three very angry-looking guards. You broke four of his ribs, his nose, his jaw, cracked three fingers, knocked out three teeth, and gave him concussion. He was seeing two of you. Do you know that? Valkyrie's mother blinked. Stephanie did all that? She saw did, said the nurse. 
she secured the bandage in place. I'll be right back with the paperwork. The nurse walked off. Valkyrie's parents stared at her. What? Valkyrie asked as innocently as she could. I've been taking self-defense lessons at the gym. Hard target, Krav Maga type stuff. Combatives, things like that. It's really not a big deal. But he was a grown man, her mother said. There's not really a lot of point to self-defense if you can't use it against just that type of person. Oh, Mum, your vase got broken. The one in the hall? Sorry. Her mum blinked. That's quite all right. It was an ugly vase and I never liked it anyway. See? Valkyrie beamed. It's worked out well for everybody. Are you sure you're not in shock? Honestly, I'm good. I'm just glad Dad wasn't there or he'd have thrown him through another window. Her mum smiled and hugged her husband. I have a family of fighters, she said. Alice, it looks like it's up to you and me to be the reasonable ones. Alice gurgled. Her parents drove her home. It was weird, sitting in the back seat of a car. She almost felt like a kid. Music was playing and she started singing softly to Alice. Alice smiled and Valkyrie laughed. They got home and spent the evening cleaning up the mess. There was a knock on the door and her dad went to answer it. He came back in, paused, then spoke. Fletcher's here, he said. I told him if he's here to argue with you, he should just walk away. But he said he's not. Maybe you should talk to him? Her mom nodded. He's a nice boy. He deserves it. Yeah, Valkyrie said. I know. She took a breath, then walked into the hall. Fletcher stood in the doorway. She stuffed her hands in her jeans. Hi, she said. He looked at her. Go for a walk? Sure. He turned, started walking down the path. She followed him out, closing the door behind her. They walked towards the park. Are you talking to me again? She asked. I suppose I am, he said. You look like you've been in the wars. You know me, always running into trouble. And coming out the other side. That's the important bit. He kicked a pebble and it skittered away. I don't forgive you, he said. I'd like to. I'd like it if we could just forget about it all, get back together, carry on like before. But that's not going to happen. I know, said Valkyrie quietly. But I don't want you to hate me, Fletch. That's a little out of your hands, though, isn't it? I suppose. It's kind of hard to stay angry at you. You probably don't feel you did anything wrong, do you? Of course I do. I cheated on you. But why? Because I was stupid, and I didn't think about it, and... No, Fletcher said. He looked at her. At the time, what was going through your head? Why did you do it? How is this going to help anything? It'll help prove my point, Valkyrie sighed. I thought, at the time, that you were being too... boyfriendy. Is that the technical term for it? You were being too protective. You were... Go on. They were in the park now, sticking to the well-lit areas. There was nobody else around. You were lecturing me. You were disapproving of the things I did. I thought it was all just too safe, you know? And you turned to Kaylin, who was anything but safe. I suppose. So when you cheated on me, you knew why you were doing it. You could justify it. To a degree. So in your head, it was all my fault. What? No, that's not what I meant. Val, you did what you did. You made those decisions. Because you're doing what you thought was the right thing for you at the time. I tried to be angry, but I just can't. You did what you thought was best for you. That's how you live. You never set about to be mean or cruel. These are just things that happen. Kind of like a side effect. Because I'm selfish. Yeah. Because you're selfish. Maybe you'll grow out of it in a few years. I don't know. I hope you do. That'd be nice, she murmured. I don't hate you, said Fletcher. I may not like you all that much right now, but I don't hate you. 
and I really don't think it'd be a good idea to be around you any more. I'm moving. Something yanked at Valkyrie's heart. Where to? Australia. I like it there. It's warm, and they talk funny. But what about your training? Australia's a cradle of magic, just like Ireland. There'll be plenty of boring old people over there who can offer me useless advice, same as here. What's wrong? I just... I don't want you to go. We weren't just boyfriend and girlfriend. We were friends, too. I don't... I don't have many friends. I don't want to lose another one. Well, you break a heart, and that's what happens. Yeah, she muttered. Besides, he said, I'm a teleporter. We're never really that far away, wherever we are. Take care, Valkyrie. She went to speak, but he vanished mid-step. She turned round, walked home. Chapter 44 Mission Accomplished For once, Scapegrace didn't mind the midday sun, or how harsh it was on his skin. He would gladly let the seasons rot him away if that was the master's wish although he sincerely hoped it wasn't. He climbed down from the penguin mobile to the dirt track and hurried over to where High Priest Craven and the White Cleaver were waiting. Secret meetings were exciting. Sire, Scapegrace said, dropping to one knee and holding the gold disc up to him with both hands. I have returned. Thrasher fell to both knees beside him, hands clasped in prayer. I see that, High Priest Craven said, snatching up the disc. You did as I instructed? Oh, yes, sire. Exactly as I instructed. I located ghastly bespoke's quarters, let myself in. Let ourselves in, Thrasher corrected. And then I located the disc. I substituted. We substituted, Thrasher corrected. The fake disc you had given me and returned here to you. Now, with the real disc. So now he has the fake disc and you have the real disc. I only live to serve. We only live to serve, Thrasher corrected. You don't live, the master said, examining his prize. And nobody saw you? Nobody, sire. I was like the wind. We were like the wind, said Thrasher. But... I was like the wind more. I was more breeze-like, Thrasher said, and bowed forward until his forehead was touching the ground. It was, once again, an unsurprisingly pathetic display, and one that Scapegrace would have no problem surpassing. He laid himself flat on the ground, face stuck into the dirt, and waved his arms in the air. Give me another order, master, I beg of you. Me too, Thrasher said, lying beside Scapegrace, doing his best to wriggle deeper into the dirt. Furious, Scapegrace started wriggling alongside him. If you were not already dead, the master said, pinching the bridge of his nose, I would gladly kill you both. Stop wriggling and listen very closely. I want you to gather more like you. More zombies? Thrasher asked, spitting out a small stone. I said, listen, not talk. I want twenty by this time tomorrow. If you fail me, I won't, said Scapegrace. I won't, said Thrasher. He might, said Scapegrace. Shut, the master said. Up! Scapegrace stayed where he was until the master and the white cleaver were gone, and then he got up. Thrasher stood beside him brushing the dirt from his clothes. You're pathetic, Scapegrace sneered. I know, Thrasher said meekly. But whenever the master is around, nothing else matters but him. It's like he said, zombies are made to serve necromancers. That, that doesn't mean I still don't value your leadership, sir. Yeah, well, Scapegrace said curling what was left of his upper lip. 
Just don't you forget it. Chapter 45 The Nicest Town in Ireland Geoffrey had been the key. It was a good trick, all right, getting people to believe whatever he told them. He hadn't reckoned on Kenny's journalism training being able to renew his interest in the story, but that wasn't Geoffrey's fault. It was a fluke, nothing more. Kenny had no trouble believing that Geoffrey's power would work on anyone, and that had got him thinking. He had spent the last few days digging out all the reports he'd found that had later been retracted. He read over them again with fresh eyes, with a new perspective. What if these reports hadn't been hoaxes or mistakes? What if they were genuine, and had only been retracted after someone like Geoffrey had convinced the poor, frightened people that they hadn't seen what they thought they'd seen? Kenny had laid all these reports out on his floor, and he'd spent hours going through them. One of them caught his eye, only a few lines long. A few years ago, a man in North County Dublin had called the cops after witnessing a dark-haired girl fleeing from a pack of white-skinned animals who ran on two legs. The girl, he didn't see her face, led them towards the pier. His statement was taken by the local cops. The next day he denied ever seeing such a thing. The day after that, the cops who had taken his statement denied ever doing so. It would have been completely forgotten about if Kenny hadn't been such a keen collector of oddness. It was a long shot, Kenny knew. There were plenty of dark-haired girls in Ireland. There was absolutely no reason to think that it was the same girl who Geoffrey had called Valkyrie Kane. But the name of the town in which this had happened was Haggard, which was only a kilometre or two from the town in which there had been all that insanity virus trouble at that nightclub. And so Kenny got the bus to Haggard. He stayed in a B&B &B and talked to the couple who owned it about any odd occurrences they might have heard about. Odd, they said. Sure, nothing odd ever happens in Haggard. By the end of his second day, he was believing that. Haggard was rapidly becoming the nicest town in Ireland, where nothing weird ever happened. The oddest thing, according to a small old man in a farmer's cap who didn't appear to have any teeth, was a car that had been showing up regularly for the last five years or so. Kenny didn't know much about cars, but he knew what a Bentley was when the old man mentioned it. A real beauty, too, apparently. A few times a week, usually at night, the Bentley could be seen driving through town. Nobody knew who owned it. Sometimes there'd be a passenger, a dark-haired girl. She always kept her head down. Kenny felt the flutter of excitement building inside him. It was them. He knew it was. It had to be. His attention caught by this mysterious Bentley, Kenny didn't pay much attention to the news that a local woman had been mugged on Main Street. Everyone was talking about it. Melissa Edgley had had her handbag snatched by a thug called Ian Moore. Melissa's husband had thrown Moore through a window and the cops had come and Moore had been escorted into a cell. No magic or superpowers involved. But then, the next day, they were all talking about Moore again. The guards had been forced to let him go, the nice people of Haggard said, and he'd gone straight to Melissa Edgley's house looking for revenge. Melissa's daughter Stephanie had been home with her newborn sister, and Stephanie had managed to overpower the thug and call the police. The poor girl, the good people of Haggard said. She must have been terrified. It must have been awful. Isn't it great how she overpowered him, though? Isn't that amazing? Wonder how she did it. And then the good people of Haggard would shrug. But then... She's always been an odd one, as that Stephanie. And Kenny's interest was piqued. Chapter 46 The Requiem Ball There was a box on the table when they walked into Skullduggery's house. It was done up with a ribbon tied into a bow. Valkyrie opened it, took out a beautiful black dress. Wow, she said. Normally... Gastly would have been happy to make you a dress, 
Skullduggery said. But all his spare time is invested in tracking down Tanith. So I thought I'd spoil you. This is... wow. I'm glad you like it. We leave for the ball in twenty minutes. She glared at him. I have to wash my hair. Then you had better hurry. She showered in the bathroom that had been specially installed for her. As she did her makeup, she checked herself for scars and bruises. Apart from the bandage on her forearm, there was nothing much to report. She would have liked to have gone to one of the sanctuary doctors instead of making do with stitches and a bandage, but mortal problems meant mortal solutions. A physical injury that could be photographed and documented would help the guards in their prosecution, whereas an injury that disappeared overnight would only help Valkyrie look better in her dress. Not that she needed any help as far as that was concerned. The dress was long and slinky, strapless, silk and chiffon. Her shoes were gorgeous. She stepped into the living room, and Skullduggery, wearing the sharpest tuxedo she had ever seen, complete with black gloves and a white scarf, tilted his head to her. You're late, he said. I'm beautiful. You're always beautiful. I'm always late, too. He put on his hat, black to match the tux, and they walked out of the house. He opened the car door and she slipped in. They left Dublin City, heading north, past the turn-off for Haggard and continued on to Gordon's house. There was no one guarding the gate. But even so, Skullduggery slowed to a stop. He took their passkey from his pocket, a gold disc no bigger than his palm, and pressed it between his thumb and forefinger. Once it started to glow, they drove on, and Valkyrie saw the symbols pulse on either side of the gate, nullifying the security measures. Gleaming cars were parked on both sides of the long driveway, and Valkyrie glimpsed figures standing in the darkness. Men and women, dressed similarly to cleavers but in black, with twin sickles and sheaths on their backs. They're rippers, Skullduggery said. Cleaver-trained private security. Only the richest can afford them. They got out of the Bentley. Skullduggery had a stern word of warning with the valet, and they walked into the house. Valkyrie imagined that this was what a high society party looked like. People in expensive clothes, sipping champagne and laughing politely. The only difference was that, here and there, there were examples of the extraordinary. An otherwise sombre gentleman with green hair. A woman in a shimmering dress with shimmering skin. A man with claws and, of course, the walking skeleton beside her. The richest and the most influential sorcerers in the world. Valkyrie could feel the power the moment she stepped in the door, and it made her insides tingle. A waiter with dirty fingernails offered her a glass of wine on a silver tray. She politely declined, and as the waiter disappeared in the crowd, she frowned after him. Dirty fingernails at a function like this? She shrugged, letting it go. In one of the rooms there was a small orchestra, whose music drifted throughout the house at a perfect pitch. No one had to raise their voice to be heard. Everything in here positively glowed. Valkyrie was glad the dress Skullduggery had bought her was so beautiful. It was a match for the others she saw. Skullduggery handed his hat and scarf to a woman who smiled and took them away. Valkyrie stayed by his side. They passed through to the next room, and Skullduggery did his best to tell her who everyone was. She recognized a lot of the names. Everyone, it seemed, knew Skullduggery, but not all of them liked him. For every smile they got, there was at least one scowl. As you can see, Skullduggery said quietly, I'm very, very popular. I can tell. Gordon stood by his echo stone, chatting to a group of people who laughed at whatever story he was telling. He saw Valkyrie and waved, his eyes sparkling, then returned to his story. She grinned. Ravel came over, shook Skullduggery's hand and kissed Valkyrie's cheek. You look stunning, he told her. She smiled back at him. Not so bad yourself, Grand Mage. He laughed 
then caught sight of a group of foreign sorcerers standing nearby, and sighed unhappily. I must go, he said. The curse of this job is that I have to mingle. Just when you meet someone interesting, you're called away by someone mundane. Ravel moved off, and ghastly arrived to take his place. Sorry I'm late, he said. I had trouble getting in. My disc wasn't working right, and I'd barely passed the gates before I was surrounded by rippers. Oh, Elder Bespoke, that's dreadful, Valkyrie teased. Didn't they know who you were? He looked at her. You're making fun of me, aren't you? Not Valkyrie, your lordship, Skullduggery protested. She wouldn't dream of it. I hate you, Ghastly muttered. I hate you both. Oh, we have a surprise guest. Skullduggery's head tilted. We do? Ghastly nodded ahead of them, and the crowd parted to reveal a man with short, blonde hair, his face lighting up when he saw them. He looked young and fit and healthy, no more than thirty years old, wearing his tuxedo with the bow tie undone and the top buttons of his shirt open. Skullduggery stepped forward to clasp this man's hand in his, as if they were old friends. It's been too long, Skullduggery said. It has at that, the newcomer replied. His eyes left Skullduggery and found Valkyrie. Hi, she said. I'm... Val! he exclaimed, and enveloped her in a hug. Any friend of Skullduggery's, providing she's pretty enough, is a friend of mine. He let go of her and stepped back. You are now my friend. Valkyrie, Skullduggery said. Allow me to introduce the one and only... Dexter Vex, obviously taking a short break from his life of adventuring and daring do. A very short break, Vex said, stepping back and flashing her a grin. Oh, she liked him. I've heard a lot about you, she said. You were one of the dead men. Indeed I was, Vex nodded. Cursed to follow this bumbling fool from misadventure to misadventure in the days of our youth. Is he treating you well? He doesn't boast too much, does he? Sometimes it's like that's all he ever does. He held her hand in both of his. I feel your pain, he said sadly. Skullduggery pulled their hands apart. Yes, well, quite enough of that. If you feel the need to gang up on me, at least have the decency to wait until my back has turned. When did you get into town? This morning, Vex said. Ghastly sent me an invitation a few weeks ago. And even though I was kind of busy, when someone like His Holy Eminence sends you an invite, you really can't say no. Oh, great, Ghastly said. Now you've got him at it. Valkyrie laughed, hooking her arm through his. We're only messing, she said. And by the way, you look amazing in that tuxedo. Ghastly smiled. I thank you, Valkyrie. Vex chuckled. See that? He hasn't changed a bit. No matter how bad a mood he pretends to be in, all it takes is a nice word from a pity girl and he's putty in her hands. Skullduggery! Remember that French girl we met in Saipan? What was her name? Oh, Skullduggery said. Francois. That's it, said Vex. Francois! Remember her, Ghastly? Remember that weekend we couldn't find you? We thought Mevolent had snatched you away and was torturing you within an inch of your life. Valkyrie, would you like to know what he was really doing that weekend? Yes, I would said Valkyrie. No, she wouldn't, said Ghastly. I think she would, Skullduggery said. If you tell her, said Ghastly, I will have the both of you arrested and possibly flogged. Vex sighed. Sorry, Val. What happens in wartime apparently stays in wartime. Oh, Valkyrie said, her shoulders drooping. A woman stopped beside Ghastly, whispered something into his ear, he nodded. If you'll excuse me, he said, I have people to talk to, important people, people of influence and stature, and hopefully people who won't laugh at me. He walked away and immediately Vex leaned in. Don't worry, he said. We have plenty of other stories to tell you, and I have plenty of stories to tell you about Skullduggery too. Good stories, scandalous stories, stories to use against him no matter what the situation. Suddenly this entire night seems like a bad idea, Skullduggery said. 
The conversation died as a man appeared beside them. Luxurious blonde hair swept back off his fleshy face. Wet lips curled in a smile. Behind him stood a boy of Valkyrie's age. My, my, the man said, his chins quivering with his words. If it isn't the skeleton detective himself, come down off his mountain to grace us lowly sorcerers with his presence. I am so honoured and awestruck that I fear I am at a loss. Should I bow, kneel, curtsy? Leave, Skullduggery suggested, and the man laughed uproariously. His small eyes turned to Valkyrie. And you, my dear, this vision in black must be Valkyrie Kane herself. She didn't like the way he looked at her. He was taking far too long. Skullduggery, my sincerest congratulations. You've picked a good one here. Pretty, too. I can see why you take her wherever you go. Not too smart, though. Am I right? Valkyrie glanced at Skullduggery. It's not just me, is it? He is begging for a box, isn't he? Indeed he is, Skullduggery said. I think so, too, nodded Vex. You can go ahead and hit him if you like, said Skullduggery. The man laughed, held up his hands. They were pale and soft like they'd never seen a day's work. I surrender, he mock cried. I yield. Please don't let the girl strike me. Valkyrie was going to hit him at a pure principle, but the boy in the tuxedo took hold of the fat man's arm and tugged it sharply. Father, he said, I think you've had too much wine. Perhaps you would like some air? There's plenty of air in here, the man said although it seems to be primarily hot air. He laughed at his own joke and disentangled himself. Miss Kane, this is my son, who has taken the grand and noble name of Hansard Cray, and I am his embarrassing father, the scurrilous and drunken Arthur Dagon. See how he blushes for me? Is that not the sign of a loyal and loving child? I'm very sorry, Hansard said. He was taller than his father and lean. The only trait they seemed to share was the colour of their hair. Don't apologise for me, Arthur snapped. And especially not to her. Skullduggery was right by Valkyrie's elbow, but remained quiet. She appreciated that. Any other man would have leaped in to defend her honour. Valkyrie was quite capable of doing that herself. Do you have a problem with me? she asked Arthur. A problem? he echoed. No, my word, no, not at all. I'm sure given time we could be the best of friends. Were it not for your unfortunate habit of murdering my gods. Oh, she said, understanding at last. You're a disciple of the Faceless Ones. Indeed I am, Arthur said, bowing before her. In the spirit of openness and togetherness that the new Council of Elders wants to project, I have been invited for the first time to the Requiem Ball, where all you people laugh and chortle and pat each other's backs for defeating the evil Mevolent and his evil followers, of which I was one. You didn't have to come, Valkyrie pointed out. And you don't tell me what to do, Arthur sneered. You'll get your comeuppance, you know. You'll pay for all the things you've done. It was a pleasure to meet you, Hansard Cray said, trying to pull his father away. I should put you over my knee, Arthur said loudly keeping his eyes on Valkyrie, and spank you here in front of everyone. A waiter appeared, tried to help Hansard's efforts, but Arthur shoved him back. He waved a fat finger at Valkyrie. You watch yourself, girl. You watch yourself. Your time is coming. Finally, 
Hansard managed to turn his father, and they plunged through the gathered crowd until it swallowed them up. A moment passed, and slowly the conversations picked up again. Valkyrie turned to Skullduggery. He was lovely, she beamed. Arthur Dagon's family was once royalty, Skullduggery told her, or something close to it. Nevelyn served under his grandfather for a time, before he came to power himself. Arthur hasn't handled their fall from grace with as much dignity as one might wish for. Hopefully his son fares better. There was a shout, and then a door burst open, and men in ski masks poured into the room, waving guns. Nobody move, one of them screamed, firing into the air. We're here for your jewellery and your wallets. Anyone tries being a hero, they be shot dead. Chapter 47 This Evening's Entertainment The gunshot stopped the music. Everybody stopped talking and just stared in absolute astonishment. Valkyrie couldn't quite believe it. The guest with the claws spoke up. You're... you're here to rob us? Yeah, the leader of the gang said. Then he faltered. What's up with your hands? One of his friends, a man in a red ski mask, was already panicking. He held his gun in a tight grip, and even from where she was standing, Valkyrie recognized the dirty fingernails of the waiter who had offered her champagne. I told you, Larry, this isn't right. Look at these people. They're not right. Someone in the crowd started laughing. Someone else joined in. Within moments, practically every one of the assembled guests was doubled over with laughter. Larry and his ski-masked friends did not appreciate the joke. Shut up! Larry screamed. Shut up! Valkyrie was barely able to keep track of what happened next. The air rippled, taking one of the ski-masked men off his feet. A ball of yellow light sped towards Larry and exploded. He was flung backwards. Streams of different colours crisscrossed around the other members of the gang, slamming into them and spinning them around. The man with the dirty fingernails was the last one standing. Ghastly stepped out of the crowd beside him and took his gun away. China Sorrows, dressed in an exquisite silk gown, tapped her arm. An ornate symbol glowed on her skin for a moment, and then she touched the man. He screamed and toppled over. Everyone cheered. The music started up again, and the guests got back to chatting. China approached. Valkyrie, she said. You look beautiful. I always knew there was a pretty girl underneath all those bruises. She saw Vex and raised an eyebrow. Dexter Vex is back in the country? All we need is Anton Shudder and Saracen Rue to show up and we'd have a dead men reunion right here. Hello, China, Vex said, leaning forward to kiss her cheek. Have you got over your love for me yet? I take each day as it comes, she replied, and he laughed. The orchestra started into a waltz. China held her hand out towards Skullduggery. They're playing our song. Skullduggery looked at Valkyrie. If you'll excuse me. She smiled. Go right ahead. Skullduggery took China's hand and led her to the only open space in the room. Valkyrie watched him look into China's eyes, and they began to dance, moving over and around the unconscious forms of the ski mask gang like they weren't even there. They danced like two people were meant to dance, with strength, grace, and passion. He sure can't dance, can't he? Vex said. Valkyrie took her eyes away from the dancing and smiled. He told me he could, and I was a fool to doubt him. She looked back. She could see China's lips move as they danced, and she wondered what they were talking about. I taught him everything he knows, of course, said Vex with a nod. Before he came to me, he had all the coordination of a turnip. I turned him into the dancer you see before you. Skullduggery dipped China, and then swung her up and she pressed against him. But do I get any thanks? Vex continued. Do I get even a nod of appreciation? No, I don't. 
It's quite fortunate that I don't need other people's approval to feel good about myself, but it would help. Ghastly appeared between them. Are you still complaining about that? I'm not complaining, Vex corrected. I am merely voicing my displeasure, he frowned. By the way, all joking aside, do I call you Ghastly or Elder Bespoke? You can call me whatever you want. Vex nodded. Thank you, Gladys. Where's Shudder tonight, anyway? Don't tell me that miserable sod's staying in that hotel while there's a party on. I'm afraid he is, Ghastly said. You know very well that Anton isn't one for small talk. The years were meant to mellow the man. Didn't you tell me that once? I was evidently wrong, Ghastly conceded. Vex suddenly smiled. Remember how Larrikin used to wind him up? We'd be sitting around, waiting in a ditch or something for the order to strike, all of us tense and humourless, the enemy a mere stone's throw away, and then Larrikin would whisper something to Shudder. You remember that? A grin formed on Ghastly's face. I remember Shudder's birthday. Vex laughed, and Valkyrie had to join in. It was so infectious. We were huddled down in a field in France. Ghastly told her, while Vex snorted at the memory. This was, I don't know, 1850 or so. We were all there, all seven dead men, Skullduggery, Larrikin, Dexter, Hopeless, Saracen, Shudder and me. We hadn't moved from that spot in three days. Apart from Skullduggery, we were all cold, wet and starving. Anyway, Larrikin decided on the third day that it was Shudder's birthday and there was nothing Shudder could do to convince him that it wasn't. The problem, Vex said, picking up the story, was that it was getting close to go time. There was a squad of Mevolent's men we'd been tracking for days and we had to take them out without raising the alarm. But now, suddenly, Larrikin was insisting on a birthday cake and a sing-song. The rest of us were focusing on not cracking up, but Shudder was taking it seriously and couldn't understand why Larrikin would want to do something so dangerous. We were sitting in a hole we dug, Ghastly said, with the wind howling and the rain falling, and Larrikin squirmed up beside Shudder and kept trying to hug him. And Shudder's not a hugger, Vex said. It developed into an extraordinarily quiet wrestling match, said Ghastly, grinning. They rolled over and over in the mud, Larrikin with this enormous smile on his face, and Shudder silently furious. Shudder got him in a chokehold, Vex said. Larrikin started digging around inside his clothes for something. He was going purple by this stage, though still smiling. And then he brought out a bun. Valkyrie laughed. A bun? A very crushed bun, Ghastly said. Crumbs now, mostly. Barely held together. He'd kept it hidden for days, and with his other hand, he stuck a candle in it. Only time I've ever seen Anton Shudder smile while on a dead man mission, Vex said, eyes sparkling with approval. That was a good day. That's why we won, Ghastly said, a little quieter. Valkyrie looked at him. That mission? Hmm? No, no. The mission was just a mission, the latest in a long line. No, the reason we won was friendships like that. They called us the dead men because they said we weren't afraid of dying. Nevelyn's lot? They wanted to bring the faceless ones back. But the main thing was that they wanted to be there when it happened. After all, what's the point of going to all that trouble if they weren't around to enjoy the results? So there were no sacrifices to save their friends. None of that. And that's one of the main reasons they lost. It got to the point where they couldn't trust each other, because it was all about personal survival. Whereas with us, we were fighting and dying for each other. Larrikin saved my life, Vex said. We were in Wales, and Serpine had sneaked right up behind me, about to use that red right hand of his. Larrikin pushed me away, shielded me, he died screaming. Vex shook his head sadly. Never forget those screams. You were there when Skullduggery killed Serpine, weren't you? Yes, Valkyrie answered. I would have liked to have seen that. 
Larrikin was a good man, Skullduggery said, and they turned as he led China off the dance floor towards them. As was hopeless, they died for what they believed in. Hopeless tried to kill me once, China said, almost wistfully. This was back when I was fighting for the other side, of course. We had some good, good times. Hopeless and larrikin, Ghastly said, raising his glass. Hopeless and larrikin, they echoed. Chapter 48 Going Underground Deep down in the caves below Gordon Edgley's house, the zombie horde moved in silence. Twenty recruits to Scapegrace's undead army, all with bite marks and blood spatters, all waiting for the order to charge into battle. Holding flashlights to penetrate the darkness, they looked slightly bewildered. But Scapegrace didn't mind that. In his experience, zombie hordes always looked bewildered. This was his second horde, so he reckoned himself to be something of an expert. Shards of moonlight somehow found their way through cracks and fissures in the cave ceiling to bathe parts of the tunnels in a hazy silver blue. Master Craven had been so kind as to provide him with a map. If this map were by anyone else's hand, Scapegrace would have dismissed it as crudely drawn. But the master's work was a deceptively childlike scrawl that implied more than it showed. As such, even though Scapegrace was having trouble working out where exactly they were going, he had a much deeper cultural understanding of where he had been. Thrasher hurried up, looking anxious. Master Scapegrace, he whispered, I think we have a problem. Scapegrace scowled and shone his flashlight straight into Thrasher's face. It's one of the zombies, Thrasher said, blinking quickly. Reggie, you remember him, don't you, sir? He has a little beard. I I think he's been eaten. Scapegrace froze. Eaten? Someone's eaten him. He turned to the horde. What did I tell you? What did I tell you about eating human flesh? The horde looked at him dumbly. Only I can do that and keep my thoughts intact. If any of you try it, you become a mindless, shambling zombie right out of a movie. How many times did I warn you, hey? Well, come on, own up. Who did it? Who ate Reggie? Uh, said Thrasher. It wasn't one of them, sir. What? What do you mean? Thrasher led him back down the tunnel. The horde followed. Reggie was walking behind us, Thrasher said. He was lagging a bit and I told him to hurry up and he ignored me. I kept walking and he was lagging even more and I heard something, something chattering and I looked around and... Chattering, eh? Very distinct chattering, Thrasher said, shaking his head at the memory. So I walked over, searched around a little, about to call his name, and then I came here. I believe this to be the scene of the crime. You don't say. Judging from the signs of disturbance, sir, I think he's been eaten. The signs of disturbance? Yes. And what would these signs of disturbance be, I wonder? Thrasher pointed with his flashlight. Well, I mean, the foot. In the middle of the tunnel, before them a single foot, still in its shoe, was sitting quietly. You worked that out all on your own, Scapegrace said. I'm very impressed. Thrasher didn't seem capable of appreciating sarcasm, so he smiled gratefully. Just doing my job, sir. Scapegrace hunkered down beside the upright foot, examined it more closely. It was severed just above the ankle, with what looked an awful lot like a big bite mark. Scapegrace couldn't tell for sure. That stupid skeleton was the detective, not him. Thrasher suddenly screamed, and Scapegrace leaped up and whirled in circles until he was sure there was nothing creeping up behind him. There! Thrasher gasped, pointing off into the darkness. 
Scapegrace looked into the gloom. There what? I saw it, Thrasher said. The thing that ate Reggie. I saw it. It was right there. Anxious muttering spread through the horde like a bad smell. Scapegrace needed to take control of the situation, and fast. What did it look like? he asked. For God's sake, calm the hell down and tell me what it looked like. Thrasher took a deep breath. Even though zombies didn't need to breathe. It looked like... It looked like a cross between a monster and an alien. Scapegrace stared at him. Yeah, okay, that is absolutely no help at all. Did it have arms? Oh, yes. Two arms? At least, Thrasher nodded. Maybe less. What about legs? It had a few of those. What was its body like? Thrasher concentrated. It was... It was either really hairy, with thick black hair all over it, or it didn't have any hair, and it was just the way the light fell. Its head, then? Did you get a good look at its head? What, like, would I be able to pick it out in the lineup? I'm just looking for basics here. Okay, well, let's see. It had... I'm not sure if it had any eyes, and I didn't see a nose as such, but it had a mouth, a very big mouth, with teeth, teeth as sharp as needles. But I may have imagined that bit. The teeth bit? No, I may have imagined the mouth. I'm not sure if it had a mouth. It probably did. Everything has a mouth, right? Unfortunately, Scapegrace muttered. It would need a mouth if it was going to eat Reggie. That only makes sense, doesn't it? Yes, it had a mouth. I'm sure of it now. One of the zombies held up his hand. What? said Scapegrace irritably. Hi, the zombie said. Uh, I'm Keith from the... You bit me? I can't remember every single person I bite, Scapegrace said, even though he could, because it really wasn't very many, all things considered. What do you want, Keith? Why is your hand up? I was just wondering, Keith said. If there really are monsters down here. There are a few, yes, Scapegrace said. No one knows how many or what they're called. All anyone knows is that they're pretty impervious to magic. So, so don't use magic. Not that you could, because you're mortal. Or you used to be. Anyway, magic attracts them. Um, said Keith. What now? When you, remember when you, bit me, and I woke up, and I was all, oh, what's happening? And your friend explained it. He's not my friend, said Scapegrace. I'm his second in command, explained Thrasher. Oh, okay, sorry, said Keith. Anyway, he told me I was a zombie now, and that magic was now sustaining me and everything, and that's all fine, but does that mean that now we will attract all the monsters because we have magic inside us? Or am I just talking complete nonsense? Scapegrace looked at him. Oh, hell. Right, Scapegrace said loudly. Everyone fall in and pay attention. Thrasher joined the horde, and Scapegrace looked at them like a general might survey his troops. We have been charged with a mission. We are deep in enemy territory. In order to achieve our objective, we must pass through hostile terrain. Keith! Is absolutely right. Our very presence here will attract the monsters. The horde gaped at him, suddenly terrified. Scapegrace pressed on. So we will move, like lightning, and we will arrive at our destination and we will engage the enemy. In years to come, they will speak of this battle and they will speak of the sacrifice we made here. They will speak of the brave army of the undead, the horde that turned back the tide, who fought with everything that is in them to make this world our world. I have seen the faces of our enemies. I have looked into the eyes of our foes. Do you know what I have seen? Scapegrace snarled, making them wait for the revelation. Faces and eyes, gentlemen. Faces and eyes. The horde frowned at him, and Scapegrace realised he had lost track of his speech. Panicked, he continued, We do what we must. We do what we can. We do what we will. We do what we... 
We don't do what we want. Uh, someone said. What will you give? Scraped Grey Sword. What will you give for one chance? Just one chance to say to your enemies, This far and no further. Who are our enemies again? Someone asked. Are you with me? Scape Grey screeched. Not really. Are you with me? I'm with you, Thrasher squeaked excitedly. Is anyone apart from Thrasher with me? Scape Grace hollered. He decided it was best not to wait for an answer. Then let's go. Let's fight. Let's show them what it means to die. Roaring, Scapegrace charged for the tunnel, Thrasher at his heels. After a moment, the horde started jogging after them. They ran through the darkness and the swaying light, and now some of the horde were joining in with the roars, and by the time they reached the end of the tunnel, they were a charging mass of fury and violence, waiting to be loosed upon their enemies. Their feet thundered on the rocky ground, fists pumped the air, their cries turning animalistic, inhuman, a wave of death about to crash down on whoever they found in their way. They came to a dead end, and there was some jostling. And Scapegrace led them back a bit, took the first turn they came to, and the roars started up again, and the thunder echoed in the caverns, and Scapegrace waved his hand in the air. Back! he said. Back! It must be the next turn! And they turned round again and charged back the way they had come. Chapter 49 The Preemptive Strike He crouched in the bushes with the others, all fourteen of them, black-robed and scared. Craven refused to allow his own fear to show through. Great leaders did not get scared after all. Plus, he had an advantage that none of the others did. He had the white cleaver to protect him should anything go wrong. This is highly dangerous, Cleric Solus whispered. We must leave now. If they find us... We are done discussing this, Craven snapped. I have made my decision, Solus. You will obey. You are not the high priest, Solus said. Do you wish to test me? Do you wish to test my resolve? You say we are surrounded by the enemy. I say we have the enemy right where we want them. And how do you plan to get us inside the house? Solus asked. Did you happen to have the zombies steal a disc that would make the Rippers abandon their posts? Of course not, Craven answered. I have something much more rudimentary planned. There was a gunshot from inside the house. They watched the Rippers run towards the sound. Once the path was clear, the white cleaver led the way from the bushes to the side door of the house. Craven darted back through the trees, found her waiting there, with her back to him. It's time, he said softly. She turned slowly and took down her hood, releasing her blonde hair, letting the moonlight fall across her scars. Melancholia allowed him to take her hand, and he guided her into the house behind the other necromancers. Once they were inside, and the music started up again in another part of the house, the white cleaver killed two rippers and four guests, and the only sound was the soft splatter of blood on walls. The bodies were hidden, and they continued on, Craven keeping Melancholia close to him as they moved. They found the cellar empty. Craven led them down the steps, three necromancers remaining behind, dressed in ill-fitting tuxedos. They were temple-born and got nervous easily. But all they had to do was stop anyone from entering. Even they couldn't mess that up. The cellar was filled with glorious darkness. The caves were beneath them and provided a last resort exit in the unlikely event of things going disastrously wrong. There was a secret door somewhere in here, he knew, but it was so well disguised it would take a less intelligent man weeks to find. But Craven had all the angles covered. He took a stone from his robes, gave it to Adriana Shade. Walk with this held close to the ground, he instructed her. When it glows blue, tell me. Yes, your eminence, she said, 
and did as she was told. Amid the junk that had been collected in the cellar, there was an old table that Melancholia sat on. She closed her eyes and breathed, preparing herself for what was to come. Craven considered it best to leave her alone. He turned to find Solus looking at him. Your eminence, Solus said, mocking. Is that how we address you now? You're a cleric, Vandermeer, the same as me. Be careful, cleric Solus, Craven said. The last man to question me like you do was Solomon Wreath, who then tried to assassinate me. If you continue to act like him, I might start to fear for my life, and then the white cleaver would be forced into action. At the mention of the cleaver, Solus's face went slack. To cover his fear, he nodded to Shade. And what do you have her doing, walking around with a stone? Below us, Craven said patiently, the zombies are standing at the secret door, having made their way through the caves. Once the stone comes into close proximity with its twin, in the possession of the zombies, it will glow. In the case of an emergency, therefore, we know where to blast through in order to make our escape. It's still reckless, Solus said, but speaking without gusto. If they find us here, all our plans will be for naught. No matter where the Deathbringer is when she initiates the passage, the sanctuary forces will converge on her. They may even stop her before the passage is complete. We can't risk that. All my plans have been born out of necessity. We needed someone to tip them off as to her whereabouts, so Melancholia told Wreath he was in danger. We needed to make them think Melancholia was dead, so I killed her reflection before any seasoned sorcerer could get a good look at her. We need to take out our enemies before the passage begins, so we come to them and allow the Deathbringer to use her wonderful new talents to snatch their lives away. No fighting, no violence, no chance of defeat. I have thought of everything, Cleric Solus. All you need to do is trust me. So I ask, do you trust me? The White Cleaver stepped beside Craven, and Solus swallowed thickly. I trust you, he said. You trust me? Solus cleared his throat. I trust you, your eminence. Craven smiled. I thought you might. Chapter 50 China's Ally China hated mingling, but it was a necessary evil to which she had grown both accustomed and excessively proficient in. Even without her ability to make people fall in love with her, she could charm a room as easily as shrugging. A little light laugh, a touch on the arm, a lingering look, the right words at the right time. They could all get her what she wanted, providing she had an agenda she wished to fulfill. And tonight she had such an agenda. The drawback of being notorious, as China could well attest, was the ripple effect. When she had been at the peak of her notoriety, she could walk into any room and every head would turn and every conversation would grow quiet. Hushed whispers would spread outwards from the epicenter, ensuring that everyone would know where she was and who she was talking with. Even as little as ten years ago, China would have had that effect on this room. But thanks to a growing and somewhat puzzling aura of respectability that had surrounded her lately, this year the most notorious honour went to Eliza Scorn. China drifted from conversation to dance to anecdote, always with Eliza in sight, keeping note of who she spoke to and, just as importantly, who she ignored. Gallo had promised to furnish China with the list of benefactors, but he was running late. China? A deep voice rumbled behind her. Frightening Jones was a large man with ebony skin who fitted into his tuxedo exceedingly well. Always a pleasure, he said, bowing slightly. Frightening, China replied. How good to see you again. 
The last time I saw you, you were trying to kill me. I doubt I would have posed much of a threat to one such as you, China, even with a remnant inside me. You flatterer, China said, maneuvering slightly so that she kept Eliza in view. But you're quite right. I almost killed you, in fact. It was only your ex-girlfriend who stopped me. He raised an eyebrow. Tanith? How is she? Have you heard anything? Nothing at all, China said, doing her best to sound as if she was sad about that. She's on the run with that dreadful Texan. You should talk to Ghastly about it. He'd know much more than I. Ah, Frightening said, looking uncomfortable. Maybe later. Elder Bespoke is a busy man. China smiled, amused. And you're sure it has nothing to do with you being in love with the same woman? In love? Perhaps, but at different times. And that's the important part. My love for Tanith has faded somewhat since we parted. So I now only have a deep, deep affection for her. Ghastly, however, is neck deep in love. I will never understand the taste of certain otherwise intelligent men. You don't approve of Tanith, I take it? I never have. She's always been too brash for my liking. Some people like brash, and they're welcome to it. Of course, Frightening said with a smile. Some people like other things as well. China laughed. I admire your audacity, Frightening. It is completely wasted on me, but I admire it nonetheless. A pale, fleshy hand clamped onto Frightening's shoulder. Not an easy task, as the owner of that hand had to reach up to do it. Frightening! boomed Quinton Strom, lurching slightly into him. Aren't you going to introduce me to your beautiful friend? Frightening sighed. Elder Strom, you already know China sorrows. I know I do, the British elder grinned. But it never hurts to make a second first impression. Hello, Miss Sorrows. You are looking ravishing tonight. He was, quite clearly, drunk. Elder Strom, China said, nodding quietly. How have you been? I have heard no scandal about you at all in the past few years. Because I've been behaving myself, Strom laughed. It hasn't been easy, but I've been keeping out of trouble. Unlike yourself, my dear, for someone who is apparently neutral, you find yourself fighting by the skeleton detective's side an awful lot. Is there something I should know? Should every man in this room be jealous? Frightening sighed, smiled at China and backed away, leaving her to cope with Strom alone. There's no need for friends to ever be jealous, she told him. He clasped her hand in his. And what of those who could be more than friends? My darling Quentin, China said, you will always be very special to me, a very special friend, with a very special wife. Where is she, by the way? Strom shrugged. Somewhere over there. We have an understanding. But that must be wonderful for you both, China said, realizing she'd lost sight of scorn. Her phone rang and she disentangled herself from Strom's hand. Excuse me for just a moment. It's me, Gallo said when she answered. I have the list. Twelve people, most of whom should be with you right now. China smiled tightly at Strom and walked away from him, speaking quietly. Where are you? Parked in the woods to the northeast of the house. I can't get any nearer without setting off the alarms. Stay there. China ordered. I'll be with you in a few minutes. She paused to check around her, making sure Scorn wasn't anywhere about. Then she slipped by the rippers at the door and walked quickly between the rows of cars, sticking to the shadows as much as possible. Her shoes, magnificently elegant though they were, had not been designed for walking across gravel and were totally unsuited to walking across grass or, indeed, through woodland. But China had grace and poise, and where a lesser woman would already have toppled, China remained upright. The real trick, of course, was to make it look effortless, 
even when there was no one around to appreciate it. She cracked twigs and speared leaves with virtually every step, and there were certain kinds of branches that only wanted to snag her dress as she passed. She stepped from the tree line into a clearing. Gallo's car sat quiet and dark, and China was already scowling as she approached. She banged her fist on the passenger side window. She doubted it would give Gallo a scare, but she had to at least make the effort after walking all this way. She opened the door and stooped to get in, froze when she realized Gallo wasn't moving. She took a breath, bent lower. Gallo's chin was resting on his chest. The upper half of his head was sitting on his lap. There was a note on the dashboard, illuminated by a strip of moonlight. Too late, sweetie. China stayed where she was. If anyone was sneaking up behind her, they weren't making a sound. If anyone was watching from the trees, they weren't making a move. She straightened up, slowly. If this was a trap, then she was already at a disadvantage, and she wasn't going to make things worse by losing her composure. Her heart was beating so fast and so loud she swore it was audible. Resisting the urge to spin round, she smoothed down her dress and turned. No one jumped out at her. Back through the trees, back the way she'd come, she could see the lights of the house. A house filled with sorcerers who didn't exactly trust her, perhaps, but it was still a refuge. Skullduggery and Valkyrie were there, and Ghastly, and Ravel. She would be safe there. At least she'd be able to see who was going to attack. But if the roles had been reversed, and it had been China who had planned this trap, then she would be lying in wait somewhere along that trail. Lure the prey in, scare the prey, and attack when the prey tries to run to safety. An ambush as simple as it was effective. Her options were clear. Take the quickest route out of the woods and probably run right into the attack, or turn and go the other way, deeper into the woods. Neither option appealed to her. But as much as she despised the idea of walking for an hour in these shoes to get away from an attacker who may not even be there, she despised the idea of having her head cut off even more. So she quelled her pride, turned, and stalked away through the trees. Chapter 51 Flirting Disastrously People were dancing and chatting, talking business and politics and history, drinking wine and champagne and toasting fallen comrades. The house had been transformed from the quiet, safe place that Valkyrie came to when she needed respite to a glamorous ballroom of extravagance. As much as she appreciated the change, there was a part of her that couldn't wait for the people to clear out and normality to return. She waited until Gordon's latest audience had moved away, and then she approached him before anyone else had a chance. Enjoying yourself? she asked. Immensely, Gordon said, beaming when he saw her. I'd never met most of these people when I was alive, but I'd heard about them. I'd heard all the stories, all the legends. Some of these people quite literally saved the world. Pretty impressive. He arched an eyebrow at her. Don't be sarcastic. I'm not, she laughed. For someone like you, who actually has saved the world, such a feat might lose some of its romance. But for me, a dead writer who just wrote about these things, it is still quite remarkable. And humbling? Well, maybe not humbling. I'd like to see any of these people write a best-selling novel. Then I'd be impressed. Are you getting any ideas for more books? My head is filled with ideas. If I weren't hosting this shindig, I'd be composing words right this second. I swear, I haven't talked to this many fascinating people since I made a surprise appearance at my fan club meeting. Do you think they're enjoying it? Is there enough wine? There's plenty of wine, and those little canopies are lovely. Canapes, my dear. They're a bit small, though. They are meant to be small. They'd be more satisfying if they were bigger. I think you're slightly missing the point of canapes. But all in all, yeah, everyone seems to be enjoying themselves. I thought I'd find you here, Skullduggery said, walking over. 
I assume your detective instincts kicked in, and you were going to ask your uncle about those men with the guns. Of course, Valkyrie nodded. Gordon, the morons in the masks, how did they get in? Ah, Gordon said, his face clouding. Now that I do not know. As you can imagine, there aren't many catering companies who specialize in events like this. But I was assured every person working tonight was discreet and had experience. I've had someone trying to get through to the planner, but no luck so far. Valkyrie shrugged at Skullduggery. I have been unable to find a clue. You're a wonderful detective, he sighed. Are you ready for round two? There are still plenty of people who want to meet you. There's more, she whined. But my face is tired from smiling. I never said you had to smile. I never smile. You're a skeleton. You're always smiling. Not inside. Inside, it's a scowl. I think there are also one or two young men who would like to ask you to dance. And now that you're not with Fletcher anymore... She narrowed her eyes. What young men? You were talking to both of them a few minutes ago. Hidalgo Bolt and Geraint Mizzle? Really? Hidalgo? He's kind of cute, I suppose. And when you say young men, what ages are they? Hidalgo is, I don't know, he might be in his fifties. She stepped back. Oh, gross. Skullduggery's head tilted. Charming. Geraint's younger, if that's any use to you. He's in his twenties. That's the lanky guy with the frizzy hair? He didn't exactly come across as overly confident, did he? Or coordinated. How did he get an invitation? He didn't. His mother brought him. She wants me to help set you up with him. Valkyrie glared. Don't you dare! I happen to think that you'd get on very well with Geraint. I doubt he'd speak much, which would suit you down to the ground, because then you can just talk without fear of interruption. Oh, I'm not denying that on paper he sounds like my perfect man, but there is no way in hell that's going to happen. Tell his mummy no. She'll be heartbroken. I don't care. She had such high hopes for you two. Stop joking about this, I swear to God. Gordon, what do you think? You think we should at least dance with Geraint? What harm could it do? Gordon asked. Great harm, Valkyrie said. Huge harm. Let's face it, if he dances with me when I'm wearing this dress and looking like this, he's going to fall in love with me. Gordon laughed and clapped his hands. Yes, he is, my dear. I don't mean to be cocky, she said. But it's inevitable, right? Skullduggery nodded. Can't argue with you there. And the fact is, I don't need another guy telling me how great I am. I know how great I am. I'm me. And, to be honest, I'm finding it fairly weird that you're suggesting this so casually when the guy is like ten years older than me. Aren't you supposed to be advising me against older men? This is very true, Gordon said. And you're absolutely right. This Geraint is far too old. You're to stay away from that boy. Valkyrie frowned. And now suddenly he seems so much hotter. Typical teenage girl, Skullduggery said, wanting what she can't have. So now you're saying I can't have him. My God, Geraint Mizzle is the hottest guy I've ever known. Skullduggery swept his hands towards the crowds. Then go to him. Dance and fall in love. Ah, she said, shrugging. Maybe later. Hansard Cray came over, nodding to all of them. Valkyrie found herself standing a little straighter. Pardon the interruption, he said. Not at all, Gordon replied, grinning. Having a good night, are we? Do you like the music? It's certainly music made to be danced to, isn't it? Valkyrie glared at Gordon but he ignored her. It is, Hansard said, and the night has been wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting us. I was wondering, though, if any of you had seen my father. Gordon looked more disappointed than Valkyrie actually felt. Oh, he said. No, I'm sorry I haven't. He's had too much to drink, 
Hansard said, blushing slightly. I'm afraid he might be wandering the house, insulting anyone he meets. He looked at Valkyrie. I do apologize for the things he said. Please know that if you had hit him, I would have understood. She smiled. That's good to know. I could help you look for him, if you want. You would? He said, relieved. Oh, thank you very much. If you could search those rooms over there, I'll search these rooms over here, and between us we should find him. He smiled again and hurried off. Valkyrie frowned. I never thought I'd see the day, Skullduggery said. A boy who can resist the charms of Valkyrie Kane. Shut up, she growled, walking off. He followed. He's seventeen, you know, he said. From what I can gather, a thoroughly nice lad. I don't care. I don't know much about him, not really. His family keeps to themselves. That's nice. They walked from room to room. From what little I do know, however, he does like girls, if that's what you're worried about. I'm not worried about it. Why should I be worried about it? I don't even care. I don't even know the guy. Why are you so intent on setting me up with someone all of a sudden? Haven't I made enough of a mess of this kind of thing already? You have, Skullduggery conceded. But everyone needs a hobby. They move towards raised voices, sliding through the gathered onlookers to see Arthur Dagen pinned to the ground by a small man with glasses. Cased, Skullduggery said. Let him up. The small man shook his head. Every time I let him up, he flings himself at someone else. I'll kill you, Arthur warbled, his face smushed into the floor. I'll kill you all. I'll take responsibility for him, Skullduggery said. Let him up, if you would. Case sighed and stood away. Arthur struggled to his hands and knees. Before you stand, Skullduggery said, know this. If you attack anyone, I'll call in the Rippers. They'll lock you up for the night, and they won't be gentle about it. When you stand, we will escort you to your car, and then your son can drive you home. If you agree to this, stand. If you don't, you may as well lie back down. Arthur glared, then stood. Very well, he said. Well, I can walk to my car without your assistance. He swayed dangerously and Skullduggery took his arm before he fell. Unhand me! Don't be stupid, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie walked on Arthur's other side as they moved to the front of the house, but didn't help. She didn't think he'd appreciate it. The Requiem Ball, Arthur said, spitting out the words. Just another excuse to meet up and be smug and superior. If we had won... We wouldn't hold a gloating party. If you had won, said Skullduggery, we'd all be dead, yourself included. You don't know what you're talking about. You're a heathen. I was closer to the faceless ones than you could ever hope to be, Arthur. I was trapped with them for almost a year. And do you know what I learned in that year? That your gods are just as petty and spiteful and small as anyone I've ever met. Your bones will burn for your insolence, Arthur said, outraged. He tugged his arm free, would have toppled were it not for Valkyrie. He recoiled from her touch and sneered. And you, the god-killer, how do you think you'd fare against the faceless ones without the scepter of the ancients, eh? Do you think it would be quite so easy to murder them now that your weapon has been destroyed? No she said, frowning at him. Obviously not. The dark gods shall rise again, Arthur promised loudly, and vomited. Both Valkyrie and Skullduggery pulled away instantly. Ah! Oh! Arthur said, looking down at himself. You're disgusting, Valerie told him. I don't feel well, Arthur said, and burped. Skullduggery's hand closed around Arthur's upper arm, and he shepherded him out into the night air. You found him, Hansard said, running up behind. The valley brought the car around, and Skullduggery and Hansard managed to bundle Arthur in. We will have our revenge, 
Arthur vowed from the back seat. Not tonight, she won't, Skullduggery said, slamming the door. Hansard stood and shook his head. I knew it would be a mistake coming here, he said. But my father said it was important. He said we had to attend. It's probably an honor thing or something. Although he doesn't look very honorable right now. Valkyrie peered at Arthur through the window and winced. I think he threw up again. Typical, Hansard said. Well, thank you both for your help. He shook Skullduggery's hand, then Valkyrie's. I hope to see you again. I'd like that, Valkyrie smiled. Until next time, Hansard said. When hopefully you won't have my father's vomit in your hair. Valkyrie's eyes widened and she dropped her head forward, so a strand of hair with something dripping off it and shrieked. Skullduggery quickly passed her a handkerchief. She wrapped it around the strand and scrubbed. Then she flung the handkerchief to the ground and flicked her hair away from her face. When she looked up, Hansard was already driving away. She glared at Skullduggery. You could have told me. I was waiting for a good time. There is never a good time to tell a girl she's sick in her hair. And that is what I learned tonight, he said, nodding. Valkyrie looked at the departing taillights. Whenever he thinks of me, she moaned, this is what he'll think of. He won't think of me totally owning this dress. He'll think of me with sick in my hair. What does it matter to you? Skullduggery asked. You don't care, do you? You don't even know him. Don't use my words against me, she grumbled. I hate when you do that. Chapter 52 All Fall Down Melancholia opened her eyes. I'm ready, she said. Craven took a moment to appear serene and nodded. Kill them without pain, he said gently. They are not our enemies, not really. They are merely ignorant. Kill them, take their lives, grow ever stronger. Then the passage can begin. She lowered her head. Craven made sure that when he stepped behind another necromancer, he did so very discreetly. If the others thought that he was even the slightest bit wary of Melancholia's new ability, they could lose faith in his leadership. I can feel them above us, Melancholia murmured. Almost three hundred lives. So, so bright. Craven managed to get to the far side of the cellar and stayed by the steps. If he saw any necromancer in this room fall, he was ready to bolt. There are others outside, Melancholia continued, but I'm leaving them for now. Focus on taking the lives of the people in the house, Craven called over, and try not to kill our own people upstairs. He said that with a smile, but his insides were fluttering. Melancholia took a deep breath. Ghastly saw someone in the crowd and frowned. He moved to her, took hold of her arm, turned her so he could see her face. What are you doing here? Mingling, Eliza Scorn replied, smiling. I'm not allowed to mingle. I wasn't aware you were on the guest list. I'm owed favors, she said, and I have friends. I have so many friends. I even have friends that you think are your friends. Are you having a good night? You should leave. But the party is just getting... She stopped talking, frowned and swayed, and Ghastly's vision dimmed. All around him people were dropping. Scorn fell, and Ghastly's strength left him. The ground came up to meet him, and then everything went dark. Melancholia sighed. She kept her eyes closed and didn't say anything. She didn't have to. Craven and everyone else in the room could feel the death seeping down towards them. Magnificent, somebody breathed, and Craven had to agree. To experience the sudden death of that many people in the same instant was a rare treat, but one that would soon be dwarfed into insignificance by the death of half of the world's population. Now, Craven said, we are ready for the passage. Broad smiles broke out, and laughter. 
Hands were shaken and backs were slapped. A joyous occasion indeed. The culmination of everything they had worked for their entire lives. Craven barged through them back to melancholia. It was important to be seen close to her at a time like this. Such things are remembered, after all. Who was standing next to whom? Who gave the orders? Who took the credit? Before he got to her, he heard running footsteps. Then one of the necromancers he had posted outside the door appeared at the top of the stairs. Rippers! he cried. They're coming! Hold them off! Craven shouted, chopping an invisible line across the basement with his hand, then sweeping it forward. Go! Hold them off! The necromancers on the losing side of the invisible line stared at him, wide-eyed. I command it! he roared. They looked at each other, and then one of them moved, and then another, and then they were rushing up the stairs to their deaths. Once they were out, he slammed the door after them, catching a glimpse of his brethren, their shadows hesitant and wavering, stumbling towards the sickle-waving rippers. He locked the doors to their screams and half stumbled down the steps. Six necromancers remained down there, plus the white cleaver and Craven himself, all looking towards Melancholia, who sat with her head down, the hood covering her face, making it impossible for Craven to judge her mood. If any kind of a pattern had emerged, her mental instability would have grown along with her power, and he didn't want to be on the receiving end the next time she lashed out. He motioned to the necromancer nearest to him. Solace he said. Make sure the Deathbringer is able to stand. Sola stared at him. Me? Do not make me repeat my instructions, Craven said tartly, making sure he stood beside the white cleaver. Solus hesitated, then took a step, and another, until he stood before Melancholia. Um, he said. Deathbringer? Are you, uh... Are you okay? Do you need anything? Melancholia didn't look up. Outside the door, there were more screams and howls of pain. Only, Solus continued, we don't have an awful lot of time, and, and we really need you to initiate the passage at your earliest convenience. Are you telling me what to do? came Melancholia's soft voice from beneath the hood. Craven watched Solus go pale. No, he whispered. I'd never presume to. His words failed him, and he stood there, and a tear actually rolled down his cheek. Melancholia's shoulders rose and fell in a weary sigh. Oh, Solus, she said. Please don't kill me, Solus said. Melancholia stood up slowly. But your death will add to my strength. Please, I want to stay alive. You're a necromancer. They're meant to embrace death. I... I don't embrace it. I'm scared of it. I know you are. I know you all are. Which tells me that none of you truly understands. She took her hood down and when she opened her eyes to look at the gathered necromancers, they were glowing red. You're hypocrites, all of you. You talk of the stream of life and death. You talk of the beauty of it. But the true beauty is to become part of it, to flow from this existence into the next. Yet the passage is meant to block the stream. Why? Craven forced himself to step forward and inject some authority into his voice. Melancholia, he said, hoping no one noticed how high-pitched he sounded. These are philosophical discussions best left to the scholars in the classrooms. You have fulfilled your potential at such a young age that you have not yet had the opportunity to see these arguments resolved. Therefore, you must trust in our judgment and wisdom that this course of action is best for everyone. Melancholia smiled at him. And yet, Clary Craven, I do not trust your judgment or your wisdom. The strength flowed from Craven's legs, but by some miracle he remained upright. 
The passage is an idea concocted by the small-minded, Melancholia continued. The great irony is that the sorcerers who fear death the most are the sorcerers who claim to understand it the fullest. The necromancer order is an order of hypocrisy and fear and ignorance. You have no right to speak of death the way you do because you so obviously cling to stale ideas of immortality. Truly, I feel sad for you. Craven felt the eyes of every necromancer on him, but he couldn't speak. His mouth was dry and his tongue was far too thick to form words. Which leaves me with a problem, Melancholia said. I have all this power, but nothing to do with it. You must initiate the passage, Solus said. A shadow snaked up behind him and skewered him through the neck. He fell gurgling blood. Melancholia didn't even look around. The passage will destroy the stream, she said, and I have no wish to banish death. All I want to do is share it with as many people as I can. Craven frowned. What? Once you experience it, you will understand. This is not something you can learn about in old books. It's not something you can comprehend through philosophical debate. You need to become part of the stream. All of you. Craven backed away. Us? You. Everyone for miles around. Maybe even the whole country. And when this country is dead, I'll move to the next. I'll bring death to everyone. Then you will see how beautiful it really is. Craven was so scared that he was actually relieved when the door burst open and the rippers stormed in. Three necromancers panicked so much they found themselves charging towards the sickle-wielding maniacs. Swift swishes of those long blades cut them down mid-step, with only one of them having the time to make a sound. Craven grabbed the white cleaver, pushed him towards them. Save me! he screeched. Protect me! The white cleaver needed no further instruction. He dived into the midst, his scythe flashing. Craven stumbled back with Adriana Shade, doing his best to keep her in front of him. Melancholia strode across the floor to them, smiling. Shall we depart? she asked, her hands on their arms, and the shadows swirled around them, and then they were in darkness and gloom, away from the sounds of fighting. They were down below, in the caves, Shade tore herself from Melancholia's touch, turned and ran. Melancholia laughed and sent a shadow to slice through her back. Shade collapsed and Melancholia smiled at Craven. You're not going to run from me, are you? No, Craven managed to say. I need somewhere quiet if I want to kill a country, and I need someone to look out for me while I do it. I'd... I'd be honored. But we need to keep moving. There are creatures down here who feed on magic, and if the rippers find us... I wouldn't worry about the rippers or the monsters, she laughed. If I were you, I'd worry about Skaldaguri Pleasant. Craven stared at her. Isn't he dead? Oh, he's dead. But it's the same dead as always. He and Valkyrie weren't in the crowd when I took all those lives. I'd say they're looking for us as we speak. Come. She turned, led the way through the tunnel. She was going to kill him. There was no way round it. Melancholia was going to kill him, and she wasn't trying to hide it. Craven knew what his options were. He could run, but he doubted he'd get very far. Or he could fight. But that option scared him even more than running. He knew what Solomon Wreath would do in his place. He would bide his time, wait until melancholy was distracted, and then he'd attack. It would be short, sharp, and brutal. She'd be dead before she knew what had happened. That's what Wreath would do, and he wouldn't hesitate either. He'd have the assurance he was always so good at wielding. Craven didn't have that level of assurance, though. He was afraid he'd panic, misjudge the attack, or miss the moment. And then what would happen? 
she turned to him, laugh at his pathetic attempt, and with a casual flick of the wrist, she'd tear him apart. His eyes came to rest on the back of Melancholia's head as she walked. If Wreath was with him, it would have been over by now. Melancholia would be lying dead on the ground, and they'd go back to looking for a deathbringer they could control. But Craven was alone, and it was up to him to save himself. He raised his hands, feeling the power in his amulet ready to burst forth. His tongue slid over his dry lips, the ground level off, and Melancholia walked in a straight line, like she was inviting him to do it. What if she was inviting him? And what if he missed? Head pounding in his chest, Craven lowered his trembling hands. He couldn't risk it. He couldn't risk making the attempt and failing. He couldn't risk angering her. For all he knew, maybe she decided that she needed him around to look out for her. Maybe she wasn't going to kill him after all. Melancholia looked at him over her shoulder, and he saw the smile on her lips and in her eyes, which were still glowing with that deep, deep red. Chapter 53 The Deathbringer Rises They had come when they'd heard Gordon shouting for help. Skullduggery had leaped over fallen bodies, Valkyrie right behind him. They burst into the ballroom. All around them, the guests lay on the floor, silent and unmoving. The ring was so cold on Valkyrie's finger that it almost burned. They're dead, she whispered. They just fell, Gordon said, from the far side of the room. His eyes were wide, his voice hollow. They were standing and talking and laughing, and then they, they stiffened and breathed out and fell. Valkyrie frowned. Melancholia? She's not dead, Skullduggery murmured, and then his head tilted to the people around them. Which means neither are they. What? She sucked their lives from them, drank those lives in, used them to make her stronger. If we can get to her before she wastes that strength, we can force her to return those lives to their owners. That'll work? Skullduggery raised his hands, fingers flexing. In theory... Valkyrie's breath became a cloud in the air. What are you doing? Cooling things down, Skullduggery said. Their life forces won't do them a whole lot of good if we allow their brains to die. You have a change of clothes, I expect? She hugged herself as the temperature plummeted. Particles of frost began to glisten on the faces around her. In the Bentley. He threw her the keys. You might want to hurry. She nodded, backed off, turned and ran. There was a commotion. Rippers had run in from outside, congregating at the door to the basement. Valkyrie ran past, out of the house, kicking off her shoes and unlocking the Bentley with a beep. The boot opened and she grabbed her trousers from her bag, pulled them on under her dress, buckled them, pulled on her socks and boots. She searched for the zip in her dress, cursing, yanking the whole thing round her body till she found it. She whipped the dress off, stuffed it into the trunk, couldn't find her T-shirt, so she just grabbed her jacket, put it on as she ran back to the house. It was freezing in there, so cold it actually made her hesitate. She zipped up her jacket as Skullduggery walked from the room beside her, and he joined her as she ran for the basement. They passed three bloodied bodies, and Skullduggery went first down the steps. Dead necromancers and rippers covered the floor like a carpet. The white cleaver stood half-crouched, his back to the wall, his scythe swinging. The remaining rippers had him surrounded. A girl, Skullduggery said, ignoring the cleaver situation as he started turning over bodies. Blonde, scars on her face. Is she here? The rippers didn't answer. She's not here, Valkyrie said, running her eyes over the upturned faces. Neither is Craven. If she shadow-walked, she could be anywhere up to two kilometers in any direction. Skullduggery picked a stone up off the floor. He was quiet for a moment. They're in the caves, he said, dropping it. They had someone down there already, searching for the other side of the entrance. If they shadow walked anywhere, they'd have shadow walked down there. He went to the wall, removed the brick, and twisted the key behind it. A section of the floor rumbled and opened. 
Valkyrie followed him to the stone steps, looked back at the rippers. Any of you coming? she asked, but they didn't move. They're not cleavers, Skullduggery said, already halfway down the steps. They're mercenaries. They were paid to provide security, not chase after people. Their job is everything above ground, which means the white cleaver. The rippers paid her no attention. They started to close in on the white cleaver, and Valkyrie left them to it. She hurried down the steps as the floor closed above. They didn't do a very good job at providing security, she pointed out to the back of Skullduggery's head. Everyone's dead. True enough, he said. They emerged into the caves. A necromancer woman lay dead before them, proof, if any was needed, that they were on the right track. They summoned flames into their hands and ran. Valkyrie had been down here before, and each time she'd been lucky to escape with her life. The tunnels twisted into each other, opened out into vast, empty spaces, and closed down into the narrowest of gaps. Travellers needed to respect the caves as much as any adversary. A wrong turn could lead to a step off a precipice and a long fall into cold darkness. And that was before the creatures down here were taken into account. Skullduggery slowed, and she did the same. They extinguished their flames, letting their way be lit by the shafts of silver light that worked their way down from the surface. We're waiting, called a voice, echoing playfully towards them. Skullduggery grunted, and they stood up straight and walked forward. They emerged from the tunnel to stand atop a gentle slope, that led ten feet down to the cavern floor. On the other side of the cavern stood Melancholia and Vandermeer Craven. Now this is funny, Melancholia continued. Her eyes were red. We were hurrying along, Vandermeer and I, and a thought struck me. Why am I doing this? Why am I running? I can understand why Vandermeer runs. He's a weakling who's afraid of practically everything you'd care to mention. But me? Who do I have to run from? So I stopped running and turned, and look who appears. Melancholia, Skullduggery said. We don't want to hurt you. Melancholia laughed. Her laugh echoed. You actually believe you can stop me? The two of you? I killed three hundred of the world's most powerful sorcerers in the blink of an uncaring eye. What makes you think, even for a moment, that I won't snuff out your weak, flickering flames just as quick? Because, Skullduggery said, to do that, you'd need a moment or two of concentration, and we don't plan on giving you that. Melancholia laughed again. You seem to know a lot about my powers, Skeleton. Well, I should. I was the Deathbringer before you were even born. I'm not sure I get the joke. No joke, Skullduggery said. I was Lord Vile. Valkyrie could see Craven's frown from where she stood. What are you talking about? We saw you and Vile in the same room. That wasn't Vile, Valkyrie told them. That was Vile's armor. I'm the real thing, Skullduggery said. So I know exactly what I'm talking about, Melancholia. Because my powers were just like yours. Except I came by mine, naturally. You're lying. You can reach out with your mind, can't you? You can sense the life around you, and you can reach for it. It's like a bubble that keeps expanding, and then, when you release... The bubble withdraws and drags all that life back to you, leaving the bodies to fall behind. It's a death bubble, Valkyrie said. Don't call it that, said Skullduggery. She frowned at him. Well, what do you call it? Skullduggery hesitated. See, Valkyrie said. Death bubble. Shut up, Melancholia said. She narrowed her red eyes at Skullduggery. You were vile? But you're an elemental. As it turned out, I was what some people call magically ambidextrous. It's rare. It's exceedingly rare, in fact. And I didn't even know it myself until after it happened. 
but during the war, I got lost. I was consumed by the endless battles and bloodshed, the terrible things I saw and terrible things I did. I waded in blood, and I emerged as something different, someone different. I put on the armor and found I had a real flair for necromancy. I shouldn't have been surprised, I suppose. I had always been good with death. Pretty soon they were proclaiming me to be the Deathbringer, and yet they wouldn't tell me what the passage actually entailed, other than that it would save the world. They were talking about immortality, but I had no interest in saving the world. I had no interest in helping weak men and women live forever. I wanted sudden and violent death for everyone. That's why I joined Mevolent. Finally, I thought, someone who shares my appetite for destruction. I didn't believe that the Faceless Ones were real. And even if they were, I certainly didn't believe he'd be able to bring them back. But a part of me hoped that he would. Because then I'd be able to kill an entire race of gods, after I was finished with the people. You, Melancholia said, are a dark, dark man. Aren't I just? So why didn't you kill us all? Craven asked. I simply came to my senses. Do you know, do you have any idea how many people I killed when I called myself Lord Vile? I don't, but it was a lot. I killed whole battlefields, all that violent death, so tinged with fear and panic. It made me so, so strong. I could have cracked this world wide open, but I didn't. One day, I just stopped. I walked deep inside a mountain, took off the armor, and I've been trying to make up for it ever since. I never will, of course. Such redemption is well beyond me at this stage. But I try, and stopping people like you, Melancholia, is how I try. So you do think you can stop me? I don't want to fight you. I want you to give the people above us back their lives. I'm the Deathbringer, not the Life-Giver. You're neither, actually. You're not even close to being as strong as I was. But you can still release the energy you stole from them. Melancholia smirked. And they'll just return to life as if nothing happened? Their energy will seek them out, yes. You're sure of this? Relatively sure. And why would I ever want to release this energy? Because if you don't, we will fight you and we will kill you, and then the energy will return to them anyway. Melancholia shrugged. Then let's fight and see what happens. You can still do the right thing. Do you want to attack first, or will I? Skullduggery held up a finger. Do you mind if I confer with my colleague for a moment? By all means. Skullduggery leaned in towards Valkyrie. Damn, he whispered. She's not going to do the right thing. Did you really think she would? I was really hoping. Can we beat her? Valkyrie asked. I don't like our chances. What are our chances? We don't have any, Skullduggery admitted. Do you think you can take Craven on your own? No. Me neither. Do you want to leave him to me, then, and you can take her? I like that idea even less. I don't blame you. She sighed. We're going to get killed, aren't we? It looks likely. Our only hope is a surprise attack. They're looking right at us. Damn it. Skullduggery straightened up. We have discussed the situation, he said to them and decided that it would be in everyone's best interests for me to fight you, Melancholia, and for both Cleric Craven and Valkyrie to stand back and cheer or boo as they see fit. Valkyrie grabbed his arm. What are you doing? We can't win this, he said softly, and I would rather not watch you getting killed alongside me. Well, I'm not going to watch you getting killed either. And yet I'm the one who said it first so there's precious little you can do about it. Who made up that rule? 
I did, just now. We accept your proposal, Melancholia called across to them. But after I kill you, I reserve the right to kill her. By which time I shall be past caring, Skullduggery said. He slipped off his jacket. His gun hung heavy in the shoulder holster, but he didn't reach for it. He folded the jacket, pressed it into Valkyrie's arms. Keep this as something to remember me by. I'm not going to just stand by and do nothing, she said through gritted teeth. You can, as I said, cheer my name if you want. You must have some kind of plan, even a really bad one. Plans are like buses, he said. Sometimes they just don't turn up when you need one. He started down towards the cavern floor. I've enjoyed our time together, Valkyrie, he said over his shoulder. You are quite a remarkable girl. There were a hundred things she needed to say to him, needed to tell him, needed him to know. There were a thousand words she needed to speak, needed to whisper, needed him to hear. But she stayed quiet and watched him descend. She'd tell him afterwards, when all this was done, when they'd saved the day and were joking about it on the drive home. That's when she'd tell him. They had time. No matter how scared she was for him right now, they always had time. He reached the cavern floor, and Melancholia floated down on a gentle wave of shadows. They faced each other. I'm going to enjoy this, she said. I dare say I'm not. Skullduggery responded. He strode towards her and she smiled, and her eyes glowed brighter, and he stiffened. His gloved hands fell from his wrists, and the bones of his arms slipped through his shirt sleeves to clatter to the rock floor. His knees buckled, his legs parting from his shoes as his body collapsed onto itself. His ribcage bulged against his shirt, and his head hit the ground and rolled the jawbones spinning away. Valkyrie breathed out, the air emptying from her lungs. She was still and quiet and cold. She was calm. Melancholia had taken Skullduggery's soul. Without his soul, there was no magic to keep his body together. Now it was just a skeleton, just a heap of old bones. He was gone. He was gone and Melancholia had taken him from her. Melancholia smiled. That was easy, she said. Valkyrie breathed in. Breathed in all her pain and anger and fury. She breathed in all those things she wanted to tell him, but now never could. All those words she wanted to say, but now never would. She breathed in her strength and her horror and her loss. Let it fill her let it fill every inch of her, and then she screamed, threw Skullduggery's jacket to one side, and jumped, using the air to propel her down towards Melancholia like a bullet. Melancholia laughed and flicked her hand, and the shadows rose to slam Valkyrie into the cavern ceiling. They vanished, and she fell, trying to use the air to cushion her landing, but another shadow wrapped itself around her waist and yanked her sideways. A second flick of Melancholia's wrist, and Valkyrie was hurled into the wall. The impact forced the breath out of her, and she dropped and lay there, gasping. A shadow tightened around her ankle, and she groaned as she was lifted off the ground. She dangled, swaying, trying to breathe, upside down and at eye level with Melancholia. Such an anticlimax, Melancholia said. Isn't it? Can't you feel it? With all the animosity between us, all those jibes, all that history, and here, right at the end, we have our final showdown, and you, you are found wanting, as they say. Melancholia leaned in. Good night, Valkyrie. It's been irrelevant. The shadows rose around them, turned sharp, and Valkyrie snarled, grabbed Melancholia's hair, and slammed her forehead into that smirking face. White light exploded behind her eyes. The shadows vanished, and Valkyrie fell as Melancholia stumbled back, howling in pain. Valkyrie blinked, struggling to get her bearings. She managed to get to her feet, but she was so dazed she fell to one knee again. 
Melancholia cursed and staggered around, blood pumping from her nose. She stumbled right in front of Valkyrie, and Valkyrie lunged, smashed into her, taking her to the ground. She dropped elbows and palm shots, barely able to focus, only knowing that she couldn't let up, not even to catch her breath. Craven, Melancholia cried. Get her off me! And still Valkyrie hit her, trying to get through the arms that Melancholia held up to protect her head. Not one thought was given to Craven. Craven wasn't important. The only important thing was to smash Melancholia into unconsciousness. Craven! Melancholia screamed. A fist of shadows collided with Valkyrie, shunting her off, sending her sprawling. Melancholia clambered to her feet as Craven hurried over. Are you okay? he asked. Is there anything I can... Melancholia reached out, and a tendril of darkness coiled around Craven's neck and tightened. You are going to leave me, she snarled, spitting blood. You are going to let them kill me. No, Craven gasped. You wanted her to kill me, so that you wouldn't have to try and do it yourself, didn't you? Craven dropped to his knees, his face red, his eyes bulging. Melancholia stood over him. But you're too much of a coward even for that, aren't you? You couldn't take the risk that she wouldn't be able to finish me. You were terrified of what I'd do to you. Craven was unable to speak. The only thing he could do was nod. The tendril released him, and he fell forward, sucking in air. You'd do well to remember that fear, Melancholia said, as she turned back to Valkyrie. Blood covered her face. Her lips were split, and her nose appeared to be broken. Valkyrie got up slowly, fists clenched. She suddenly flicked her hand, grabbing shadows of her own, but Melancholia brushed them aside. Darkness curled around Valkyrie's arm and yanked the ring from her finger. It dropped to the ground and bounced, and Melancholia slammed her heel down onto it. The ring shattered, blackness flowing back into Valkyrie. And that, Melancholia said, is the main flaw with necromancy. Destroy the object, and you have all that magic, but nothing to focus it with. Look at me! Do you see any reliance on an object for me? No, I am beyond all that. My body is all I need to focus my power. Congratulations, Valkyrie said. But you're still going to die. And how do you think that's going to happen? Are you going to try hitting me like a barbarian? That won't happen again, little girl. I underestimated your savagery and you spoiled my good mood. Valkyrie smiled. You think I've spoiled your good mood? Then you're really going to hate him. Melancholia frowned and turned, and saw Lord Vile striding towards her. Chapter 54 Monster Murderer Vile fired off sharpened shadows, and Melancholia stumbled back eyes wide in terror. Help me, she screamed. Craven stood with his mouth open, his feet stuck to the floor. Melancholia fell to her knees while Vile pummeled her. Craven, help me, or I'll kill you! Craven raised his hands, and Valkyrie pushed at the air, flinging him back. He went rolling across the floor, and she ran in, aiming a kick at his head. He saw her coming at the last moment, covered up, taking the boot along his arms. He howled in pain and lashed out, a shard of darkness sliding uselessly across her jacket. Flame flared in her hand, and she flicked it onto him. He shrieked as his robes caught fire. He tore the robes off and hurled them away, turning to face her wearing faded thermal long johns, his amulet bouncing on his chest. I never liked you, he sneered. And now, finally, I get to... She flicked her hand, and his amulet flew from around his neck. He cried out and reached up for it as she stepped in and rammed her elbow into his chin. His head rocked back, and he was unconscious even as he was falling. Valkyrie let the amulet fall and looked back as Vile stumbled. The shadows coiled and lashed around Melancholia's feet. She wiped the blood from her face. 
I'm not scared of you, Melancholia said. You're only his armor, after all. You're not the real Lord Vile. I kill the real Lord Vile. Vile sprang, but a wave caught him, sent him spinning into the wall. That little victory boosted her confidence. I'm curious as to how you're still functioning without the skeleton, though, Melancholia said. I thought he was controlling you with his mind or something. No, that's not it. You're a little more independent than that. Vile flung his shadows at her, but she batted them down. Oh, well, she continued, actually starting to smile now. I suppose we'll never know. You will remain a mystery. Shadows detached themselves from the cavern ceiling and fell like javelins. Vile didn't even see them coming. The first missed, but the second one caught him in his shoulder and kept going through his armor, impaling him to the floor. The third caught the calf of his leg. He stood there, trying to move away, trying to free himself, but the shadows were solid. Instead of gloating, as Valkyrie fully expected her to do, Melancholia doubled over, like she was trying to catch her breath. The shadows flexed suddenly, and she grimaced. Valkyrie narrowed her eyes. You feeling okay, Mel? You don't look too good. Do you want to lie down? Stop, Melancholia hissed. Talking! Darkness sprang from Melancholia, and Valkyrie flinched. But it retracted before it hit her. Retracted so violently that Melancholia stumbled. It's all a bit much, isn't it? Valkyrie said. All those powerful sorcerers you killed, their energy speeding around inside you. I bet you can feel Skullduggery, can't you? I bet you can feel him whirling around in there. He's gone, Melancholia said. They're all gone. I think you're lying. You can feel him, can't you? Buzzing in your ear. He wants to be let out. Darkness rammed into Valkyrie and she went backwards, barely avoiding the slashes that followed. And then the shadows snapped back to Melancholia. The Deathbringer's hands went to her head. Let him out! Valkyrie said. You don't know what you're talking about. Sure I do. You have his energy inside you. It's hurting you. So let it out. Despite her obvious pain, Melancholia laughed. What do you expect will happen if I do that? You expect the skeleton to sit up? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Melancholia straightened, her jaw clenching. She swayed for a moment. And what, she said tightly, is to stop that energy from just... Floating away? I haven't a clue, Valkyrie told her. This is Skullduggery's idea, not mine. Once you release the energy, it all flows back to its source. He should know, right? He was Deathbringer before you, after all. She shook her head. You're not getting him back. Sure I am. You're not, Melancholia screeched, and the shadows went wild, thrashing so hard they cracked the rocks around them. Valkyrie smiled. He's about to break free. Don't be stupid. You lose control one more time and he's gone. Don't be. Skullduggery, she called. Be right with you. Melancholia charged forward and Valkyrie stepped back, allowing her eyes to widen, allowing fear to show. She stumbled over Skullduggery's leg, falling to the ground, and Melancholia swept her arms wide, gathering shadows. And then the shadows swooped down and Valkyrie used the air to shoot sideways. The shadows hit Skullduggery's ribcage, and Melancholia shrieked, ripped them away, and fell back. The darkness contorted around her as she staggered, and Skullduggery's body sat up. Valkyrie ran over, grabbed his skull and his jawbone, tried to fix them back together. How do I do this? How does it work? The skull didn't answer. Here, you do it. She held it out then realized his arms weren't attached. Cursing, she dropped to her knees, found his right humerus bone through his shirt, and lifted it until it clicked into his shoulder. Working quickly, she attached the rest of his arm, then carefully added his gloved hand to the wrist. Two fingers and his thumb suddenly flexed. The other two fingers hung crooked. She picked up his skull, and he guided her hands to the top of his spine. It cracked as it attached. Oh, Skullduggery moaned. How on earth did you do that? I just got her thinking about you, Valkyrie said. 
helping him attach his other arm. Put the idea in her head that you were waiting to pop out. I figured she's that unstable, all she has to do is think something will happen, and it'll happen. Then I got her to touch you. Easy, really. You are magnificent, he said. Yeah, she grinned. I know. I'm astonished that worked. Yeah, she grinned. I know. Do you need help with your legs? He suddenly shoved her to one side and rolled to the other as a great blade of darkness sliced through the space between them. She saw Craven, his face a frozen mask of desperation, about to send another blade towards them. Skullduggery propped himself up into a sitting position, his gun in his hand. His forefinger was bent backwards, so he pulled the trigger with his middle finger. The shot rang out, and Craven flipped backwards, a bullet between the eyes. Skullduggery swivelled, emptied his gun at Melancholia, but the shadows looked like they were obeying her again. They caught the bullets, and she stood there, twenty paces away, seething with anger. You tricked me! That's what the smart do to the stupid, Valkyrie said, getting up while Skullduggery dropped the gun and worked at reattaching his legs. So now what are you going to do? Team up? I'm going to kill you from here the moment you do something to annoy me. Well then, Valkyrie smirked, I guess we won't do anything to annoy you, you moron. Melancholia immediately raised her arms. Wait, Skullduggery said from the ground. Now just wait a moment, Melancholia. Valkyrie is very sorry that she annoyed you. No, I'm not. Skullduggery got up, swaying a little. Valkyrie, please, let me handle this. Melancholia, I know you're very confused right now. I'm not confused at all, Melancholia answered. He clicked his bent fingers back into place, hissing slightly with each one. Are you sure? Not even the slightest bit? You still want to kill everyone? More than ever. And I want to thank you, by the way, for the opportunity to kill you in front of Valkyrie for a second time. That's just delicious. I'm afraid that's not going to happen, Skullduggery said, and waved a hand. His tuxedo jacket floated over to him. He put it on and straightened his bow tie. If I get lost, he said to Valkyrie, you need to find a way to stop me. She frowned at him but he was already looking back at Melancholia. You think you can beat me? Melancholia said with a laugh. I killed you with a thought, you ridiculous thing. I killed you. I defeated Lord Vile. What else do you have to throw at me? That wasn't Lord Vile. It certainly looks like him, Melancholia said, glancing behind her to the spot where Vile had been impaled. Her smile faded. He wasn't there anymore. Skullduggery fixed his cuffs. As I said, that wasn't Lord Vile. He raised his head. This is Lord Vile. Darkness leaked from Skullduggery's shirt. It wrapped around his body like a bandage, growing thicker, forming armor, covering him from head to foot. Valkyrie stepped back found herself retreating as fast as she could. And then Skullduggery was gone, and in his place stood Lord Vile. Melancholia didn't move for a few seconds. Then she shook her head, as if to wake herself up. You don't scare me, she said, before whipping up the shadows and lashing them at Vile. A wall arose in front of him, absorbed the shadows and then melted away. Melancholia snarled. The shadows behind her grew and writhed, then swooped in through her back and burst from her chest. The stream of darkness slammed into Vile, drove him backwards a single step. Melancholia started to curse him as more shadows poured through her. At Vile's nod, a sliver of darkness severed the stream, and Vile absorbed the rest of it into his armor. He swept his arm wide firing a salvo of black arrows, three of which got through Melancholia's shield as she stumbled away. Stop! she shouted, like a child who didn't like how the game was being played. Vile shadow-walked the space between them, appearing behind her. Instinctively, the darkness around her swelled, keeping him at bay. 
and Melancholia tried to use this as her chance to escape. But Vile sent his shadows after her. One shard nicked the back of her leg and she cried out, and the next slashed across her forearm. Blood sprayed and she shrieked, clutched her arm to her and fell to the ground. She curled up, moaning and sobbing and howling in pain while the shadows around her went nuts. Vile strolled up, stood over her. So absorbed was she in her own distress that she didn't even notice him. Valkyrie ran forward. Skullduggery, don't do it. Vile ignored her, reached down to take hold of Melancholia's head. A shadow rippled across her skin, exploding in a dark burst above her that sent Vile flying. Melancholia started crawling away, and Valkyrie grabbed her, hauled her to her feet. I'll kill you. Melancholia snarled. I'm helping you, you moron. Run! Chapter 55 Tunnel Vision They got to the tunnel, and Valkyrie dragged Melancholia after her. Hurry! Shut up! Melancholia snapped, shoving Valkyrie away. I don't need your help. I killed him once. I can do it again. She turned back the way they had come and took a deep breath. He's up, she said. On his feet. I can feel him. I can feel his energy. It's not like the others, but it's strong. I... There's something... There's something blocking me. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to take his soul. Valkyrie punched her, right across the jaw. I'm not going to let you kill him, you nutcase. You think I'd ever choose you over him? Doesn't matter, Melancholia said, her voice quiet. I can't do it. He's cocooned himself away. I can't... I can't kill him. Good. Melancholia glared up at her. If I can't kill him, how are we going to stop him? We're not, Valkyrie said. We're going to run and hide. That's what we're going to do. What the hell is wrong with you, anyway? I'm covered in blood, and you're still going to ask me that? No, I mean... What did he do to you? That isn't just a cut he gave you. These symbols, Melancholia said reluctantly, they're designed to take the power of my surge and loop it around my body continuously. I know, Valkyrie said. Craven turned you into a self-charging battery. So what? Grimacing, Melancholia held her wounded arm up. The gash cut diagonally across her flesh, splitting symbols. Vials damaged me. The power isn't looping like it should. I'm not recharging like I should. It's going wrong. Valkyrie knelt beside her. Release the energy you stole. Get us out of here. Release the energy, then I'll help you. He's after us, Melancholia snapped. If he catches us, I'll need all the strength I can find. And you want me to just release half of it? Yes. That doesn't make sense. Release it now, at once, immediately, or I walk away and leave you here. You wouldn't do that. It's you or my friends, and I'm always going to pick my friends. Help me up before he comes. We can argue about this later. Valkyrie stood back. Leave her here, said the voice in her head. Vile will kill her. The energy will return on its own. Leave her. She's not worth it. Valkyrie gave Melancholia another few moments. Then she turned and started to walk away. You can't be serious, Melancholia said. You're really going to abandon me? Keep walking. You're really going to let him murder me? Don't look back. Fine, Melancholia shouted. Fine, I'll release it. Valkyrie turned and waited. Melancholia glared at her, then shut her eyes. Her breathing became strained, and she winced. Something like steam rose from her, drifting up and disappearing into the tunnel wall. She opened her eyes. They were no longer red. She was sweating. There, she said, panting. Happy? That was it? Valkyrie asked dubiously. That was the energy of three hundred people? A little bit of steam? What were you expecting? Sparkling lights, a ray of sunshine. It is what it is. Now help me up. 
Valkyrie took out her phone, dialed Ghastly's number. Even though her phone was magically enhanced, she barely had a single bar down here in the caves. Even so, it was enough for the call to go through, and enough for her to hear Ghastly's tired voice like he had just woken from a deep sleep. Ghastly, she said. Can you hear me? Can you? She lost the signal and put the phone away. Satisfied? Melancholia asked. Very. I hope you're this smug when Vile catches up with us and I can't do a thing to stop him. Me too. They moved on, struggling to maintain a decent pace. More and more of Melancholia's weight pressed down onto Valkyrie, and with every step her injured leg took, the necromancer's face would screw up in pain. She wasn't going to last long in here. That much was obvious. The ground dipped ahead of them, and Valkyrie stopped, looked back, looked around. What are you waiting for? Melancholia said. Come on, keep going! Valkyrie ignored her, looked up, saw a ledge. There, she said. Climb! What? Why? We'd be faster going downhill. We can't go deeper. We have to stay as close to the surface as we can. She tried pulling Melancholia to the ledge, but Melancholia yanked her arm from Valkyrie's grip. I'm injured, you silly little girl! I can't go around climbing everything for no reason at all. I say we vote on it. We're not voting. You're going to do what I tell you. And why would I do that? Because I've been down here before. If we go deeper, we're going to get lost. If we do manage to avoid vile, we'll either die of thirst or get killed by one of the things that live here. Either way, we end up dead. I'd rather take my chances with rats and creepy crawlies than with Lord Vile. There are monsters down here, Melancholia, and they're immune to magic. Rubbish, Melancholia said. Nothing is immune to magic. Well, they are, and they're a lot bigger than rats, believe me. Melancholia looked up at the ledge and scowled. Give me a leg up. Valkyrie interlaced her fingers and crouched. Melancholia steadied herself on her wounded leg, placed one foot in Valkyrie's hands, and straightened up as Valkyrie heaved. Melancholia grunted and cursed, but eventually hauled herself over. Valkyrie used the air to give herself a little boost, and she joined Melancholia. There, she said, nodding to a gap in the rocks ahead of them. She led the way, and Melancholia followed. Why? Melancholia asked as they moved. Why what? You know what? Why didn't you let him kill me? Why are you doing all this for me? Valkyrie frowned back at her. I don't... I don't really know. I'm sick of people dying, I suppose. Even your enemies? Melancholia said. Her eyebrow rose. That's ridiculous. The only point in having enemies is so you can defeat them, kill them, brush them aside. Or give them a chance to redeem themselves. Melancholia smiled. You honestly think I'm going to change my ways? I want to kill you. I want to kill everyone. I finally understand what death is. I understand its beauty, but I'm not stupid. I know very few people will share this view. You want to stop me from spreading the beauty of death? You think I'm the villain, don't you? Valkyrie shrugged as she walked. One of them. And I think you're the villain for trying to stop me. I have nothing to redeem myself for, because I've done nothing wrong. You're something of a sociopath, then. No. I've just moved beyond what living people think of as important. Living is not important. It's just not. Neither is dying, for that matter. But the two of them together, this wonderful stream of existence. Wait till you see it. You'll wonder why you ever tried to stop me. Valkyrie stopped and turned. See, you're talking, and in theory your words are linking up and making sense. But I still haven't a clue what you're on about. And even if you do have a deeper understanding of life and death than the rest of us, which I doubt, there's still no reason to start killing millions of people. I'm going to kill them because I can kill them, that's all. Lives are meaningless. I don't think you believe that. Melancholia laughed. Oh, really? Valkyrie resumed walking. I think, okay, for a moment, you glimpsed a great truth about life and death. Maybe your power surged in such a way that it pushed you a little further, opened your mind a little wider. Okay, I can accept that. 
But that's not how you feel now. How would you know what I feel now? Because you are running from Lord Vile, just like I am. She heard Melancholia's smile fade from her voice. I don't fear death, she said. I just don't want the inconvenience of it right now. You can look at it like this if it helps. For a few moments, your power drove you insane, made you a sociopath with glowing red eyes who wanted to kill millions of people. But you got better. I wasn't insane. You were a little. I think I'd feel okay about killing you. Don't worry, Valkyrie said, looking back. That'll pass. My eyes were really glowing red. Yep. Melancholia nodded to herself. Cool. They walked on for another ten minutes, until Melancholia's leg buckled under her and she fell against the wall of the tunnel. I can't go on, she said. I just can't. You sure? Valkyrie frowned. Of course I'm bloody sure. Melancholia was pale and sweating, and her hands were shaking. Valkyrie took a leaf from her jacket pocket and handed it over. Chew this. It'll numb the pain. Melancholia stared at it. You had this? You had this in your pocket the whole time, and you waited until now to give it to me. It's the only one I have, and it wouldn't have lasted for the whole journey. I've been in agony, so get chewing. Melancholia stuffed the leaf into her mouth and staggered back against the wall. Valkyrie sat on a pile of small rocks. I ate you, Melancholia said, still chewing. I know. I've never hated anyone so much. Is it working yet? Yes, Melancholia snapped. But I still hate you. You're allowed, said Valkyrie. The pile of rocks shifted beneath her, and when she put her hand down to steady herself, they scattered, and she slid to the ground. Her first instinct was to laugh, but the rocks swarmed her, a chattering mass of legs and teeth, dozens of them. She swiped three of them off her chest, realized she was moving. They were carrying her, and she tried to gain some purchase, tried to get up, but there was nothing to hold on to. Help! she shouted to Melancholia, who stood there, open-mouthed. Help me! Valkyrie twisted, glanced at where the things were taking her, saw nothing but the tunnel wall with another pile of rocks at its base. That pile came alive too, and parted, revealing a dark hole, and they carried her through. She clicked her fingers, summoned a flame, saw smooth rock passing above. The creatures, whatever they were, remained unaffected by the light. All she saw were legs and teeth beneath those rock-like shells. No eyes. They probably didn't need eyes down here. The tunnel grew narrower, and her claustrophobia kicked in. She kept her arms bent, hands at her chest. Her shoulders scraped the tunnel walls. A sudden fear flashed through her that she'd get jammed in here, unable to move. She let the fire go out and covered her face with her hands. She was sweating, breathing fast, close to panic. Her progress slowed. The creatures working to get her through. The tunnel walls were tight against her shoulders. Her arms were forced down by her sides. It was too small. The space was too small, too narrow and too low. She wanted to scream and lash out, flail and kick, but there was no room for that. She had to keep it together. She had to. She had to remain calm. She had to keep control. The creatures were all over her. All she could hear was their scuttling legs and her own breathing. Another sound escaped her. A sob. Was she crying? No, not yet, but close, very close. Please, she whispered. Please, 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 please. The creatures gave another determined shunt, and her head banged painfully off the tunnel ceiling, and her shoulders jammed, and she came to a sudden jarring halt. She was stuck. Her arms were trapped by her sides. She could open and close her hands, but she could kick her feet a few inches, but that was all. Valkyrie opened her eyes to complete darkness. She heard the creatures scuttling away to either side, which meant the tunnel had opened to something wider. She just had to get her shoulders through this narrow bit and she'd have room. She started wriggling. She couldn't bend her knees much, but she tried her best, tried to gain a foothold and push off from it. Her fingers scraped the rock. Her hips squirmed as much as they could. Her shoulders wouldn't budge, though. Nothing she was doing was moving her further on. 
Closing her eyes, she forced herself to take deep breaths. Her hands were slick with sweat, and the air felt cold against her skin. She could feel the air against her feet, too, even through the boots. It was faint, very faint, but it was there, that space where it all connected. All she had to do was push off from it, then fly like a torpedo from a launch tube. Easy. It was going to be easy. Her heartbeat slowed. She took another breath, let it out, in control again. In control. She pushed off hard, felt the air rushing around her body, felt it shoot up through the gaps and blow her hair off her face. But she didn't move. She didn't move. Not one inch. She tried to kick, banged her knee. She clawed at the rock, felt a fingernail break. The fear and panic and fury built up inside her, rose from her belly and swelled in her chest and burst from her mouth in a long, raw scream tinged with terror. A shaft of light appeared overhead. Help! she shouted. Help! I'm down here! I'm stuck! She got no shout in return save for her own echo. Another shaft of light hit the rounded wall of the small chamber. It was like a chimney, leading up, and she was at the bottom. Hey! she shouted. I need help! Another shaft of light. And another. Another patch of light, and another. Salvation. Slowly being revealed. But it wasn't like an escape route being uncovered with rocks and debris being cleared away from the other side. Instead, it was like there was something on this side of the escape route, slowly uncurling, something that had been blocking it, maybe sleeping beneath it, something that she had woken up with her screams, something that those rock creatures had maybe been feeding. Chapter 56 Panic she could move her right shoulder slightly. She tried forcing it down. But it was just too tight. She scraped her left hand across her belly, fingers scrabbling for the sleeve of her right arm. She grabbed it, tugged as hard as she could. A few flecks of rock fell onto her neck as a reward. She tried again, snarling as she did so. Her shoulder popped free. She could move it now. Not much, but she could move it. She squirmed into the newfound space until she could move her left shoulder. Both hands pressed against the top of the tunnel and her heels dug in. More shafts of light were revealed, and others were momentarily blocked off as whatever it was made its way down towards her. Valkyrie gritted her teeth, fingers and legs straining, and heaved herself a few inches back inside the tunnel. Her fingers flattened, her heels dug in, and she heaved. Another few inches this time, and then another few more. Her chin was almost inside the tunnel now. Her feet kicked around until she found a good place of purchase, heaved again. Inch by inch, with agonizing slowness, Valkyrie got her whole body back inside the tunnel. Sweat stung her eyes, and she couldn't wipe it away. She kept going. She had to. She didn't know if the thing behind her had arms or tentacles, but she couldn't stop. She had more space now. She could heave herself a greater distance. There was a sound above her. She cracked open an eye against the sweat, saw a blurry shape filling the tunnel behind her head. She didn't waste her breath cursing. She just went faster, splintering another nail, banging her head. More space above. She squeezed one hand past her face, wiping her eyes as she did so, grunting in exertion. Finally, it broke through, and then she did the other. It got stuck halfway, and Valkyrie suddenly started crying. She twisted and squirmed, felt the rock rip the skin on the back of her hand as it burst through to join the other. Now both hands were over her head, and she felt the air, felt the creature closing in, and she pushed. She shot away from the creature, yelling in pain. Her jacket rode up over her chest, leaving her back bare against the sharp rocks beneath. She stopped and screamed, 
but didn't let herself pause. She pushed again, cracking her head against the wall, feeling her skin rip all the way up her back. She had space now, space to hug herself, space to bend her legs and raise her head. The exit was in sight. Melancholia, she shouted. Hey! There was no movement out there in the larger tunnel, and Valkyrie screamed her curses. She brought her legs in towards her, twisted sideways, cursing and grunting and sobbing, and managed to turn her body so that she could crawl the rest of the way. She got out, got to her hands and knees, tried to stand, but she was trembling so much she collapsed. All she wanted to do was stay curled up like this, but she couldn't stop. She couldn't even rest. She opened her eyes, looked around. Melancholia wasn't even there to help her. Her hands were cut raw. Fingernails on both hands cracked and broken. The back of her jacket was soaked with blood. Every movement made her whimper. She got up. At least her legs were okay. She could still run. Holding her hands close to her chest, her fingers curled protectively, Valkyrie hurried on. Melancholia wouldn't have been able to get that far, not with how badly she was limping. Valkyrie didn't know what she was going to do when she caught up with her. Melancholia hadn't even helped. She'd just stood there while Valkyrie was carried away. Valkyrie had half a mind to throw her to Val and run on without her. Valkyrie faltered when she heard a roar up ahead. Grimacing, she sneaked to the end of the tunnel, peeked around. Melancholia was trying to climb to a higher ledge while three rat monkeys attacked Lord Vile. Valkyrie looked closer, trying to come up with a better description than rat monkey. But no, rat monkey was exactly what they were. They were humanoid, as tall as she was, covered in patches of dirty brown fur. Their faces were long and their mouths were small but packed with sharp teeth, vile through shadows, but they dissipated on impact. The rat monkeys leaped on him, shrieking, bringing him down. Above it all, Melancholia was halfway to the ledge. Vile kicked the first rat monkey away, slammed an elbow into the second. The third fell on him, and they rolled. The rat monkey was up first, dancing and chattering. Vile got to his feet, lunging, his hands closing around the creature's throat. The rat monkey squawked, its hands and feet flailing as Vile's arms straightened, and he lifted. They may have been immune to magic, but Vile had hundreds of ways to take a life. Even from where she stood, Valkyrie heard the snap of the creature's neck, and then Vile threw it to one side and turned to face the other two. They snarled and shrieked their rage, Vile sent a shadow up to the ceiling. It wrapped around a stalactite and snapped it off, then swooped down and drove it through the smaller rat monkey's chest. The remaining creature howled in anguish and went straight for Vile. It leaped for him. But he moved, got behind it, wrapped an arm around its neck. He held it struggling against him while he strangled it, then let it fall. Vile nudged the creature with his foot while a shadow rose through the air after melancholia. It lazily wrapped around her ankle and tugged, and she fell to the cavern floor, cursing. Vile lost interest in the rat monkey, strode over to melancholia as she did her best to stand. Stay away from me, she roared. Valkyrie took a breath and sprinted from cover. Melancholia tried to sweep Vile away in a wave of shadows, but something went wrong, and she cried out, fell to her knees. Darkness pulsed through her skin. Vile shadow walked to her side, but just as he reappeared, the darkness pulsed again, and he was gone. Valkyrie skidded to a halt. Where'd he go? Thought you were dead, Melancholia murmured. Where's Vile? What did you do? Melancholia grimaced and got up. I don't know. I think I redirected his shadow walk. Where? Not sure. I don't know how this works. Is he far away? Are we safe? Melancholia hesitated, then shook her head. 
I can feel him. He's still down here, still after us. Valkyrie looked up to the ledge. You were going to climb up there? Let's go. Melancholia scowled, and they started climbing. Valkyrie's bloody fingers made climbing difficult, but she hissed through the pain, letting it make her angry, letting it reinforce her strength. She got to the top, turned, and helped Melancholia up. They straightened just as someone stepped from the darkness beside them, and the white cleaver swung his scythe at Valkyrie's neck. Stop! Melancholia yelled. The blade halted, a hair's breadth from Valkyrie's skin. We need her to get out of here, Melancholia said, wincing. We can throw her to Vile as a decoy or something. We have to keep going, you understand? The cleaver nodded, slid the scythe into its fixture on his back, and scooped Melancholia into his arms. Then he took off running, and Valkyrie did her best to keep up. Chapter 57 Beheaded the echo of their footsteps changed, and they emerged from the tunnel into a cavern with a still lake in the middle. It was vast and black. Valkyrie heard footsteps and turned as Vurian scapegrace charged out of the darkness, yelling a war cry. The white cleaver suddenly thrust Melancholia into Valkyrie's arms. His scythe glinted, and scapegrace's head popped off. Valkyrie stared as his body kept running and toppled into the water. The white cleaver swished his scythe into its fixture, then took Melancholia back from Valkyrie. There was another cry, this time a long, mournful wail, as Thrasher staggered towards them. What have you done? he cried. What have you done? Don't kill him. Valkyrie said to the White Cleaver. Melancholia nodded her agreement, and so when Thrasher was close enough, the White Cleaver merely kicked him. Thrasher went hurtling back into the shadows. Valkyrie hesitated, then picked up Scapegrace's head. She'd never liked him. The first time she'd met him, he'd tried to throw her off a building. Time and time again, he tried to kill her until his failures actually started to endear him to her. She realized she had begun to view him as a dumb little puppy who would always turn up, sooner or later, to chew her sock or poo in her shoe. She was going to miss him. He swiveled his eyes to her, and she yelped and dropped his head. He bounced and landed on his ear. I'll get you, he wheezed. All of you. You're dead. Valkyrie didn't know what to do. She glanced back. Even Melancholia's eyes widened in surprise. Valkyrie picked up the head again. Sorry? she said. Scapegrace tried to bite her hand, and she slapped him lightly. Behave. When my master hears about this... Scapegrace, what the hell are you doing down here? He sneered. I'll never tell. Who's your master? I'll never tell you that either. How did you even get here? Let me bite you. Just let me bite you. She slapped him again. Scapegrace, listen to me. You've got a choice. Either tell me what I want to know, or I'll throw you into the lake. I'm not afraid, Scapegrace said defiantly. Are you sure about that? On the lake bed, all alone? Who knows how long it'll take for you to rot away? Go to hell! I wonder what strange mutant monster fish they have down here. I bet they'll start to nibble at you. You can't scare me. You'll go mad first, of course. Mad with despair. Mad with hopelessness. It could take years. Shut up, Scapegrace said feebly. Is your master a man called Vandermeer Craven? Valkyrie asked. Yes, Scapegrace wheezed proudly. He showed you another way into these caves? Yes. You need to tell us where you came in. My master will kill you all. Craven's dead, Melancholia said. His eyes swiveled to her. What? He's dead. Killed by Skullduggery Pleasant. But you'll take orders from any necromancer, won't you? My name is Melancholia Sinclair. I'm a necromancer. 
Mistress, Scapegrace wheezed adoringly. Valkyrie turned him back towards her. You take your orders from us now, all right? Scapegrace looked at her for a long moment, then his face crumpled. I can't even nod. You took away my body. I can't even nod. Were you trying to nod? Yes. Maybe you should tell us if you're doing something like that. Fine. I'm nodding, okay? Good. Melancholia needs to find another way out of here. Turn me round. She did so. See the tunnel up there? See the light? That's a flashlight. Thrasher dropped it like an idiot. There were a lot of us when we came in. Now there's only two of us left. Well, Valkyrie said, there's one and a bit of you left. Turn me round again! She did so. He tried to bite her. She held him by the few strands of hair that still clung to his burnt, rotten scalp. When we get to the tunnel, where do we go? Follow the flashlights the others dropped, he snarled. But there are monsters up there, horrible, chattering monsters, and they'll eat you. I hope they eat you. Not you, mistress, but I hope they eat her. I understand, Melancholia said. Can we get rid of him now? Valkyrie looked at Scapegrace. I was actually going to miss you, you know that? I hate you, and hope you die. Right, Valkyrie said, and drop-kicked the head as hard as she could. It shot past Melancholia and the Cleaver and was gaining height when Thrasher suddenly appeared from nowhere and leaped up, his hands closing around it. He landed and ran off, head under his arm, and they watched him go. I'll get you! They heard Scapegrace wheeze as the two zombies vanished into the shadows. I'll get you, Valkyrie King! A couple of moments passed. Well, Valkyrie said eventually, that's something you don't see every day. He's coming, Melancholia said. Valkyrie turned. The darkness writhed in the tunnel behind them. If we can ambush him, Valkyrie began. But Melancholia shook her head. Are you insane? We can't ambush him. And even if he could, then what? Are you going to talk to him? Try to get through to him? Your friend is gone, you stupid little girl. We have to run. We have to get out of here. She turned to the cleaver. Delay. You understand? Do whatever it takes to delay him. The white cleaver nodded and took out his scythe. Valkyrie wrapped Melancholia's arm around her neck, and they hurried to the base of the tunnel. Hold on to me, Valkyrie muttered, sweeping the air in. It lifted them, but for a moment Valkyrie didn't think it would be enough, so she reached out desperately for more. The air buffeted them up and over, and Melancholia cried out as they landed heavily. Valkyrie pulled her to her feet, ignoring the curses, and they hobbled for the tunnel. Before they reached it, Valkyrie looked back and saw Lord Vile emerge. The white cleaver stood in his way, blocking his path. Two dozen shadows surged from Vile's armor and speared the cleaver's body. The cleaver managed to remain upright for a few seconds before a spasm rippled through those shadows and tore him apart. Valkyrie dragged Melancholia onwards. Chapter 58 The Main Event It came from above, scuttling from the tunnel ceiling to the curve of the wall, moving so fast it was hard to keep track. Before it slipped into darkness, Valkyrie saw its pale skin glisten wetly. I don't think we should go this way, she said softly. You are the zombie, Melancholia responded. This is the way out. What do you want to do? You want to go back? There's something up ahead. There's something behind us, too. Throw a ball of fire at whatever it is, and it'll run off. Do I have to think of everything? So far you haven't thought of anything, Valkyrie said, but resumed walking. The creatures down here are not friendly, and they're not easily stopped. 
Maybe not by you, but I am the Deathbringer. You still believe that? You saw what I can do? You said it yourself, your rechargeable battery. You have no idea how powerful I am. I can take lives by reaching out with my mind. And how's that going for you? Melancholia glared. This is your fault. You tricked me into giving the skeleton his life back. Without the skeleton, Vile would still only be an empty suit of armor, which I'd have destroyed by now. And if you had destroyed it, then you'd have killed me, and then millions of others. Sorry, Mel. You don't get to paint yourself as the innocent victim here. There's something wrong with you, you know? Melancholia said. Twenty minutes ago, I tried to kill you. And now you're helping me run from your friend who is now trying to kill us both. That's a very healthy relationship you have there, by the way. At least Vile isn't going to try to kill the world after this. All he wants to do is kill you and whoever might replace you. Why do you keep calling him Vile? What happened to calling him Skaldaguri? When he wears that armor, he's Lord Vile. That's how I've got to think of him. It's the only way we're going to survive. Melancholia snapped her head around. Did you hear that? Valkyrie disentangled herself from Melancholia, left her leaning against the tunnel wall. There was something up ahead. She could see it in the gloom. It leaped up and charged. Valkyrie pushed at the air, and it came right through. Barged into her, and Valkyrie went down, getting tangled in its limbs, in its clutching hands. Its knee dropped to her belly, and the breath rushed from her lungs. She latched onto it, wrapped her arms around its skinny frame and didn't let go, burying her head into its shoulder. It snarled and bucked, and she strained to hold on, even when it started rolling. She tucked her legs around its knees. If she lost grip, her stomach muscles would cramp up, leaving her defenseless. Holding on was all she could do. Holding on was the only thing keeping her alive. The creature, whatever it was, was shrieking now. They rolled to the edge and dropped a few feet. Valkyrie landed on her shoulder and her arms almost sprang apart. It pulled her hair and scraped her face. She kept her head down and her eyes tightly shut. She pulled in a sliver of air. When she was sure she wasn't going to curl up the moment she released her grip, she raised her head and opened her mouth, snarled and sank her teeth into the creature's neck. It screamed, a sound of pure panic, and it struggled, but Valkyrie didn't let go. Blood washed into her mouth, and she gagged and did her best not to swallow. They rolled sideways. Valkyrie used her hips to heave herself forward, and now she was on top, with the creature wriggling and squirming beneath her. Valkyrie's jaw was aching, but she held on. Her mouth was filling with warm blood. It spilled over her face, down her neck, beneath her clothes. It spilled onto the ground, splashing into the dirt. Gradually, the struggling weakened. When enough feeling had returned to her, Valkyrie rolled away and immediately threw up. The creature lay still, mouth open and eyes closed. There was blood everywhere. Valkyrie spat and crawled further away, then collapsed. The inside of her mouth tasted like blood and sick. She had meat between her teeth. Are you okay? She looked back. Melancholia was staring at her. All Valkyrie wanted to do was curl up and cry. Melancholia held out her hand and helped her onto the upper ledge. We have to keep going, Valkyrie murmured. We can rest a few. No! Valkyrie said and got to her feet. We have to keep going. They walked on, Melancholia getting weaker and weaker. By the time the gloom began to brighten, she was practically unconscious. Valkyrie dragged her the last few hundred meters, finally emerging from the cave mouth into the moonlight. She laid Melancholia on the ground and stumbled to her knees. The cool breeze brushed the sweat on her face. Her back was on fire, the blood sticky on her skin. She didn't even notice her cut hands or her broken fingernails anymore. There were a few vehicles parked nearby, two cars and a jeep and, for some reason, an ice cream van. 
She didn't wonder why there was an ice cream van. Wondering was the luxury of the curious, and curiosity was a luxury she didn't have time for. Groaning with the effort, Valkyrie stood on legs that were made of lead. Her muscles were thick, heavy things that couldn't be trusted. She hobbled to the nearest car. The keys were still in it. She collapsed against the bonnet, eyes closed in relief. She really didn't want to hobble back and drag Melancholia over. Hey, she called to her, her voice croaky. She needed water. Hey, Mel, get up! Melancholia stayed, passed out. Valkyrie tried using the air to pull Melancholia closer, but her hand waved uselessly. She was too tired. She needed to rest, just for ten minutes, just to regain a little of her strength. That wasn't too much to ask, not after coming all this way. Not after going through all that, just a little rest. You look dreadful. Valkyrie opened her eyes. Melancholia was looking at her from where she was lying. Valkyrie gave a short laugh. Yeah, she said, because you look so good down there. Melancholia smiled weakly and shuddered as a pulse of darkness passed through her. I don't know what's happening. We'll get you to the sanctuary, Valkyrie told her. There's a doctor there. Its name is Nye. You're going to love it. Melancholia tried to rise, then laid her head back on the ground. You know, she murmured, I don't think I want to kill millions of people anymore. That's good. Now I only want to kill you, Valkyrie grinned. Well, it's progress. I suppose. Help me up, you lazy cow. Valkyrie laughed again. Then she saw the shadows shifting in the tunnel and her heart plummeted. She pushed herself away from the car, forced her legs to run to Melancholia, but it was too late. The darkness reared up and held her back, and Lord Vile emerged into the night. Skullduggery, she cried. Please listen to me. She's hurt. She's damaged. She's not the Deathbringer anymore. Lord Vile ignored her. Melancholia started to crawl away, and a black claw grew from Vile's fist. Valkyrie pushed through the darkness, went stumbling, managed to fall beside Melancholia. She grabbed her. Kill me, she whispered. Melancholia tried to push her away. But Valkyrie gripped her tighter. Kill me. It's her only chance. What are you? With the last ounce of her strength, Valkyrie punched. It wasn't a good punch, and it wasn't a strong punch, but it did the job, and Melancholia's anger flared. I hope you know what you're doing, she growled. Her eyes narrowed. Valkyrie took a breath, immediately felt cold. She could sense Melancholia reaching out with her mind, using her last reserves to expand the death bubble around them both. Then the bubble retracted, and Valkyrie started to go with it, started to leave her body. As she was pulled gently closer to Melancholia, she paused a while to examine what was happening. Her body's heartbeat slowed. Her brain waves began to flatten. The bioelectricity in her body dampened. She was leaving her shell behind, and her thoughts were becoming clouded. She was about to lose who she was. Her identity was in her personality, and her personality rested in her body. Fascinating. The whole process was so fascinating. She couldn't allow it to happen, of course. She pulled back felt her synapses firing again, felt her heart quicken, felt her body around her. Melancholia's eyes were closed. It was all too much for her, the poor thing. Still, she'd done her job. She'd endangered Valkyrie's life and awoken the beast within. Darkus stood up and looked at Lord Vile. Be honest, she said. You've been looking forward to this, haven't you? Vile opened both hands, 
pulling shadows from the mouth of the cave. They curled and thrashed behind him, then rose in a giant wave that rolled towards her. Darkus fell to one knee under the onslaught. It was a test. He was testing her, seeing how strong she was. When the wave was gone, she lunged. He ducked under the punch and grabbed her low, lifting her off her feet, taking her to the grass. His fists came down, battering her face. She tried to wrap her legs around his waist, but his armor expanded, keeping her from locking her ankles together. His fists were hammers, driving her down into the ground, the earth giving way beneath her. An extraordinary sensation. She reached up with one hand, her fingers gripping his armor, and she pulled him down to her as she rose up, slamming her forehead into his armor-plated face with enough force to break boulders. Vile swayed slightly, and she heaved herself out of the depression she had made, flipping them both over, just like Skullduggery had taught her, had taught Valkyrie, whatever. She pushed herself to her feet and kicked, her boot finding a perfect spot on Vile's ribs. She kicked again, and again, shunting him along the ground. He tried to get up, and she grabbed his head, started twisting, aiming to pull the whole thing right off. Shadows flew at her, covered her face, cutting off her oxygen. She felt Vile slip from her grip and lashed out blindly. Her left hand connected with him, and the shadows went away as Vile stumbled back. They observed each other, and Darkus smiled, then quickly lifted off the ground. Vile followed her. It was as if the knight reached down and raised him up. Darkus laughed. She flew high and fast, and he gave chase. The sky was cloudless, the moon half full, the stars out over the countryside that flashed beneath her. He was gaining, and so she flew faster. She glanced back in time to see him give a burst of speed, and they collided. When spinning through the air, grappling, Everywhere Vile was in contact with her, spikes would grow. They couldn't get through her clothes, but they cut her hands, her neck, her face. She hit him, but his mask had turned sharp and jagged and punctured her fist, breaking the knuckles. She kicked away, swooped under his grab and veered towards the lights of the city, to where the sky turned orange and hid the stars. As she flew, she examined the pain she was feeling, then dampened it and healed herself. Healed her back and her fingernails too, all the little cuts and scratches and bruises. It was freezing up here, but she didn't care about the cold. The wind in her face, her hair blown back, the trouble she was having taking a breath. It was all just a part of being alive, and Darkus liked being alive. She looked back. Vile flew like a bullet, arms down at his sides, streamlined and efficient. She laughed, holding her own arms out like Superman. All she needed now was a cape. The knight snatched Vile away. One moment he was behind her, the next he was gone. She looked round and he emerged from the dark ahead of her, but she didn't alter her course. She curled her hands into fists and flew straight into him, catching him in the gut, speeding on with him folded over her. His left hand grabbed her wrist squeezed it so tightly her bones broke. She healed them instantly. He reached to her with his right hand, his armored glove finding her face, his thumb seeking her eye. She turned her head, but he had a good grip. If he burst her eyeball, how quickly would she be able to repair it? She didn't know, so she let him do it. As an experiment, she allowed the pain in. His thumb burst her eye, and she shrieked. Her body convulsed, and she twisted in midair. Vile's momentum carried him onwards, but Darkest didn't care about him. All she cared about was the extraordinary pain she was experiencing. Her hands were covering her face, feeling the blood and the jelly leak down her cheek. She realized she was still screaming, screaming and roaring and crying, turning in circles in the air. When the pain was too much, she shut it off and calmly pressed the remains of her eye back into its socket. An interesting experiment. She opened her good eye, saw Vile coming for her. 
His shoulder slammed into her belly. His arm encircled her, and they hurtled downwards. She blinked. The vision in her bad eye turned from nothing to blurry to perfect. Better than her right eye, in fact. To compensate, she sharpened that eye as well, and then returned her attention to her current predicament. She tried to look down at what they were flying towards, but the wind was blowing her hair in the way. She wrapped her legs around Vile's waist, grabbed him where she could, and flipped, so that now she was the pilot forcing him down. And now that her hair was out of the way, she could see what they were heading towards. O'Connell Street, in the middle of Dublin. Oh, she said, and then they crashed. Chapter 59 Hero and Villain Darkus lay there in the broken road, looking up at the suddenly starless sky in the last few moments of life, and she managed a shaky laugh. Her body was smashed, her lungs were burst, and her heart wasn't beating. Her limbs were twisted, her spine was pulverized, her head was cracked open. She could feel her brain starting to swell. So that was the first thing she healed. She wouldn't be able to do much thinking without her brain. It was somewhere between four and five on a Monday morning. She healed her spine and raised her head, looked around. No civilians were standing there, staring with open mouths. Pity. She'd have liked to have seen their faces when she stood up after a fall like that. Lord Vile lay a few feet away. He wasn't moving. Darkus repaired her internal organs, restarted her heart and drew air into her newly reformed lungs. Next came her limbs. Her bones made cracking sounds as they realigned and knit back together. She reached behind her head, made sure her hair didn't get trapped in the fissure that healed in her skull. Her ruptured skin closed over. A lot of her blood covered the ground, so she made more and stood up. Headlights swept in, and she turned. A taxi slowed to a stop, and the driver got out. He looked at her, looked at file, looked at the churned-up road. He didn't ask any questions. He just stood there like he was waiting for an explanation. She didn't like that. She didn't like him. She stepped forward to tear him in two, and then Vile grabbed her jacket from behind, lifted her off her feet, and slammed her through the bonnet of the car. Her face crunched into the engine block, and he hauled her out before she even knew it was happening, and hurled her through the window of a Burger King. She hit a table and flipped sideways to the floor, coming to a stop in the dark as an alarm started up, so loud that it pierced the world. She got to her hands and knees, spitting blood, and the shadows snaked out, seized her wrists, and she flew back out through the broken window, hitting the ruined taxi, denting the passenger side door. Above the alarm, she heard the driver screaming as he ran away, and then Vile reached down, closed his fingers around her throat. He held her off the ground with his left hand and hit her with his right. His fist was a block of stone, showing her explosions of bright light every time it connected. She needed to stop him before he punched her brain out through her skull. She'd done that once. It was funnier when it happened to other people. She took hold of his left wrist with both her hands and squeezed. Vile's head tilted. He reinforced the armor on his forearm. But Darkus just squeezed harder. Finally, he had to release his grip, and she smacked him under the chin. He hurtled backwards off his feet, and she launched herself into the air, smashed into him, flying low. The street whipped by underneath. She got a hand around his throat and dipped, smashing the back of his head into the steps that led up to Eason's bookshop. The steps cracked under the impact, and Darkus smashed his head down again and again. A pillar of darkness erupted from his chest like a piston, throwing her to the pavement. He stood, and she waved an arm. The energy that enveloped him would have turned rock to dust, but all it did to Vile was send him staggering to the metal shutter covering the shop window. The shutter melted. The glass shattered, 
and another alarm rang out. Darkus leaped to the top of the steps and barged into him, taking them both through the window into the shop. The shadows converged, tried to wrap around her hands and feet. Darkus snarled, cutting through them with her fingernails. She gagged suddenly, saw blood, took a moment to work out that her throat had been slashed. She healed it and saw a vial, conducting the shadows like an orchestra. She blurred to him, threw him back against the wall, spilling books and breaking shelves. She was on him again, holding him above her as she launched upwards. She smashed him through the ceiling into the floor above, smashed through into the floor above that and the floor above that. There he broke free, elbowed her, impaled her cheek with the spike that grew from that elbow, and wrenched it out. She spat blood onto the eye slit in his mask, and he tried to push her away. But she grabbed him, spun, and hurled him to the line of windows overlooking the street. He smashed through, and she saw the knight swoop down and catch him. She was breathing hard, covered in dust and blood and plaster. She was sweating, too, and starving. All this energy— all this magic being used on someone who seemed to be just as tough as she was, maybe even tougher. She healed her face and walked to the windows. Vile hovered in midair, looking at her. His armor was spiked, ready for round two. Below, sirens wailed and blue lights flashed. Above, a police helicopter sped towards them, searchlight probing the streets. Darkus smiled. She ran for the window, jumped, and took flight, the wind in her hair again. She flew up, away from Vile, towards the helicopter. She ducked round the searchlight, coming around low, but before she could punch through the underside, Vile had his arms around her and was pulling her away. They tumbled out of the sky. For a moment, it looked like they might smash into the fire engine speeding across a Connell Bridge. But Vile changed their trajectory, and they hit the water, went deep into the Liffey, and Vile lost his grip. Darkus powered through the dark river, Vile right behind reaching out. He snagged her foot, and she veered up, broke the surface, trying to shake him. He twisted in midair, threw her like a baseball. It was almost fun, the speed at which she was thrown. Another window smashed its smithereens around her. She hit a railing, tumbled down some stairs, came to rest herself against a shelf, comics falling on top of her. She saw a sign that said Forbidden Planet. A comic shop. How fitting. She looked up. Vile stood at the top of the stairs. We should really stop throwing each other through windows, she told him. She reached up to the counter, pulled herself to her feet. You know what the funny thing is? I actually don't care any more if you kill Melancholia. Isn't that funny? In fact, if you'd be agreeable, maybe we could pop back for a moment and I'll kill her myself. What do you say? He stood there, a dark shape, unmoving. A shard of glass had managed to sneak into her belly, between her trousers and jacket. She gripped it with two fingers and pulled it out slowly. It was much longer than she'd expected. When it was out, she dropped it and pulled another shard from her forehead. So, that's a no then, is it? Pity. He walked down the steps. Does that mean you've changed your mind? She asked. Don't you want to kill the Deathbringer? What about me? Do you want to kill me? I'm going to kill the world, after all. This might be your only chance to stop me. He reached the bottom and just stood there, looking at her. I'm just going to get stronger, she said, and you know it. This is your only chance. No? You're not going to take it? She laughed. I'm disappointed. I've heard so much about the great Lord Vile, and now look at him. He's not even going to kill his enemy when she's right in front of him. What do I have to do? How do I provoke such a scary, scary man like you into doing what needs to be done? Do I go out there and kill someone? What about those cops? Do you need me to kill those cops? 
I'd like another go at that helicopter, actually. I'd like to see it crash and burn, or maybe something else. What else could I do, I wonder? Valkyrie, Lord Vile said, his voice a whisper. Darkus smiled. I'm Valkyrie. Whatever you've got to say to her, you can say to me. What was it Skullduggery said earlier? I'm her bad mood. That whisper again. Let her out. But I'm not repressing her. I know you understand this. I am Valkyrie. I'm just embracing my potential. If my conscience never reasserted itself, I'd stay like this forever, just like you'd stay like that, Skullduggery. Vile tilted his head. Then his hands went to his mask, and she heard the clasps open one by one. Shadows leaked, dissipating into the air. He pulled the mask away, revealing the gleaming skull beneath. I wouldn't stay like this, Skullduggery said. I like being me. Darkus smiled. Do you really? Do you really like carrying around all that shame and guilt? I doubt it. I bet you anything that being Lord Vile was the most fun you've had in years. You'd be wrong. I think you're fibbing. He let the chest plate fall. Beneath it, his shirt was rumpled and his bow tie was askew. The most fun I've had recently was St. Patrick's Day last year. You remember it? Darkus frowned. Did we do anything on St. Patrick's Day? He continued to strip the armor away. We were on a stakeout. It was you, me, and Fletcher. For the first hour, he wouldn't shut up. Then you started insulting him. Oh, Darkus said. I remember. It was five hours with the three of us stuck in a room, and then another four hours with just the two of us, and Fletcher couldn't take it any more. Darkus laughed. I've never seen him sulk so hard. That was a good day for me, Skullduggery said. I didn't have to hit anyone. I didn't have to shoot anyone. I just sat around and talked to my good friend and partner, Valkyrie Kane. And insulted her boyfriend, Darkus grinned. Indeed. Valkyrie shrugged. Ex-boyfriend now, of course. Fletcher was always going to be your ex-boyfriend from the moment you met him. He just finally caught up with where he's supposed to be. What a nice way of looking at it. The last bit of Skullduggery's armor joined the pile. Maybe you should share that with him the next time you see him. Maybe. She looked round at the shattered glass and the mess. I'm tired. I don't blame you. People saw us. That taxi driver, he saw me. That's what people like scrutinous are for. I'm me again, by the way. I know. Valkyrie let out a deep breath. Did you see what I did? I was practically dead and I healed myself. How did I do that? I don't even know what kind of magic it was. It certainly wasn't elemental, and it was like no adept discipline I've ever heard of. It didn't follow any of the rules. I don't know, Valkyrie. I wonder what else I can do, she said, and heat rose in her face. I mean, I don't want to know. I don't want anything like that to happen again. I just... I know, Skullduggery said. You're just wondering. Yeah, she said. Exactly. It was amazing. I was flying, for God's sake. Me, on my own. I was doing all these incredible things. Skullduggery held his hand over the armor, and the various sections melted into each other. He picked up what was left. Power is intoxicating. That's a good word for it. And like any intoxicant, it's also addictive. She fell silent. They climbed the stairs and stepped out through the window. Dawn was on its way. Valkyrie took out her phone to check the time. It fell to pieces the moment it left her pocket. Huh? she said. I think I need a more impact-resistant phone. Skullduggery took out his. Three missed calls, all from Ghastly. 
At least he's alive. Skullduggery wrapped one arm around her waist, and they rose up off the pavement. Thank you, he said. They flew over the city, the wind gently boosting them. The flashing lights and the sirens faded, and Valkyrie looked to the approaching horizon, fighting the voice in her head. She used to love it when Skullduggery would take her into the air. The pure sensation of flying used to make her smile so, so wide. But now she wanted to pull away, to flatten out and go like a rocket. She wanted to do it herself. She wanted to feel that level of power again. Soon, the voice in her head told her. Soon. Chapter 60 Tattletale Warmth and sunshine never really seemed to reach Roarhaven. It was as if it had its own extra layer of atmosphere that kept out anything that could possibly lighten the mood of its citizens. The same dour faces peered at the Bentley as they passed, unimpressed with the activity that was making the sanctuary hum. The Bentley stopped right at the end of the main street, and Skullduggery and Valkyrie looked at all the sorcerers streaming in through the sanctuary doors. Today, they were to be honoured by the guests and the Council of Elders for their work to prevent the passage, and for their efforts to save the lives of the people who were gathering. Ravel had assured them it would be a quiet ceremony. It doesn't look quiet, Valkyrie said. Indeed it does not, Skullduggery murmured. Are they going to give us medals or something? Maybe vouchers? I could use some vouchers. There's going to be speeches. Everyone of importance will want to stand up and give a speech. I hate speeches. They're only good when I give them. Valkyrie sighed. How long before it starts? Ten minutes. She opened the car door. I'm going for a walk. You'd better not be late. She grinned. Would I do that to you? She got out, and the Bentley moved on. She crossed the street. There would be enough handshaking and polite smiles as it was. She didn't need to turn up early and subject herself to more. Here she is, said a voice from behind her. The hero of the hour. She turned, watched warily as Solomon Wreath approached, his cane tapping the pavement. Are we going to start fighting? I ever would we do that he asked, smiling. I'd say I'm not the necromancer's favorite person right now. Oh, he said, that, that'll pass, Valkyrie. You've got nothing to worry about. The order poses no threat to you, especially here in Ireland. The temple is empty. The elders say they're going to tear it down or convert it into something that could be used by the sanctuary. I'd say such a move would be sacrilegious, but no one would care. I certainly wouldn't. There you go. He sighed and looked at her. How is our little death-bringer, anyway? Unconscious, Valkyrie said. And she remained that way for a long time. Dr. Nine used to coma. It was the safest thing to do, apparently. Her power was surging and looping and going nuts. She could have gone off at any time. Gone off? Like a bomb, Nye said. Like a small nuke, in fact. All that uncontrolled magic just exploding. Scary stuff. And all because of you and your friends. Craven was not a friend. I met necromancers in general. Oh, then yes, it was all our fault. But look on the bright side. Nobody died. Valkyrie frowned. Lots of people died. But nobody you like. Everyone at the ball got up and walked away, didn't they? I suppose. Scapegrace got his head chopped off, though. I don't know who that is. You don't have to. I don't really like him anyway. See? Happy endings all round. Any word on Vile? Valkyrie shook her head. She disappeared. Hasn't been seen since. Melancholia must have really thrown him about the place. O'Connell Street is in ruins. Yeah, Valkyrie said. She must have. <laughs> Your friend Scrutinus has undoubtedly been working overtime to keep the truth of what happened out of the news reports. Ruptured gas mains are terrible things. Makes you wonder, though, 
with all that damage, why Vile didn't just kill her. He didn't have to. He sabotaged her power. He didn't need to do anything else. But this is Lord Vile we're talking about. He's not the kind to leave jobs half done. Valkyrie shrugged. Well, the next time I see him, I'll ask him, okay? And what are you going to do now? Join a temple in England? America? Wreath hesitated. The order isn't too keen on taking me back, actually. Even though I've been exonerated of all wrongdoing, they feel my presence might tarnish their good standing in the rest of the world, or what there is of it. They'd rather everyone just forgot about the passage for a few years. I don't really see that happening. But necromancers have a proud history of sticking their heads in the sand. No, Valkyrie. I'm basically going to walk the earth. Walk from place to place, meet people, get on adventures, like jewels in Pulp Fiction. Something like that, yes. Cool. Or I could stay here and you could continue your lessons in necromancy. I'll keep practicing on my own, thank you very much. You might need this, he said, and tossed her a black ring identical to the one Melancholia had destroyed. It's empty, and waiting for you to pour your magic into. Thank you. He smiled. It's hard, isn't it? Given a power like that? She looked away. You have no idea. The Bentley pulled up beside them. Skullduggery got out. Detective Pleasant, Reed said. All's well that ends well, eh? I don't want to see you around for a while, Skullduggery said. Nothing personal, you understand? I do, of course, Reed said, and bowed slightly. He looked at Valkyrie. I'm expecting great things from you, my dear. She nodded, didn't answer. The shadows swirled, and he was gone. She walked over to the Bentley. Is it time? Yes, it is, Skullduggery said. They got in the car and slowly pulled away from the curb. Valkyrie frowned. We're going the wrong way. Are we? The sanctuary's behind us. Oh, dear. They kept going. Valkyrie smiled. Are they going to be upset? Probably, he admitted. But I just couldn't subject you to an entire afternoon of people telling us how great we are. We don't need people to tell us that. We know. If I were you, though, I'd turn off your phone. Good idea, she said. As she dug her new phone out of her pocket, she asked, Where are we off to? China's library. She left me a message to come and see her as soon as we can. I think that takes priority over a needless ego boost, don't you? Absolutely. They left Roarhaven by the dusty road that linked it to the outside world. They were lying, of course, and they both knew it. It wasn't the speeches that kept them from the ceremony, or the handshaking, or the polite smiles. It was the fact that they were being celebrated for actions they couldn't be proud of. The only way to beat Melancholia had been for Skullduggery to become Lord Vile. And the only way to beat Lord Vile had been for Valkyrie to become Darkest. There's something wrong with us, Valkyrie murmured as they drove. Yes, there is. What are you going to do with your armor? Seal it away. It's the only thing I can do. You might need it again. Hopefully not. She turned her head to him. If Darkus comes out again and I can't regain control, you're going to need some way to stop me. You can't let me kill my family, Skullduggery. He looked at her. That's not going to happen. We saw it happen. We saw a vision of one possible future. You have to stop me, she said, switching her gaze to the road ahead. He was silent for a moment. I will, he promised, his voice soft. They drove the rest of the way in silence. China and Eliza Scorn were fighting in the street when they reached the tenement building. The Bentleys screeched to a halt, and Skullduggery and Valkyrie leaped out. Hey! Valkyrie roared. Get away from her! Scorn rammed China into the side of the car. China staggered, caught a punch right on the hinge of the jaw, 
that dropped her to her knees. Scorn kicked her full force in the belly, and China folded. Skaldugory's gun was in his hand. Scorn crouched low, using China as a shield. Don't shoot, Scorn called. Stand up and move away, Skaldugory ordered. So you have a clear shot? I don't think so. China moaned as she sucked in air. Call her, she managed. She's got a bomb. I have a bombshell, Scorn corrected, of information. What's that in your hand? Skullduggery asked. Scorn smiled. She was holding a small black cylinder with a red button on top. Okay, fine. I do have an actual bomb, too. A few bombs, in fact. Small ones. But you work with what you've got. They're spread around the library. And there are a few in China's apartment, too. Don't worry, there's nobody up there. No one's going to get hurt. Skullduggery thumbed back the hammer of his gun. Drop the switch. I'm not going to do that. If you press that button, you'll end up in a cell. I don't think I will. I think when I do press this button, you're going to let me walk away. And why would I do that? Because I have information you're going to find very interesting. I've been researching this over the last few months, actually. Do you remember the day your family died? It's always amusing, Skullduggery said, when someone tries to use that to goad me into doing something. Oh, I'm not goading you. I'm genuinely asking. Ever so slowly, Scorn stood up straight. I wasn't even in the country at the time. I think I was in Spain doing a thing. Anyway, Nefarian Serpine, great guy, by the way, needed to throw you off balance, needed you distracted, needed you to get angry and stop thinking straight. So obviously, killing your wife and kid in front of you was the only reasonable way to do that. He wasn't well, that man. He had issues. You know what I mean? He needed to distract you, and the only thing he could come up with was to murder your family. Not if someone waved to you or something, but that was him all over, wasn't it? He went to extremes, and this was one of them. China suddenly moved, grabbing Scorn's leg. But Scorn just leaned down and punched her. Skullduggery took a step forward, but Scorn held up the switch. The thing is, she continued, Serpine was so busy organising a whole range of assassinations and murders that week that he just didn't have the time to go out and round up your family himself. So he sent a group of people he knew he could count on. He sent the Diablery. Valkyrie went cold and saw China sag. Skullduggery's gun didn't waver. I'm sure you remember who was in the Diablery back in those days, Scorn said. There was Vengeous, before he became one of Mevelin's generals, of course. Gruesome, Murder Rose, delightful lady, a few others. And China, the leader of the pack, as it were. If I'm right, and I think I am, Rose went after your child. That wasn't much of a problem. To be honest, from what I've read, the biggest danger there was whether Rose would go too far and kill the kid. But for once, she obeyed orders. China, because she enjoyed that kind of thing, went after your wife. By all accounts, it was a knock-down, drag-out fight. There was blood, sweat, tears, hair-pulling, even some name-calling. Things got pretty heated, but eventually China emerged triumphant and she shackled your pretty little wife and hauled her all the way back to Serpine's castle. Then she stood in the shadows and watched you run in, saw you scream when they died. She was there while Serpine was torturing you. Apparently, different members of the Diablery like to stop by every now and then to watch. That's pretty dark, isn't it? Skullduggery lowered his gun. Of course, Scorn said. This probably makes no difference to you in the slightest, does it? I mean, you're already friends with her. You've already forgiven her for the things she did during the war. This is just one more thing, am I right? Just one more thing to forgive her for. She held up the switch. Skullduggery didn't move. Scorn smiled and thumbed the little red button.
The windows on the top floor of the tenement building exploded, spraying glass all the way across the street. Flames licked the air. Black smoke billowed, burning pages rained down. China shook her head slowly, and Valkyrie stared. But Scorn just smiled, and Skullduggery still didn't move. China tried to get up, and Scorn drove a knee into her face. She started kicking her, lashing her boot in. China gagged and curled up. Skullduggery turned round, started walking back to the Bentley. People were stumbling out onto the street, staring at the fire and calling the fire brigade, looking at Scorn beating China and calling the cops. Valkyrie ran over, shoved Scorn back. China lay gasping between them. You want to take her place? Scorn asked, eyes narrowed. If you make one move towards me, Valkyrie said, Skullduggery will kill you. Leave. Now. Scorn observed her for another few moments, and then that smile returned. Of course, Detective Kane, whatever you say. She cast another glance down at China, and her smile widened. Then she moved off, disappearing into the crowd. China turned over onto her back. Her face was a mess, swollen and cut and bloody. She held her arm against her ribs and every breath seemed to hurt. She grimaced, forced herself to sit up. She didn't raise her eyes. I won't blame you, she said, her voice tight with pain. If you walk away. Good, Valkyrie said, and she did just that. Chapter 61 My Twilight the first time she'd met China, Skullduggery had warned Valkyrie not to trust her. She could only be trusted upon to serve her own best interests, he had said, and people like that were the most dangerous kind. But since then, even Skullduggery's attitude towards China had softened. They'd all been through so much together. They'd fought side by side. They'd faced death and overcome certain destruction. China had been shifting, ever so slightly, from her throne of neutrality to being an ally who could be depended upon. And ever since Valkyrie had lost Tanith, China had become something even more. She'd become a friend. But now, all that was over. Because of his own past, Skullduggery could forgive a great many sins. But this, being directly involved in the murder of his wife and child... Valkyrie feared that it would be asking too much of him to forgive a crime of that magnitude. She hadn't heard from him in two days. She kept expecting a call from Ghastly, informing her that Skullduggery was in custody, charged with the unlawful killing of China Sorrows. But as the darkness drew in on another day, her phone thankfully remained silent. She was in no mood for Kalen that night. He tapped on her window and she stared at him for the longest time, then pointed behind him at the pier, and he nodded and vanished. She got dressed, sneaked out. I'm sorry, he said when she neared. For what? For not being there when you needed me. You went through all of that without me. It's grand, okay? Forget about it. But I failed you, Valkyrie. She sighed. I can't do this anymore. You can't do what? Kalen, whatever we have, it's over, all right? We never went out, but we're breaking up even so. His beautiful eyes widened. What are you talking about? You're way too intense for me. I mean, for God's sake, every word out of your mouth is how much you love me and how we're meant to be together. I don't look forward to seeing you anymore because I know exactly what I'll be getting. You don't mean that. Yes, Kalen, I do. We're not Buffy and Angel, or Romeo and Juliet, or those two from West Side Story. We're not even Edward and Bella, okay? You're far too freaky for me. He looked at her. We're meant to be together. And this is exactly what I mean. Our love is written in the stars. And there you go again. I love you. You bore me. He faltered. What? Seriously, you do. 
I hate to be so mean, but you're just not hearing this. You bore the hell out of me. At first, you were cool. But my God, you got boring really fast. There's only so much of this brooding loner thing a girl can take before she really just needs someone to make her laugh. You're not a funny guy, Kalen. I don't understand. You can't tell jokes? No. I mean, I don't understand why you're saying these things. And you just missed another joke, see? It's Fletcher, isn't it? Fletcher has nothing to do with this, other than I can't believe I've had to break up with two guys in the same week. He grabbed her arm. I can change, he said. That's not going to do it. Then you can change. Excuse me? You can do what I say for once. Have you never thought that the reason you are unhappy is because you never obey me? Seriously? No, that thought never entered my head. I only want what's best for you. Let go of my arm. Why? Do you think I'd break it? I would never hurt you, Valkyrie. This? This isn't pain. He squeezed and she grimaced. This is nothing compared to the agony I feel in my heart. A bruise, a broken bone is paltry. Kalen, let go of me right now. Why? he asked, a sneer on his lips. So you can run away from me. So you can leave me and fall into the arms of another. Who is he, Valkyrie? There's no one else, you psycho. Stop lying to me. Valkyrie twisted her arm and yanked it from his grip, and Kalen caught her across the jaw with his fist. She was halfway to the ground when his hand closed around her throat, and suddenly he was slamming her against the wall on the far side of the road. Who is he? he snarled. Who are you with? Give me his name. She clutched at his hand, but couldn't prize it off and her head was pounding and lights danced before her eyes. Suddenly the grip was released, and Valkyrie slumped to a sitting position. A moment passed, and then a hand stroked her face tenderly. I'm sorry, Kaelin said. I'm sorry, Valkyrie. I didn't mean to strike you. I would never hurt you, you know that. But sometimes, sometimes you just have to listen to me and do what I say. Now, if you tell me there is no one else, then I believe you. Of course I do, because I love you. Do you understand me? She nodded. He smiled, took her hands, and raised her slowly to her feet. Are you all right? He asked gently. I'm okay, she said. I love you, he smiled. She snapped her palms, and the space between them rippled and Kalen flew backwards. He managed to land in a crouch and leaped at her, but she sent the shadows to intercept, pulling him from the air and driving him head first into the ground. He got to his hands and knees, dazed, and Valkyrie ran up, went to kick, but he batted her foot away, and his fist crunched into her belly. She doubled over with a cry of pain that turned into a strangled wheeze. Why do you do this? He raged. Why do you defy me? I love you, Valkyrie. Do you know what that means? She dropped to her knees. I love you, he said in her ear. We're meant for each other. Can't you understand that? I've tried to be patient. I've tried so hard, but you just don't get it. You continue to fight. His hand closed around her jaw and lifted her face to him. You think it's easy for me? He asked, tears in his eyes. You think it's easy to give my love? I've tried in the past. Girls, women, so many. They each stole my heart. But each time it ended, I lost a piece of myself. Her hand went to her pocket, fumbled with her phone. But you, Kaelin said, you're different. The others, they couldn't keep the monster away. As much as I loved them, our love just wasn't strong enough to keep them alive. Sooner or later, the monster would emerge. That's when Dusk found me. He sneered. He said I was endangering everyone with the things I did. He tried to stop me, but he couldn't kill me. 
He was living by the code. We don't kill our own kind. The vampire he had with him, he was even worse than Dusk. He talked about living in darkness, in solitude, keeping away from the mortals. One day I'd had enough of his lectures, and I slit his throat and took his head. And because of that, I was exiled, cast out to an existence of loneliness, until I found you. Well, meant for each other. And if you can't understand that, I'll have to make you. Moonlight made the sweat on his brow glisten. He opened his mouth, his fangs growing. Kalin! Kalin snarled and turned. Fletcher stood there. Get away from my ex-girlfriend, you moany little whinge bag! Kalin took a breath, like he was in pain, and straightened up. His voice was low, guttural. I was hoping I'd get the chance to kill you. You won't be killing anyone, you sad little emo git. You've stood in the way of our love for long enough. Just listening to you makes me want to top myself, you self-pitying, paranormal, romance reject. Kalen glared. Stop insulting me. Why? If you cry, will your mascara run? You're just... Making me angrier, and I really should have taken my serum tonight. Kalen's fingers dug into his shirt, into his flesh, and he ripped it off, revealing the bone-white skin beneath. A suddenly clawed hand went to his face, tore it from his head, taking the hair with it. The vampire shook off the ragged remains of its human form, its black eyes gleaming as it advanced. Fletcher licked his lips nervously and backed off. Valkyrie did her best to sit up, watching the muscles move beneath the vampire's pale skin. A creature made for killing. She wanted to shout out, to warn Fletcher, to tell him to go and get Skullduggery. But all she managed was a moan. Fletcher teleported, reappearing a moment later with a baseball bat in his hands. He teleported behind the vampire, swung. But the vampire was too quick and twisted out of the way. Fletcher barely had time to vanish before a claw lashed through him. Fletcher appeared, regarding the vampire warily. The vampire snarled. They circled each other. Fletcher teleported again, appearing behind his foe, then teleported to the other side as those claws came from again. He swung for the head, but the bat was knocked from his hands. Fletcher stumbled. The vampire lunged, found nothing but empty space. It wasn't working. The vampire was just too fast. Fletcher picked up the fallen bat. He held it in a tight grip, brought it up over his shoulder, settled into a stance, like he was expecting the vampire to oblige him by charging across the ten meters that separated them. Then he swung, solid and vicious, and for a heartbeat he was beside the vampire, the bat crashing into that snarling face. And then he was back out of range, the bat recoiling after the impact, the vampire roared, and Fletcher smiled. He swung again, teleported behind the vampire just at the point of impact, and then teleported away. Again and again he did it, and the vampire twisted and slashed and snapped. But Fletcher was only in range for the length of an eye blink before he was gone again. The vampire stumbled to one knee. The bat cracked against the vampire's ribs. The bat cracked against the vampire's back. The bat cracked against the vampire's head, and it splintered. Fletcher was gone for a moment, and returned with an axe. He swung, teleported, and the axe blade dug into the vampire's shoulder. But when Fletcher teleported away, he took the vampire with him. He cursed when he realized what he'd done, tried to release the axe, but the vampire's hand closed around Fletcher's arm and Fletcher screamed as nails perforated his flesh. Fletcher was sent rolling across the ground, clutching his arm and screaming. The vampire reached up, dislodged the axe, and threw it away. Fletcher scrambled up, fell, scrambled up again, running onto the pier to get some distance between them, to get some time to focus and teleport. It wasn't going to happen. Valkyrie could see that. The pain was too intense. The panic had set in. The vampire moved after him. Fletcher tripped and fell, tried to crawl on, 
leaving a trail of blood. The vampire hissed and snarled, but followed slowly, the way a cat would follow an injured mouse. It kicked Fletcher over onto his back, looked down at him, claws flexing. It dropped to its knees, straddling him. It wasn't going to bite him. It wasn't going to give him the chance of living as a monster. It was going to rip him open, from chest to throat, its claws lifted. Valkyrie dived at it, hooked her arm around its neck, hauling it off Fletcher and bringing it to the ground. They rolled and it struggled, but she held on, still rolling, and suddenly there was nothing beneath them and they were falling. They hit the water. Valkyrie's leg banged against the rocks and she screamed through gritted teeth. The vampire thrashed, but she held it down in the darkness beneath the surface. It managed to shake her off, and she swam backwards against the current. The waves brought the vampire in towards the rocks, and it grabbed them, started to haul itself out. For one terrifying moment, Valkyrie thought the salt water hadn't worked. But then the vampire's movements grew weaker, and its hands went to its throat. It turned its head to her, black eyes open wide, mouth gagging gently. Then it stopped. Valkyrie swam over, pulled herself onto the rocks, moaning in pain. She reached the rusted ladder set into the side of the pier and climbed slowly. Fletcher lay on his back, his breathing shallow and quick. He looked at her as she crawled over. With one exception, he managed to say, you've got terrible taste in men. She lay beside him, too tired and sore to answer. You're going to have to take me off speed dial, he said. I don't want to waste time being mad with you, but you're still not my favorite person in the world right now. I'm not going to be jumping back here every time you get yourself in trouble. I know, she said. Fletch, thank you. He nodded and grimaced. I am really bleeding a lot here. You might want to hang on. I think we're in need of some medical assistance. Valkyrie moved her hand till she found his. I was an idiot for the way I treated you, she said. At last, he said. Something we can both agree on. And they vanished. Chapter 62 They Walk Among Us Kenny lowered his camera as Valkyrie Kane disappeared into thin air. His hands were shaking. He didn't know who the kid with the stupid hair was, but he'd find out. And that monster. This was bigger than he'd ever dared imagine. He stood up on shaking legs and decided then and there that Valkyrie was the name he was going to use for her in the article. It was a good name. Certainly a name that deserved to be spoken aloud alongside Skullduggery Pleasant. But as far as the book was concerned, he could see it now. A story like this was too big for a mere newspaper article. Much too big. He'd used the article to alert the world, but the full story needed something grander to contain it. It needed a book and an accompanying TV special. He already had a provisional title picked out. They walk among us, the sorcerers in our midst. A world-changing expose on the secret magical subculture that exists in every country around the planet. He decided now that it would be in the book where he would focus on Valkyrie Kane. She was the perfect figure for the audience to identify with, to root for. A normal girl, thrust into a life of danger and excitement, taken under the wing of an honest-to-goodness living skeleton. It was like Peter Parker being bitten by that radioactive spider, a normal kid given extraordinary powers. It was beautiful. It was perfect. It would make him a household name and a billionaire, all in one go. But it would be in the TV special, not the book and not the article 
where Kenny would reveal to the world that badass sorcerer Valkyrie Kane had really been mild-mannered teenager Stephanie Edgley all along. Because if there was one thing the public was going to love more than a superhero, it was a superhero unmasked, live on air. That was Skullduggery Pleasant, Deathbringer, by Derek Landy, read by Stephen Hogan, produced by ID Audio for Harper Audio. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.